the lone assassin of Robert F. Kennedy. Again, uh, many people say, well, how could there be anything else going on? How could there be any possibility of anything else going on in that case? Well, if you will stick with us tonight for the next few hours, we have a lot of information to share with you that suggests, in fact, that there is a great deal more to be known about the Robert F. Kennedy assassination. And if you're anything like I was when I first got introduced to this material, um, you're going to not only be uh, interested and perhaps fascinated to know about this stuff, but uh, you're going to be downright angry by the time that we finish tonight when you hear um, the way in which some of these investigations were dealt with, uh, specifically the destruction of evidence, the outright uh, ignoring, I almost said ignorance, I suppose that might be appropriate too, the ignoring of witnesses with contrary testimony, the, uh, in many cases, intimidation of witnesses, um, just the entire lexicon of bad faith police work on the part of the Los Angeles Police Department, and in fact, in many cases, uh, what seems to be actual obstruction of justice. Anyway, not to give the whole ball of wax away too early, but that, in fact, is what is going on. Okay, well, as I mentioned before, I've been talking a lot here, but Dave Emery is in the studio with me, and uh, Dave and I are going to be here until 11 o'clock. We will be taking phone calls at some later point in the broadcast if we have time, time permitting. We're never sure about these things. And when that case comes, um, we're going to be... Uh, letting you know, we'll give you the phone number, and we'll let you know, in fact, uh, what time to call and when to call. All righty. Well, uh, I've been uh, administering to our studio here, getting ready to uh, begin the recording process, and so uh, I have not been on mic so far, but Nitsuk said about all I think that uh, needs to be said by way of preliminaries. The only thing that I would uh, remind perhaps people of you, those of you uh, in the listening audience who are new to these programs, these Radio Free America programs, the broadcast you're listening to right now is an archive show we're going to be reading to you for the better part of four hours. So uh, these programs are essentially put together in order to be taped. Uh, we hand you a piece of the documentary record so that you can examine it for yourself. So uh, if, if you're a really good listener, perhaps you don't need to, but uh, the, we would encourage you to tape the programs because that's uh, why we use this format that we're using. We take a large portion of the documentation and read it to you, not uh, expecting you to be able to, to recall it from memory, but hopefully you'll tape it off the air and... Uh, then you'll have a record of the information for your uh, future use. And uh, a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about are so very different than what pe people are accustomed to thinking about that uh, we recommend that people stick to the documentation on this kind of material. So uh, if you haven't already, do uh, ta begin taping the show off the air. Okay. And uh, also we should just mention that by the end of the broadcast uh, tonight, if you're interested, of course, we have been doing these. This is our ninth Radio Free America broadcast. Um, if you're interested in acquiring copies of uh, tapes of ones we've already done that you might have missed or that you'd be interested to hear on a variety of subjects um, and some other specials that we've done here at KFJC, um, just give us a call and we will let you know how to do it. There's a way to do it at cost where nobody makes any money, uh, but essentially just uh, you pay for the cost of having your tapes copied. So we'll talk about that a little later. Now, one last prefacing statement that I want to make. Quite a bit of the information that we're using tonight, um, a, a large percentage of it comes from an excellent book that... Um, anybody who's interested in this stuff and doesn't go out and track down a copy somewhere at a library, at a library sale, at a bookstore, um, is really missing something because it is a, a, a fascinating, terrifying, and enraging book. Uh, the book is called The Assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. Okay, and the authors are William Turner and John Christian. John Christian is spelled J-O-N-N -N, and then Christian, just like it sounds. For those of you who view early morning religious television, you know how to spell it. Uh, William Turner and John Christian. It's a random house hardback. And it's copyright 1978. Okay? And I know for a fact that it's available in a lot of public libraries. If you don't have any money, that's no excuse. Anyway, we're going to be using this book for quite a bit of information tonight. Um, one, of the re one of the things that makes the book so valuable and so interesting is that it is not merely a book of uh, reportage in the normal sense, but it's in fact a book written by people who became angry and upset enough about it to go out and try and find some things. Um, and actually do some investigative reporting in the finest sense of the word without losing their, uh, their reporter's objectivity in terms of marshalling facts and dealing with arguments. So, again, a strongly recommended book, and you'll hear tonight just some of the highlights as we skip through. And again, not to whip a dead horse, but this is a rare book, very tough book to find. Researchers have a tough time locating it. So uh, in order to preserve at least part of the record, again, uh, these programs are put together so that you can tape them. So please do uh, record this by oxide if you can. That's right, Then, because even if you ha get a copy of the book and you have Turner and Christian, you still won't have Emory and Tuck, right? Right, okay. We're going to start off with a prologue, which basically goes back and expands on some of the information that I started the broadcast with. And uh, once again, this uh, large part of the reading tonight is from The Assassination of Robert F. Kennedy by John Christian and William Turner. California was make or break for Senator Robert F. Kennedy in his quest for the 1968 Democratic presidential nomination. 
On May 28th, he lost the Oregon primary to Senator Eugene McCarthy, and a setback the following week in the nation's most populous state would probably ruin his chances. On the other hand, a victory would gain him 174 delegate votes and much-needed momentum for the showdown at the National Convention in Chicago. It would virtually eliminate McCarthy, leaving only Hubert H. Humphrey in his way. A symbol of the old politics, with the albatross of Lyndon Johnson's escalated war in Vietnam hanging from his neck, the vice president was not a good bet to withstand the tides of renewal surging through the party. Most observers thought that RFK would ride the tide past Humphrey and defeat the Republicans' likely candidate, Richard M. Nixon. Kennedy came to California for a homestretch drive so frenetic that on election eve he was on the brink of collapse. He had to cancel a San Diego appearance that night, but the next morning he was back on his feet, buoyed by a just-completed poll showing him safely ahead of McCarthy. After a day of last-minute campaigning, he went to the Malibu home of movie director John Frankenheimer for a quiet supper party that included Roman Polanski and his ill-fated wife Sharon Tate. After supper, Frankenheimer drove him to the Ambassador Hotel where he would watch the election returns on television in the royal suite. Interrupting uh, very briefly, remember uh, Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate and their role in uh, the Robert Kennedy campaign in the Los Angeles area. We're going to touch back on that later in the program. By midnight, he was ready to claim victory. He checked himself in a full-length mirror before leading his entourage down a service elevator to the embassy room on the, grand, on the ground floor. The ballroom was jammed with campaign workers and supporters, and a thunderous cheer went up as the candidate came into view. Speaking into a bundle of microphones on the small stage, he gave a brief speech. Quote, Mayor Yorty has just sent me a message that we have been here too long already, he cracked, drawing laughs from the audience. Then in parentheses it says, Sam Yorty was a right-wing Democrat who had supported Nixon against RFK's brother in the 1960 election. As a matter of fact, Sam Yorty was the mayor of Los Angeles, and uh, as you will see later on in the broadcast, he, will, he is uh, quite a key player in this. RFK wound up by flashing the V sign and exhorting, On to Chicago! Let's win there! Kennedy intended to meet with the press in their headquarters in the adjacent colonial room. Ordinarily, he would have crossed the ballroom floor and exited through the main door, but the crush of people was so great that a last-minute decision was made to route him through a service pantry. A maitre d' gripped his right wrist tightly and led him through the gold tur curtain behind the stage and into the pantry. His progress was slow as he greeted admiring kitchen workers. Suddenly a gunman sprang at him, snarling, Kennedy, you son of a bitch. He fired two rapid shots. Kennedy reeled backwards, fleeing his right arm in front of his face for protection. People grabbed for the gunman. Kennedy landed on his back, his arms splayed outward, as in a crucifixion, a halo of blood widening around his head. Within inches of his right hand was a clip-on bow tie he had apparently snatched from someone close by as he sagged from the impact of three bullets in his body and head. Remember the clip-on tie, too. We'll touch back on that as well. Continuing here with Christian and Turner's narrative. Up in San Francisco, we, the authors of this book, were stunned by the news. William Turner had run for the U.S. Congress in the same Democratic primary with John Christian as his campaign manager. As the chief plank in our platform, we had advocated the establishment of a joint Senate House committee to reinvestigate the 1963 assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Now, the final line of our campaign brochure seemed horrifyingly prescient. To do less, not only is indecent, but might cost us the life of a future president of John Kennedy's instincts. Unquote. Robert Kennedy died slightly more than a day later. When the plane carrying his body to New York landed at Kennedy International Airport, NBC television correspondent Sander Van Oker, who had covered the RFK campaign, came down the ramp to face his own network's cameras. Forcing back tears, he reported that during the flight, Edward Kennedy had remonstrated bitterly about the faceless men, unquote, who had been charged with the slayings of his brothers and Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. First Lee Harvey Oswald, then James Earl Ray, and now Saran Saran. Always faceless men with no apparent motive. There has to be more to it, Ted Kennedy had told Van Oker. But Ted Kennedy's words, uttered in a private moment and never to be repeated by him in public, were lost in the rush as the campaign instantly went into reverse. What had begun as a great national groundswell of, re of revulsion against the war, so strong that it swept an incumbent president out of the running, became a nightmare of reaction and irrelevancy. There were pious outcries in Congress for tougher gun laws, breast-beating in the media about how America's violent society had spawned another deranged assassin, and demands for a law-and-order crackdown. 
It was almost anticlimactic when Hubert Humphrey finagled the Democratic nomination at the violence-wracked convention and tried to pull the shattered party together. He was no match for Richard Nixon, who cynically called himself the Peace with Honor candidate and boasted of a secret plan, unquote, for ending the conflict, which would then drag on for another four more years. So the nation had another accidental president, unquote, catapulted to power by a lone nut assassin. The conclusion that Saran Saran had acted alone and unaided was duly arrived at by the Los Angeles Police Department, which had primary investigative jurisdiction. The FBI, which conducted a parallel inquiry under the civil rights laws, concurred. And most of the American people accepted the theory, since the case seemed as open and shut as the shooting of Oswald by Jack Ruby in front of millions of television viewers. Well, uh, the LAPD is, uh, will be one of the major focuses of our broadcast this evening, and just uh, how they went about arriving at this conclusion is something we're going to talk about at great length. Okay, now, it's not going to take a great deal of uh, knowledge of, of forensics or, uh, or legal science to understand most of the things we're going to be talking about tonight. This is basically, we've set the stage now, we're going to start talking about, uh, well, not just Turner and Christian, but largely Turner and Christian's findings and some other people's findings as we begin to go over the evidence and the conflicting evidence specifically to the Sirhan Sirhan as the lone assassin without aid, without uh, conspiratorial um, backup of any kind. Okay, continuing, uh, reading a little further on from the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. Eyewitnesses uniformly recounted that Sir Han accosted Kennedy from the front and never got closer than two to three feet from the senator before he was grabbed and wrestled to the floor. And I should just say parenthetically that uh, two to three feet was the closest estimate. Most of the estimates were actually four to seven feet. Uh, some as far away as 11, by the way. So uh, two to three, again, as Nip Tuck uh, appropriately said, that was the closest. Most four to seven, some as far away as 11. Yet County Coroner Dr. Thomas T. Noguchi, who performed the autopsy, declared that all three of the bullets striking Kennedy entered from the rear in a flight path from down to up, right to left. Moreover, powder burns around the entry wound indicated that the fatal bullet was fired at less than one inch from the head and no more than two to three inches behind the right ear. Okay, let me just go over this really quickly because this is, of course, one of the, one of the keynote pieces of evidence in the entire case. Okay, the presumption of Sirhan Sirhan as the assassin is that Sirhan Sirhan, as all the eyewitnesses recounted, came, to, came up to Kennedy from the front, fired on him from the front, at least two shots, and then was grabbed by several people and continued to fire as he was pulled down. Okay, so we have a face-to-face, front-to-front shooting. Um, but now the county coroner, county coroner noting stapling or powder burns on the wound concludes that the wounds, uh, especially the fatal wound, were for within inches, and especially one of them within an inch. Okay, when none of the witnesses said that Sir Han was any closer than several feet, which will not produce those kind of powder burns, um, and that, in fact, the wounds were from the rear, when, as we said before, Kennedy was shot from the front, he covered his face as he fell, everybody saw him being shot from the front. Okay, going on. Thus, it would have been physically impossible for Sir Han to have fired the shots that struck Kennedy, even allowing for the remote possibility that Kennedy twisted completely around, which is contrary to witnesses' accounts that he threw his arms in front of his face in a protective reaction and sagged backwards. There remained the point-blank shot. Noguchi later revealed that before he entered the grand jury room, he was approached by an unnamed deputy DA who solicited him to revise the distance, quote, from one to three inches, which is Noguchi's estimate, to one to three feet. The coroner bravely refused to cooperate, quote-unquote, with this blatant attempt to suborn perjury. So again, recall that uh, the coroner's inquest, the uh, autopsy results, concluded that the fatal shot had been fired from a distance of less than one inch from the back of Kennedy's head, from a distance from the bullets traveled from down to up and from right to left, and again, restating this because uh, many people uh, were, who were listening were not alive at the time of the Robert Kennedy assassination or were so too young to have really paid much attention to the event, uh, that, again, Saran Saran accosts Kennedy in a very crowded pantry, fires or allegedly fires shots at him from a distance of anywhere from 2 to 11 feet in front of Kennedy, according to the various eyewitnesses. Fatal shot fired from a distance of less than one inch from the back of his head, and notice here already an attempted cover-up when a a deputy DA attempted to solicit 
uh, incorrect testimony from uh, Coroner Noguchi. Incidentally, uh, people who would like to seek uh, contemporary corroboration of this uh, autopsy result, uh, Noguchi is author of a book which is currently out in softcover called Coroner, which doesn't go into the Robert Kennedy case uh, in, in terms of the criminal aspects of it in any great detail, but it does uh, recount and, and repeat uh, Noguchi's finding that the fatal shot was fired from, a, again, a distance of less than one inch from the back of uh, Senator Robert Kennedy's head. Continuing, that, uh, continuing with the account here. Again, from the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy by Turner and Christian. Although the DA and LAPD continued to insist that only assassination freaks were raising questions about the shooting, Baxter Ward, Baxter Ward is an L.A. County supervisor, Baxter Ward finally garnered enough votes from his fellow supervisors to officially request that the Superior Court order a re-examination of the firearms evidence. On September 18, 1975, presiding Judge Robert A. Wenke, W-E-N-K-E, complied. A seven-man panel of firearms experts was named. No sooner had the panel begun work than it was confronted with several baffling questions. For one, the LAPD unaccountably could not produce the laboratory record supporting its claim that in 1968 it test-fired eight bullets from Saran's gun. For another, the gun's bore was heavily coated with lead, yet copper-jacketed bullets such as Saran allegedly fired leave a lead-free bore. The panel simply noted the leaded condition. Two copper-jacketed bullets were fired to clean out the lead so the testing could go ahead and did not speculate on how it happened. On Election Day, June 4th, by the way, I would uh, interrupt here. This is the 17th anniversary of Robert Kennedy's assassination, by the way. He was killed 17 years ago this evening. Continuing here, on Election Day, June 4th, Saran had practiced rapid shooting for about seven hours on a San Gabriel range using unjacketed wad-cutter target bullets which deposit lead in the bore. If this was the source of the extreme leading, he could not have fired copper-jacketed bullets of the type recovered from the victims and supposedly matched to his gun by Wolfer, for they would have cleaned out the lead. And Wolfer could not have test-fired bullets of that type to make the match, for they, too, would have had a cleaning effect. It should just be mentioned real quickly that uh, the man Wolfer that they're referring to is the police ballistics expert who was brought in to make the initial findings, and as we will see, or as we are seeing now, despite a great deal of inconsistencies, questions, and downright impossibilities, uh, found in favor of the conclusion that Sir Han's gun had fired all the bullets. And a man who was regarded as being of less than perfect integrity by a lot of his, uh, his uh, compatriots. A lot of his peers regarded him as being unreliable. But uh, that's who this particular individual here is. A third mystery revolves around the Kennedy and Weisel bullets, uh, Weisel being a, a witness in the pantry who was also wounded during the shooting. A third mystery re revolved around the Kennedy and Weisel bullets, W-E-I-S-E-L -E -E is Weisel, by the way. After test-firing Saran's gun, the experts were startled to observe that the test bullets did not bear the microscopic indentations that appeared on the Kennedy and Weisel bullets, as well as on a bullet Wolfer had introduced at the trial of Saran as having been test-fired from Saran's gun. Nor did the indentations appear on photographs that Bill Harper took with the Belliscan camera for his 1971 comparisons. By the way, Bill Harper is a ballistics expert uh, who, was, who worked with Turner and Christian on the case and came up with very different uh, results than Dwayne Wolfer, the LAPD ballistics expert uh, just mentioned. Repeating that last sentence. Nor did the indentations appear on photographs that Bill Harper took with his Belliscan camera for his 1971 comparisons. But they were visible on photographs taken for Baxter Ward's 1974 hearing. The indentations could have been made with any sharp object, including the tip of a pencil. They coincided on each bullet, so they could have been mistaken for matching marks. Whoever made them was obviously hoping to reinforce the single assassin position. The tampering must have been done sometime after Bill Harper's examination, which concluded that the bullets did not match. By the time Harper made public his findings and the second gun controversy erupted, the bullets were in the custody of the California Supreme Court in San Francisco. We learned from a clerk in the exhibit section of the Supreme Court that in July of 1971, about the time Joe Bush was announcing that he would look into the firearms discrepancies, a contingent from the DA's office, the LAPD, and Attorney General Younger's office visited the Supreme Court offices and spent several hours alone examining the Saran gun and the evidence bullets. So reviewing uh, the information just uh, related in this passage, a number of interesting things uh, crop up in terms of the LAPD's handling of the bullets, the testing of the gun, and so forth. First of all, the laboratory record that which uh, would support the LAPD's claim of having test-fired Saran's gun was unavailable. Second, 
Lead deposits appear on the bore, which can't be accounted for considering that Saran was firing copper jacketed bullets and that in order to clean out the lead for a subsequent test firing of the gun, all the LAPD had to do was to fire two copper jacketed rounds of the type Saran fired, and that cleaned the lead out of the bore. So the question is, if the LAPD had been firing the kind of bullets Saran had been firing, where did that lead come from? There was no record of uh, the bullet side of the gun having been fired after that. Another uh, little problem which crops up here is that wad cutters, at least uh, to the best of my knowledge, are not made in 22 caliber. So, again, I don't know how that lead got there. I don't know where Turner and Christian are talking about the, the wad cutters. But uh, to the best of my knowledge, wad cutters are not even made in 22 caliber. But at any rate, the lead cannot be accounted for according to the information the LAPD has presented. Another interesting thing is the fact that uh, the bullets had markings at certain times and not at others, and there appears to have been a very timely visit between the time the bullets, between one of the examinations which did not reveal these these uh, characteristic markings, and the time Bill Harper examined them and found uh, that they were there. So uh, apparently someone, again, uh, recall the attempt to get uh, Connor Noguchi to change his findings in the autopsy, someone has, uh, even at this relatively early date uh, and early stage of our examination of the Robert Kennedy assassination, is going to some length to try and support fallaciously the single assassin theory. And again, recall uh, the position of Saran in the pantry and where the bullets came from. Now, something else, uh, also to, to try and put this in perspective, um, one needs to realize or needs to think back and realize that the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy was arguably the second most important uh, murder in the United States in the last 50 years. I mean, you know, probably post-William McKinley. I mean, this was a, probably one of the major murder cases of our century. Um, and as you will go through this uh, with us tonight, you will see that the record of uh, sort of spurious complexity on the part of the Los Angeles Police Department um, is balanced out and, and, in fact, overwhelmed by the, the, at best, completely cavalier treatment of evidence, of the testimony of witnesses, and uh, that's, a, that's a, the best possible way of interpreting it. As you will see, there's a lot of other ways to interpret it, including the, just the outright destruction of evidence and obstruction of justice and, and badgering of witnesses and um, many other things. But uh, So bear in mind, right away, we're already missing some crucial evidence, and some other evidence has been completely ignored, um, as was mentioned with the, uh, the lead coating on the inside of the, of the barrel. It just was overlooked by the panel of experts. I mean, one of the most obvious things that could just negate the entire validity of the ballistic test was just ignored. They just went right past it. Um, this is a record that we've seen too many times in other assassinations, and we're going to see it again and again tonight. Okay. Now, about this time that the ballistics evidence was coming out, uh, several people, including Allard Lowenstein, a former Kennedy staffer, a former uh, congressional uh, representative himself, um, was uh, getting a little upset himself about some of the things going on. He felt himself that there was some kind of uh, uh, dirty business going on that needed to be looked into, and the, uh, some of the, uh, the cross-examining over the ballistic evidence was coming to court. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about Allard Lowenstein later, because he himself met with a rather interesting fate. But uh, what he did do was to contact Vincent Bugliosi, spelled, of course, B-U-G-L-I-O-S-I. -I. Um, many of you are familiar with Bugliosi because of his, uh, his involvement as the prosecutor in the Manson case. Uh, Bugliosi at that time was one of the best-known prosecutors in the country, probably still is. Um, and he himself was a little reluctant to get involved because he was afraid he'd be seen as uh, grandstanding. But as Lowenstein said, this is, this is heavy-duty stuff. This is very important. This is the death of a presidential candidate. And, you know, this, there's weird stuff being done to the trial record, and we need you to get involved. So Bugliosi was brought in. Interestingly, uh, Bugliosi has been accused by many people of having covered up information in the Manson prosecution. Uh, there have been uh, contentions that uh, Man the Manson uh, operation was, in essence, a sort of provocation. Uh, we'll go into that in a little bit uh, greater length uh, later in the broadcast. But uh, Bugliosi has been accused of covering up information in, in the Manson case, so there are questions about his performance there. But... Uh, in the Robert Kennedy case, he did uh, sort of enlist uh, with Turner and Christian here and uh, played a leading role in their legal efforts to attempt to bring the Robert Kennedy case to justice. And uh, one of the things that uh, he did was to examine the L.A. the uh, LA County Supervisor's Board of uh, Ballistics Experts put together. And uh, Nip Tuck's going to read you a summary and analysis of uh, Bugliosi's cross-examination of them here in a minute. Okay, again, reading from Turner and Christian. Um, because Bugliosi's cross-examination of the experts involves sophisticated and highly complicated firearms testimony, which consumed several hundred pages of court transcript, we must necessarily condense the points he established as follows. 1. Although five of the seven experts testified under oath that it was their, quote, belief that three of the seven bullets recovered from the victims, one from Robert F. Kennedy, came from Sirhan's gun, 
Not one of the experts was willing to make a positive identification. Positive ID, the authors put in parentheses, is very common in criminal trials. In a case of this magnitude, the lack of a positive identification is of monumental significance. Note, this testimony literally destroyed the LAPD's Dwayne Wolfer's grand jury and trial testimony that he was, quote, 100% sure that all seven bullets positively came from Sir Han's gun, quote, to the exclusion of all other weapons in the world. And mentioning again, parenthetically, it's just interesting again that Dwayne Wolfer is positive of this, despite the fact that Sir Han's gun apparently had not fired any of the bullets being used because of the lead uh, jacketing on the inside of it, and a variety of other things, including marks that were missing. Two, all seven experts testified that it was, quote, not their conclusion that there was no second gun involved at the assassination scene, which had been played by the press, that the, the this, uh, ballistics commission had said one gun only. I'll read that again. All seven experts testified that it was not their conclusion that there was no second gun involved at the assassination scene. Their testimony was merely that based on the exhibits they had been furnished, and the authors say they never saw some that they should have, they could find no evidence of a second gun. As Bugliosi would argue, quote, there's more than a semantic distinction involved here. In fact, there's all the difference in the world between no evidence of a second gun and a flat statement that there was no second gun. It would be like my walking down the street and saying, I saw no avocados on the street. That doesn't mean there weren't any avocados, only that I didn't see any avocados. Three, five of the seven experts recommended that further scientific tests, ballistics, spectrographics, spectrographics, etc., be conducted. As Bugliosi pointed out to the court, quote, as the court knows, there is a tremendous controversy in this case as to which bullet struck which victim and, based on the uncontested position of Sir Han at the assassination scene, whether it was physically possible for him to have fired all the recovered bullets, if any case ever cried out for a thorough, in-depth, independent ballistics examination, this case is it. A ballistics test, in parentheses, the authors say, attempts to determine the flight path of a bullet. A bullet follows from the moment it leaves the gun muzzle to its ultimate point of rest. Four, five out of the seven experts testified that they did reach a positive conclusion that three of the victim bullets had been fired from the, quote, same gun, but they were not able to positively identify Sir Han's gun as being the weapon from which the subject bullets were fired. Five, the experts did acknowledge that there were some, quote, significant differences between the striations, meaning the lines, the markings, the indentations, on several of the victim's bullets and those on the bullets test-fired by the panel from Sir Han's gun. Six, all seven experts testified that they were unable to determine the number of bullets fired at the assassination scene. Seven, all seven experts testified that they did not rule out the possibility of a second gun which is actually the, key, the most important point of all, because the press had gone and said, panel says one gun. In re reality, as uh, Bugliosi pointed out, the panel said they hadn't seen evidence to support a second gun. But as the point is made here, all seven experts testified that they did not rule out the possibility of a second gun. And again, they're getting some rather bizarre and tainted ballistics evidence to deal with, and a gun and a, and a series of shells, uh, slugs, that have been uh, apparently manipulated at some point, at least as far as the striations go. Here, fortunately, now memorialized in a courtroom under oath, were the true findings of the seven experts, not the flat, quote, no second gun reportings of an ill-informed press. The previous written findings of these panelists, which had been misinterpreted by the news media, with the sole exception of CBS reporter Bill Stout, and which appeared to slam the door tight forever on further inquiry, had, due to Bugliosi's deft cross-examination, been reduced to their proper import and accurate legal dimensions. Unfortunately, however, Boliosi's effort came three months too late to eradicate the impression that had been embossed in the public's mind by a mostly unthinking mass media. So again, summing up here, an official ballistics uh, panel of ballistics experts put together by the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors and denied the best evidence uh, available in the situation still came up with the following conclusions according to Boliosi. Five of the seven experts uh, testified that it was their belief that three of the bullets came from Saran's gun. Not one of the seven would make a positive identification, which is uh, a very common uh, thing to have, uh, have occur in a case like this. All seven experts testified that they did not conclude that there was no second gun, simply that they had no evidence of one based on the evidence that they had seen. Five of the seven experts recommended that further tests be conducted. Five of the seven experts said that three of the victim bullets did come from the same gun. Not one of them would identify Saran's gun as positively being the one from which it had come. 
The experts acknowledged that there were some significant differences between some of the, uh, the, the markings on some of the different bullets. All seven experts testified that they were unable to determine the number of bullets fired at the assassination scene. All experts said they did not rule out the possibility of the second gun. And this is the official finding on the case. And remember, um, we're trying to make this cumulative. Remember, the first in, uh, piece of important evidence that was introduced was the fact that the coroner himself basically said, although he didn't make the, the logical connection, I mean, he, he was not allowed to, but he said that uh, his testimony basically said that Sir Han, as observed by many witnesses, could not have fired the fatal shots. They came from an inch to three inches behind Robert F. Kennedy, close enough to cause powder burns. Sir Han was not close enough. So we start to see the pattern of the, the, the willful um, distortion of evidence to try and fit into a pattern of a lone gunman, um, which, again, we have seen this before. Okay, and remember that... Uh Several of the bullets were acknowledged to have come from the same gun, but they could not identify Saran's gun. A little later in the broadcast, we're going to take a look at possibly whose gun that was and where it went. Okay, now continuing with Turner and uh, Christian's narrative here, and uh, some more results turned up by Bill Harper, a ballistics expert and criminologist who was working with them on the case, continuing with the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. Can't anyone on that panel count? Bill Harper fumed. They have just finished examining the ninth and tenth bullets and don't even know it. Unquote. Saran's revolver had held only eight bullets. The two extra bullets that Harper was referring to in his phone calls to John Christian were labeled Court Exhibit 38 from the Saran trial. Two expended slugs that the police had found on the front seat of Saran's old DeSoto sedan parked several, several blocks from the Ambassador Hotel. It had always been a source of, of curiosity as to why Saran would have re retrieved the useless slugs and left them in his car. It was even doubtful that they had been fired from his gun since they were so mutilated from impact that they could not be compared with test bullets. Actually, the panel had discovered a clue as to the origins of the extra bullets. On their worksheets, they had noted wood in nose, unquote, and wood in nose and base, unquote. Wood from where? In the official LAPD ballistics report dated July 8, 1968, Dwayne Wolfer had stated that all eight shots in Saran's revolver had been fired and all eight bullets were accounted for. Seven had physically been recovered from the bodies of six of the victims, two from Senator Kennedy and five from the five victims who survived at nearby hospitals, and the eighth was lost somewhere in the ceiling interspace, unquote. In other words, the official LAPD position was that no bullets were found at the assassination scene, and other than an entry and exit hole in the ceiling caused by the lost bullet, there were no bullet holes on any of the doors or walls of the pantry. Therefore, if any bullet holes or bullets were observed in addition to those accounted for in the LAPD report, they would constitute almost unassailable evidence of a second gun having been fired, since no one claimed Saran fired more than eight bullets. Yet there was evidence that more than eight bullets had been fired in the pantry. Only hours after the shooting, the Associated Press disseminated a wire photo that was captioned, quote, bullet found near Kennedy shooting scene, unquote. See official LAPD, for, well, that basically is a note uh, about a photo a uh, photo in the photo section which, which illustrates that here. It showed two LAPD officers inspecting an object embedded in a door jam behind the embassy room stage from which Kennedy had spoken. The door was in a direct line from the pantry. The ceiling panels, pierced by the bullet entering the interspace, had been removed by the LAPD, booked into its property division as evidence, and later destroyed by, by the LAPD. On August 22, 1975, Deputy Chief Darrell Gates, I would add he's now Chief of Police in L.A., on August 22, 1975, Deputy Chief Darrell Gates advised during an interview on the NBC network, quote, The ceiling panels were destroyed, pursuant to the same destruction order that was issued for the destruction of the door jams, June 27, 1969. The destruction was highly premature and completely improper, for Saran's attorneys had scarcely filed their appeal. So, uh, basically, what we have here, again, is a destruction of evidence, uh, uh, we, it's the same kind of thing that we've seen before in the other assassination cases, but uh, here, again, eight shots came from Saran's gun. No one says there were more than eight bullets. There are uh, two bullets, which apparently came from Saran's gun, with wood in the base and nose, respectively, of the two bullets. No one knows how that arrived there. Uh, apparently, material, some ceiling panels, as well as uh, some other material we're going to uh, examine here in, in a minute, was destroyed by the LAPD in a manner and at a time in which they had absolutely no business doing it. 
Saran's attorneys had barely filed an appeal, and key evidence in this case was destroyed by the LAPD. Recall that uh, a lab report maintaining that they had tested Saran's gun was lost by them. Uh, there was a curious visit by LAPD members to uh, a place where evidence was stored, and that evidence changed in nature. Some markings then appeared on those bullets that had not been there. This is a pattern which is going to hold throughout the course of this investigation, and which Nip Tuck's going to tell you some more about. Indeed. Continuing. One of the principal problems in attempting to reopen the investigation, although not an insurmountable one, was that the LAPD had engaged in almost wholesale destruction of the physical evidence in the case. In addition to the ceiling panels having been removed by the LAPD, booked into evidence and destroyed, the center divider between the swinging doors and the door jam on the left side received like treatment. This is not, they say in parentheses, parentheses the Rossi right door jam, which is the door jam just talked about with the uh, apparent bullet hole and bullet fragment in it. The LAPD also destroyed the gun that they used for decibel sound tests in the Sandro Serrano affair, which is another part of the investigation that uh, Christian and Turner will talk about later. Also curiously missing are the left sleeves on RFK's coat and shirt. Most suspicious of all, however, all important LAPD scientific reports, <coughs> excuse me, in this case, were, per the LAPD spokespeople, quote, either lost or destroyed. These included the spectrographic report on all the victim bullets. The purpose of a spectrographic test is to determine the metallic and chemical constituency of the recovered bullet. Boxes of ammo have code numbers which refer to the origin of the bullets therein. By furnishing this code number to the manufacturer of the bullets, they can ascertain the metallic and chemical con constituency of the, quote, batch of lead from which the ammo came. If, for instance, a bullet recovered from a crime scene contains, among other elements, antimony, but a companion bullet from the same crime scene does not, a powerful inference can be drawn that the two bullets were not fired from the same gun. Since the LAPD contended that all eight expended cartridges in the Sirhan gun came from the same box of ammo, which was discovered in the Sirhan car, the spectrographic report could have supported their scientific case. Conversely, however, it could also have refuted it. Now, just one last point to make on the spectro spectrographic evidence. One of the main reasons the spectrographic evidence is so important in these kinds of cases, in, the, in these uh, studies of the ballistics um, of, a, of a murder scene or a crime scene, is that unlike marking striations, uh, whatever you want to call them, rifling um, the on bullets themselves, which can be physically uh, added to a bullet or in some cases maybe even taken off of a bullet, uh, you know, a, a piece of lead after the scene, uh, after the crime, you would have to actually find a bullet fragment of the same chemical constituency to fake spectrographic evidence. So spectrographic evidence becomes very valuable when there's questions as to the validity of the physical observation evidence of where the, you know, if the slugs match. The spectrographic is all important. And here the LAPD, besides destroying door jams, door dividers, uh, ceiling panels, all of which had quite possibly had bullet holes and some, some that we know had bullet holes in them, they've also either, quote, lost or destroyed the spectrographic evidence. Okay, now recall, of course, that... Uh the spectrographic evidence was destroyed in uh, the John Kennedy assassination. Well, it basically uh, was kept secret. It wasn't destroyed, but the spectrographic evidence was uh, hidden from investigators in the John Kennedy investigation, and spectrographic or ballistics tests were not conducted in the case of the assassination of Martin Luther King. And uh, yet, despite uh, Herbert McDonnell uh, and the ballistics experts' testimony that they could have been, so obfuscation of the ballistics evidence and uh, all of the other uh, types of evidence is a pattern which almost becomes numbing after a certain period of time when you examine the assassinations. I just wanted to mention that. As a matter of fact, in the John F. Kennedy case, the, uh, once the, ballistic, the uh, spectrographic evidence was finally discovered many years after the fact, um, it proved to be quite a shocker because although uh, J. Edgar Hoover tried to gloss over what the, uh, the spectrographic evidence had shown, saying basically there was only a slight differentiation between these two slugs or whatever, um, the fact is, is that in spectrographic evidence, any differentiation uh, in the content of the bullets is, is a powerful argument that the bullets are, in fact, not from the same batch of lead and hence not from the same package or not from the same group of cartridges. So in the Kennedy case, although many years after the fact, the spectrographic evidence proved to be another damning factor in the Warren Commission's theory, and it's very possible that uh, some of the people involved in the Los Angeles Police Department cover-up, if there was such a cover-up, which you'll have to make your own mind up on later, um, it's quite possible they said, well, we're not going to be caught this way twice. We're just going to lose the spectrographic evidence. Okay, and recall, uh, 
The, well, the, if, if you would like to examine the, uh, the, the chorus of the uh, hiding in the spectrographic evidence and uh, the legal uh, machinations surrounding that, that was covered in our Guns of November broadcast. And uh, in, interestingly enough, Judge John Sirica of Watergate fame was the judge who initially uh, blocked disclosure of the evidence. And again, uh, the Guns of November tapes are on file. If you don't have them, give us a call after the broadcast and we'll tell you how to get them. Now, we're going to provide some information now which uh, will indicate who may, who may have fired the fatal shots from the rear of Robert Kennedy, continuing with the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. Donald Shulman, S-C-H-U-L-M-A-N, a CBS News employee who was behind Kennedy in the pantry and whose line of vision included both Saran and a uniformed security guard, told radio reporter Jeff Brandt moments after the shooting, quote, A Caucasian gentleman stepped out and fired three times. The security guard hit Kennedy all three times. Mr. Kennedy slumped to the floor. They carried him away. The security guard fired back. Brandt said, I heard about six or seven shots in succession. Is this the security guard firing back? Yes, the man who stepped out fired three times at Kennedy, hit him all three times, and then the security guard then fired back, hitting him. Shulman apparently thought that the guard fired at Saran, but accidentally hit Kennedy. So, uh, basically, uh, we have one, a, a CBS News employee, basically has testified that... Uh, a security guard stepped out in, in, in uh, the opinion of the CBS News employee, fired three shots at Saran, but accidentally hit Kennedy. So we're going to take a look at uh, whether or not a security guard may have fired shots and whether or not he hit Kennedy, and if he did, whether or not it was an accident. When the second gun controversy showed no sign of dying, the authorities apparently felt they had to take steps not to get caught short. On July 14, 1971, investigators from the DA's office and Sergeants Phil Sartucci and Chuck Collins, formerly of Special Unit Senator, SUS, which was the special team set up to investigate the Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy assassination. Um, let me start that sentence over. On July 14, 1971, investigators from the DA's office and Sergeants Phil Sartucci and Chuck Collins, formerly of SUS, secretly questioned a private security guard who had been at Kennedy's elbow when he was shot. The guard, Thane Eugene Caesar, although I've heard people pronounce it Cesar, and I'm not sure which, but Thane Eugene Caesar, spelled first name T-H-A-N-E, Thane Eugene, last name C-E-S-A-R, was employed on the day shift at the Lockheed Aircraft Plant in Burbank and was moonlighting for the Ace Guard Service. The sallow-faced, black-haired security man was the only person in the crowded pantry other than Sir Han assumed to have drawn a gun although witness Donald Shulman said he'd spotted two other revolvers, both of which he insisted had been fired. Cesar told the DA and LAPD investigators that when he saw Sirhan fire the first shot, quote, I immediately ducked and I immediately got knocked down, unquote. As he got up, he drew his gun. Quote, did you ever fire a shot, he was asked. No, he replied. Okay, bear that in mind, that's going to come up later. Thane Caesar, at Kennedy's right elbow claims that when he saw Sirhan fire, he ducked and was knocked down immediately, that he never fired a shot. Okay. Cesar identified the gun he was carrying as a Rome 38 caliber revolver that he had purchased especially for his guard duties. Asked if he owned any other handguns, the recovered bullets were 22 caliber, he said that he had had a 22 h and pistol, but sold it to a friend at Lockheed who retired in February 1968 and moved to Arkansas. Okay, we'll go back to that. Caesar, Caesar mentioned that he had told the police ser sergeant about this gun when he was interviewed after the assassination. In fact, he said, I don't remember if I showed it to him, but I did mention that I had a gun similar to the one that was used that night, unquote. The investigators picked up on this contradiction in Caesar's earlier statement that he had sold the gun three months before the assassination. Their initial concern was whether he had told any outsider about it, and Caesar said he couldn't be sure. He then backtracked, saying he couldn't have shown it to the sergeant because he had already sold it. That seemed to satisfy the investigators, who told Caesar that it wouldn't be necessary for him to take a lie detector test. Okay, before I go on, let me just go back over this real quickly here. Another evidence of the, the relentless pursuit of the facts on the part of the Los Angeles Police Department and Special Unit Senator um, Thane Eugene Caesar is the only other man presumed to have drawn a gun, okay, uh, admits that he had a gun of the same caliber as the one that killed Kennedy and, and wounded five other people, 
claims that he sold it to a friend uh, in February 1968 who retired, um, then claimed that he still managed to have it to show to a police investigator after the assassination, realized the contradiction, claimed he couldn't have shown it because he'd already sold it, and the men involved in this investigation of a very important political murder case say, oh, well, that's fine, now we understand, Thane, thanks a lot, don't bother to take a lie detector test. Going on with Christian and Turner's narrative. It didn't satisfy us, however, and on October 13, 1972, Christian, one of the authors, reached the man to whom Caesar had sold the 22 revolver, Jim Yoder, Y-O-D-E-R, who was living in Blue Mountain, Arkansas. Yoder said that he had been an engineer at Lockheed before retiring in the fall of 1968 and that he knew Caesar casually from the plant. Yoder was uncertain of what Caesar's specific job was, saying that he had, quote, floating assignments and often worked in an off-limits area which only special personnel had access to. This was, said Yoder, the CIA-controlled U-2 spy plane facility. Bear that in mind. We'll get back to that later. Yoder related that about a month after the assassination, Caesar showed him the revolver and he offered to buy it to use in the Ozarks after his retirement. At Yoder's request, Caesar later wrote out a receipt that read, quote, on the day of September 6th, 1968, I received $15 from Jim Yolder, misspelled. The item involved is a, is a H&R pistol, nine-shot, serial number Y13332, signed Thane E. Caesar. Here was documentary evidence that Caesar sold the gun three months after the assassination. Yoder remembered that during their post-assassination meeting, Caesar dragged out his security guard uniform, the H&R 22, and his 38 pistol but didn't mention the RFK assassination. But Caesar, quote, looked a little worried, and he said something about going to the assistance of an officer and firing his gun. He said there might be a little problem over that, unquote. Okay, just real quickly to note a couple of things for you. Again, to make very clear, um, the investigators assumed that despite the fact that Thane Caesar was the only other person presumed to have drawn a gun, claimed he didn't fire it, happened to have a pistol that just happened to be the same caliber as the one that killed Robert F. Kennedy, um, that, uh, that he claimed to at first to have sold it three months before the assassination, then suddenly remembered that since he also said that he'd showed it to a police investigator after the assassination, that one of the two couldn't be right. Um, so then he claimed, no, he couldn't have shown it to the investigator because he sold it three months before. And then, uh, according to the authors, they talked to the man he sold it to, who had produced a bill saying he sold it to him three months after the assassination. And last but not least, uh, an interesting fact that Thane Caesar worked at Burbank Lockheed at the, uh, in what Yoder said was a special personnel area that uh, was where the CIA worked on the CIA U-2 spy plane. And Dave will explain some of the interesting things about that. Well, basically, we've looked at a couple of key U-2 connections in past broadcasts. Of course, in the Guns of November, in our very first broadcast in that series, we talked about Lee Harvey Oswald, who had uh, worked at the Atsugi Naval Air Station in Japan, which was one of the main areas from which U-2 flights took off. He also worked at, uh, at uh, Peshawar in Pakistan at one point, and uh, they, uh, that also was involved in the U-2 flights. Now, uh, the U-2 plane, as we looked at uh, some information presented by Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty, formerly Air Force Focal Point Officer, in other words, involved with coordinating Air Force and CIA activities where CIA requires air units, uh, Fletcher Prouty stated that, in, in, in no uncertain terms, that the U-2 spy plane had been deliberately brought down over Russian territory as a provocation. There was no missile available that could have uh, sent this down. And Lee Harvey Oswald basically got the blame uh, in certain uh, circles. Uh, the pilot of the U-2, Francis Gary Powers, intimates that Oswald had betrayed this information about the U-2 f to the Russians. And, uh, incidentally, Oswald had a crypto clearance, and uh, there's a lot of... Uh, flap in the media now about a bunch of Navy men, Navy cryptologists who apparently were spying for the Soviets. So uh, this is a problem, I guess, which has bedeviled sections of the military for some time. Of course, Lee Harvey Oswald was actually a U.S. intelligence agent functioning as a double agent in the Soviet Union, this we've looked at in the past. Well, that's, that's our presumption, we should say. Well, it looks pretty probable in light of the, the handling of the man, how he was able to uh, defect the Russians. Yes, no, Soviet... I agree. It's very probable. But, yeah. uh, we, we, we haven't yet... Uh, well, there is a report that uh, his, his CIA number was 11069. 
Sunshine, which uh, the Warren Commission said was just a rumor, a very specific rumor, but they said it was just a rumor. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll wait and see what happens. But anyway, back to the U2. Lee Harvey Oswald gets the blame for something he could not possibly have done. Prouty indicated that not only was the plane sabotaged, but that Francis Gary Powers was... Uh, uh, I guess you could say tagged with identification, which would have made it perfectly obvious to anyone that he was working for CIA. And uh, this uh, was totally in contravention of the accepted procedures in this case. Prouty made it clear that, it, it, that the Russians did not bring the plane down, that the flight was sabotaged uh, by persons high up within the U.S. intelligence apparatus, and indicated that the flight itself was uh, illegal and that President Eisenhower had forbidden any flights before his summit meeting with uh, Soviet Premier Khrushchev. That summit meeting was deep six by the U-2 incident. Incidentally, uh, a person who was in charge of the security for the U-2 was a fellow by the name of Edwin Wilson, a, quote, ex-CIA agent who, along with his cohort Frank Triple, was the subject of our fourth Radio Free America broadcast. And Ed Wilson uh, was, after uh, the being in charge of the U-2, uh, did a number of interesting things, uh, which... Uh, we have interpreted as provocation. He uh, shipped a lot of arms and uh, training personnel to Libya for Moammar Gaddafi. And so the question is, when you have a, uh, a person whose specialty is provocation, uh, as acting as the C, in, basically in charge of security for the U-2, when the U-2 goes down as a provocation, certainly you have to ask yourself some questions. But both Edwin Wilson and Lee Harvey Oswald go back to the U-2. So when we see uh, Eugene Caesar, according to Yoder, working at a top-secret uh, area of the Burbank plant associated with U-2, it certainly uh, raises questions. A lot of different uh, elements and human beings crop up over and over again in connection with all of the assassinations. And uh, later in this broadcast, we're going to take a look at some connecting links between not only the John and Robert Kennedy assassinations, but our other assassinations and attempted assassinations as well. I would also state that uh, we're going to come back next month. Our Radio Free America broadcast is going to be the first of a two-part series in all probability about the Aryan Nations, uh, a uh, very powerful neo-Nazi group which has a number of interesting connections. And remember the Lockheed Burbank facility. We're going to come back to that. Continuing now with the account of... Um, Turner and Christian here about Fane Eugene Caesar and his uh, transaction with Jim Yoder. Had Yoder ever been interviewed by the LAPD? Yoder said that the Los Angeles, Los Angeles police had called him approximately a year earlier or shortly after Caesar was questioned, and he gave them essentially the same information. He specifically recalled telling the police about the receipt for the gun dated three months after the assassination, but he no longer had the gun. Around the time that the police called his home was burglarized, and the gun taken. Once again, the LAPD and DA's office had squelched information that might have pointed to a conspiracy. They knew that Caesar sold the gun after the assassination, not before, as he had contended. They knew that if Caesar had been situated to Kennedy's immediate right and rear, as he himself stated, the entry angle of the three bullets striking Kennedy was consistent with that position. They also must have known that Kennedy apparently clutched Caesar's snap-on bow tie from his neck. In the famous news photo showing the senator lying on his back on the floor, his head in a pool of blood, the shiny black tie appears next to his right hand. Caesar conceded that the tie was his and he, that he returned to the pantry to retrieve it, but no one ever asked him how it had been ripped from his neck. In early 1976, Allard Lowenstein retrieved a series of assassination broadcast tapes from the Kennedy family and sent them on to West Coast researchers for review. One of those tapes, discovered by Lillian Castellano and Floyd Nelson... <clears throat> By the way, Lillian Castellano was an excellent assassination researcher who was murdered under ambiguous circumstances in Los Angeles immediately following her participation in the Robert Kennedy investigation. Repeating this sentence again. One of those tapes, discovered by Lillian Castellano and Floyd Nelson, involved an interview made by KFWB reporter John Marshall within minutes following the shooting in the kitchen pantry of the Ambassador Hotel. Marshall. I have just talked with an officer who tells me that he was at the senator's side when the shots occurred. Officer, can you confirm that the senator has been shot? Officer, yes, I was there holding his arm when they shot him. Note the word they shot him. What happened? Answer, I don't know. A gentleman standing by the lunch counter there, and as he walked up, the guy pulled a gun and shot at him. Was it just one man? No. Yeah, one man. Note that he reverses his answer here. Question, what sort of wound did the senator receive? Well, from where I could see, it looked like he was shot in the head and the chest and the shoulder. Okay, now, remember, earlier Caesar says that he was knocked down and couldn't see what happened. Well, here he just apparently had a very good view, according to him, of what happened. How many shots did you hear? Four. You heard four shots. Did you see anyone else hit at that time? Nope. What is your name, officer? Gene Caesar. 
In Caesar's 1971 interview by Los Angeles law enforcement officials, he, one, denied ever seeing Saron himself, only his gun-wielding hand, and two, stated that he got knocked down and didn't see the actual shooting events after the initial shot was fired. Yet right after the shooting, he tells reporter Marshall details that conflict severely with his later version. It is also curious that Caesar's contemporaneous account locates the exact number and placement of shots and wounds in RFK's body inflicted from the rear, his own conceded position, when no such identifications were possible until doctors examined the senator at a nearby hospital some 20 minutes later. We find two more of the interview answers equally intriguing. Caesar's reference that they shot him, unquote, and his response, no, yeah, one man, unquote, shot RFK. This same information was available or known to Los Angeles officials from the outset. But instead of focusing on Fane Caesar, District Attorney Joe Bush would swing the beams of his 1971 conspiracy probe onto Bill Harper and John Christian. As indicated there, instead of pursuing Caesar, they uh, pursued the pursuers in an attempt to, so obviously, to intimidate them from uh, despoiling the official version of the event. Uh, uh, one of the things that we're not going to go into here, but there are accounts of other people being in the pantry of the Ambassador Hotel, an FBI report. Um, well, but first, before I tell you about the FBI report, let me tell you, listen to KFJC Los Santos Hills, and the FBI report uh, basically stated that a busboy in the pantry of the Ambassador Hotel named Juan Romero testified that two men came to him posing as police officers and that they had Kennedy signs around their neck and that they obtained white kitchen boy's uh, garb the day before Senator Kennedy was killed, uh, there were no FB, no policemen sent uh, to the uh, to to the Ambassador Hotel to uh, function in that manner. So the question remains as to just who these people were. Okay, going to read one last section here, and then we're going to take a short break, and then we're going to play some tape for you. This is uh, a small segment of a uh, a published private manuscript by S. Duncan Harp. It's entitled The Tangled Web, an Inquiry into the Assassination of Senator Robert F. Kennedy. And uh, it deals specifically in this small section we're going to read with Thane Caesar, some of his stated political views. It says, We have heretofore presented evidence to show the official explanation of how Sirhan Sirhan shot Senator Robert Kennedy alone and unaided is so critically amiss in so many areas as to be virtually worthless as an account of the events which took place in the kitchen pantry. We have also presented some evidence to show that there may have been more than one gun fired, and that, if so, the probable perpetrator of this action was security guard Caesar. But did Caesar have a motive to kill Robert Kennedy? After all, if he did not have one, he would have been a rather unlikely candidate for an assassin. SUS Chief Houghton stated in his book, Special Unit Senator, that there were no persons of right-wing connections or beliefs in the pantry at the time of the shooting. This statement was incorrect, and, if anything, the person who most puts the lie to it was Thane Eugene Caesar. An admitted admirer and 68 campaign worker for George Wallace, Caesar had associations with American Nazis. During Caesar's interviews with Sherrock, who's a man who interviewed him for the purposes of his, uh, his place in this whole thing, Caesar revealed himself to be both a reactionary and a racist. Caesar told Sherrock, Quote, the black man now for the past four to eight years has been cramming this integrated idea down our throat, and so you've learned to hate him. And one of these days, at the rate they're going, there is going to be a civil war in this country. It's going to be white against black, and the only thing I'd say is the black will never win. I mean, me as an individual, I'm fed up, and I know a lot of people that I work with have the same feeling. It's just that we had it shoved down our throat enough. But one of these days, it's going to be shoved too far, and then we're going to fight back. First of all, I think the white man is going to try and do it with his voting power. And if they can't do it by getting the right person to straighten the thing out, then he's going to take it in his own hands. I can't see any other way to go. The blacks, the minorities, have gone too far. One of these days, the white man is going to get tired of, and the minorities aren't going to like what's coming up. We've had it up to here. There's going to be war in this country between black and white, and the blacks ain't never going to win. Said Caesar, quote, you couldn't put in a book what I think of those student protesters. They'd censor it. He further told Sherrack that, quote, he definitely wouldn't have voted for Bobby Kennedy because he had the same idea that John did, and I think John Kennedy sold the country down the road. He gave it to the commies. He literally gave it to the minority. He said, here, you take over. You run the white man. One of these days, it's going too far. In some, the author concludes, Thane Eugene Caesar hated Bobby Kennedy and almost everything he stood for. 
and he was virulently opposed to Bobby's positions on the war and civil rights, the two major issues upon which Kennedy had based his campaign for the presidency. Well, a lot of things to uh, bite on there. I would note uh, not only the obvious uh, tone of Caesar's political views, but note his uh, stated association with American Nazis, because we're going to touch back on that uh, in our broadcast uh, broadcasts about the Aryan nations. Okay, so Caesar, an associate of American Nazis, obviously a racist and an ultra, excuse me, ultra right winger. Uh, and this fellow, according to, uh, well, he basically, he's, an, he's a security guard standing behind Senator Kennedy. According to the head of the uh, LAPD unit that investigated the crime, no right-wingers are in the pantry. So, again, another distortion here. But uh, Fane Eugene Caesar's association with Nazis in light of the Nazi connections to the John Kennedy assassination that we talked about is quite possibly significant, something we're going to touch back on in our next Radio Free America broadcast. Okay, as we mentioned before, you are, of course, listening to KFJC. This is Radio Free America. Uh, I'm Nip Tuck here with Dave Emery. We're going to take a short musical break, give you a chance to get up and stretch and jump up and down a little bit, perhaps. And uh, we know that this is a long time to be sitting in one place, believe me, because we're doing it, too. Um, this is from uh, the Radio Free America broadcast that we aired in November of 1984, specifically November 29, 1984 on the subject of mind control. And uh, as you might guess, one of the main questions that people ask is, well, if uh, Sir Han, Sir Han really was a patsy, you know, I mean, uh, you know, the guy went in there, he waved a gun around, he fired something. I mean, you know, what was the deal? Was he, you know, they, they couldn't count on having some lunatic coming in off the streets and doing that. Um, well, this is, of course, one of the things that has to be looked into. And as we will find in this discussion on the, uh, the com upcoming of this uh, segment excerpted from November's Radio Free America, uh, Sirhan Sirhan proved to be a strangely, uh, easily hypnotizable young man, uh, a real propensity for hypnosis. And uh, we're going to talk about that and some other things on this tape segment. Okay, now, uh, the very ease with which uh, Saran Saran could be hypnotized is one of the main points here, because a um, hypnotist who hypnotized Saran and concluded that Saran was a paranoid schizophrenic and an easy subject for hypnosis named Bernard Diamond, who, by the way, is right up the University of California at Berkeley within our signal radius. Uh, Diamond basically uh, put his foot in his mouth when he said that, because uh, paranoid schizophrenics are, for all intents and purposes, impossible to hypnotize. So there's a massive internal contradiction in Diamond's statement. Uh, Diamond concluded that Saran did indeed kill Robert Kennedy, and uh, critics of the official version of the Robert Kennedy assassination have focused on Diamond's role and questioned whether, under hypnosis, Diamond actually convinced Saran that he did shoot Robert Kennedy, because Saran, as uh, indications will, uh, will there be indications of plenty in the text that uh, we're gonna, are going to be on this tape segment, that Saran harbored no animosity towards Robert Kennedy and did not want to kill him. So uh, the question about whether or not Saran was under mind control and was led to believe that he committed a crime he did not commit is one of the, uh, one of the main uh, bones of contention here. Bernard Diamond being one of the uh, focuses of the investigation, one of the points of suspicion, I guess you could say. Another factor is the uh, question of who did hypnoprogram Saran originally, because he obviously, Saran, uh, well, we're going to get into uh, the information about his notebooks, but uh, Saran produced some interesting notebooks with a lot of interesting writing, and uh, just what that writing said, what it, uh, in what state it was performed, and so forth, is going to be one of the major focuses of uh, this tape segment. And again, uh, Mind control is a capability that our intelligence and military have had for many years. We did a three-part Radio Free America series on that. If you'd like to know more about it, and again, I realize that there are some people probably tuned in for the first time or one of the first times and are wondering what we're talking about with mind control. Again, our intelligence agencies and our military have had the capability of totally controlling the individual human mind and in small groups for quite some time. Details are available uh, from the Radio Free America shows if you want to call us after the broadcast. But again, as far as the mind control of Saran Saran and his possible role as a, as a patsy, a hypno-programmed patsy, uh, the discussion that follows is from our Radio Free America show number 6 from November 29th, 1984. All right. Now, in the early days of the, uh, as a matter of fact, in the very first day of the uh, investigation of the murder of Robert F. Kennedy, um, there was a, a particularly interesting discovery made, which was later used as basically being the, um, the final uh, nail in the coffin of Sirhan Sirhan as far as his legal uh, defense went. This, again, is from Operation Mind Control by Walter Bullard, and uh, I'm going to read to you from that. On the floor next to Sirhan's bed was a large spiral notebook. On the desk was another notebook. There was a third small notebook, a good deal of occult literature, 
a brochure advertising a book on mental projection and a large brown envelope from the Internal Revenue Service on which someone had written, RFK must be disposed of like his brother was. At the bottom of the envelope was scrawled, Reactionary. In one of the notebooks, there was a page which was used later in the trial to prove premeditation. Quote, May 18th, 9.45 a.m., 68. Of course, 1968 was the year in which uh, Kennedy was killed. It was June 5th, so this is supposed to have been about uh, 20 days before the assassination. My determination, the notebook reads, to eliminate RFK is becoming more the more of an unshakable obsession. RFK must die. RFK must be killed. Robert F. Kennedy must be assassinated. RFK must be assassinated. RFK must be assassinated. No punctuation between those. Robert F. Kennedy must be assassinated before 5 June 68. Robert F. Kennedy must be assassinated. I have never heard. Please pay to the order of, 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 of this or that. Please pay to the order of. Also drawn on the page were spirals, diamonds, and doodles. Okay. Uh, the, um, the next passage here, now we're going to continue a little later in uh, the Operation Mind Control by Walter Bowert. Uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about someone named the girl in the polka dot dress and present you with some other anomalies about the Robert Kennedy assassination. Okay, skipping along in Operation Mind Control. The chief counsel for the Los Angeles chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union, A.L. Wirin, spelled W-I-R-I-N, went to Sir Han's defense within hours of his arrest. On his second meeting with the accused, Wirin brought the local papers with him. Sir Han read the headline. Kennedy's dead. Then he dropped his head in grief. After fighting to control his emotions, he looked at Warren through tearful eyes and said, quote, Mr. Warren, I'm a failure. I believe in love, and instead of showing love, then Warren recalled, quote, he muttered something about having betrayed his own primary beliefs. That night, Sir Han claimed of being, complained of being sick. He became very dizzy and had severe stomach cramps, just as Castillo and Candy Jones. By the way, just inserting here, Castillo we already talked about. At the end of last show, Candy Jones is coming up. For several weeks, Sir Han was given a half grain of phenobarbital at night to help him sleep. The Los Angeles police went through the motions of looking into the possibility that a conspiracy was behind the RFK assassination. They looked for the girl in the polka dot dress, who witnesses said had been standing next to Sir Han, smiling and talking to him just before he began shooting in the pantry. Sir Han also said he'd been talking to the girl after he'd drunk several Tom Collinses. The girl in the polka dot dress was not found, and conflicting statements cast doubt on whether there had ever been such a girl. Forty-five, quote, top men from the Los Angeles Police Department were assigned the job of tracking down all leads to a conspiracy, but incredibly, they came up empty-handed. A bag of women's clothing, which included a polka dot dress and new undergarments, was found by the LAPD in an alley but police could not find out who'd brought them or who'd worn them. According to Saran's biographer, Robert Blair Kaiser, quote, the police and FBI hardly did all they could to find the owner of the polka dot dress. They used faulty logic and browbeat witnesses to eliminate the girl in the polka dot dress. To penetrate Saran's amnesia, the defense decided to call in an expert hypnotist, Dr. Bernard L. Diamond of the University of California. Diamond was the associate dean of UCLA's School of Criminology and a professor of both law and psychiatry. No one knew more about law, psychiatry, and hypnosis than Diamond. Now, before we tell you more here about Professor Diamond, uh, remember that uh, Saran Saran, who supposedly now had assassinated Robert Kennedy, appeared to be very grief-stricken and, and dumbfounded when informed that Robert Kennedy was dead. He also reacted in a very similar fashion, not only to Mr. Castillo, possibly involved in the assassination of John Kennedy, as we looked at in the first broadcast, but also uh, behaved in a, very, in a fashion very similar to Candy Jones, a CIA mind control courier who we're going to talk about later in the broadcast. Continuing now with uh, Bernard Diamond, and uh, the section of Walter Bowert's book we're going to deal with now uh, basically indicates that in all probability, Bernard Diamond had hypnotized Saran Saran and under hypnosis convinced Saran that he did in fact kill Senator Kennedy, whereas the physical evidence would indicate that he could not have killed Senator Kennedy, and his reaction upon learning of Senator Kennedy's death certainly indicates that he harbored no malice against uh, RFK. Continuing now with Operation Mind Control. In a pre-hypnosis interview, Diamond asked Saran to tell him about his notebooks, and Saran said he couldn't recall writing them. Now, recall, though, those are, those are the same notebooks, the, the rambling, sort of stuttering notebooks that Nip Tuck read you about earlier in the book here. 
Diamond asked if he thought that what he had done helped things, and Saran said, quote, I'm not proud of what I did, unquote. What do you mean you're not proud of it, Diamond asked him. You believe in your cause, don't you? Saran had been contacted by Arab sympathizers and others who insisted that the reason he'd killed Kennedy was out of sympathy for the PLO. I have no exact knowledge, sir, that this happened yet. I'm all, it's all in my mind, but God damn it, when my body played with it, I couldn't understand it. I still don't believe it. My body outsmarted my brain, I guess. What did your body do, Diamond asked. Pulled that trigger, Saran said. Does your body remember it, even if your mind doesn't? I don't give a damn, sir, in a way. Now I don't even care, Saran said. Diamond asked Saran if he'd thought about suicide. Hell no, Saran said. I couldn't do that. Then Diamond expressed a thought which contained a significant Freudian slip. Why didn't you turn the gas on yourself? Uh, why didn't you turn the gun on yourself after you killed Kennedy? Recall, uh, interrupting here that... Uh, many subjects of the CIA and military mind control programs had been trained to commit suicide, as we excuse me, uh, discussed in connection with DeMoran Shield, as we're going to look at again in connection with Candy Jones, the courier mentioned earlier. Saran waved his hand in front of his face. It was all mixed up, like a dream, unquote. Diamond hypnotized Saran on six of eight visits. At one point, reliving the killing, Saran grabbed at his belt on the left side. Until then, police had no idea where he'd carried the weapon. Under hypnosis, Saran also created writings similar to those in his notebooks. In one session, Diamond had Saran climb the bars of his cell like a monkey. After he'd been brought out of trance, Saran explained the reason for his climb. He said he was only getting exercise. Then, Diamond played the tape to prove to Saran that he, Diamond, had given the instructions to Saran to climb the cage, but Saran denied that he'd done it because he'd been hypnotized. At the trial, Dr. Diamond, acting as the director of Saran's defense, testified that Saran was a paranoid schizophrenic. Keep that in mind now. I'll read that last sentence again because this is central to the whole argument here. At the trial, Dr. Diamond, ask, acting as the director of Saran's defense, testified that Saran was a paranoid schizophrenic. His testimony was supported by several other doctors who had examined the psychiatric evidence obtained from tests, interviews, and hypno-interviews conducted by Diamond. Dr. Diamond did not consider that Saran had been other than self-programmed. Having worked for the Army Medical Corps in World War II, he did not realize that the U.S. cryptocracy could develop mind control and use it to control the political destiny of the nation. Saran was given yet another battery of tests by Dr. Eric Marcus, a court-appointed psychiatrist for the defense. Among the tests was the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, the MMPI, which contains more than 500 questions requiring true-false answers. Psychologists, inter psychologists, interpret the psychologists interpret the answers to the MMPI according to a set of statistical norms. Two of Saran's non-responses were significant, since usually non-responses are considered to be more important than the yes-no responses. The questions Saran did not respond to were, number 291, at one or more times in my life, I felt that someone was making me do things by hypnotizing me. And 293... Someone has been trying to influence my mind. Okay. Continuing on a little further on in Walter Bauer's book, um, and again, after, the, after Sirhan has gone to, uh, gone to trial, been convicted, and uh, in the words of Walter Bauer, uh, quickly put away for life, uh, he goes on to talk about some of the experiences that Sirhan had with other hyp hyp hypnotists and hypnosis while in prison. And it says as follows, There were those, however, who refused to let the matter rest. In 1973, while Sir Han sat in prison, Dr. Edward Simpson, the San Quentin prison psychiatrist, submitted an affidavit to the California courts requesting that Sir Han be granted a new trial and that the Robert Kennedy case be reopened. Dr. Simpson testified that the, quote, expert psych psych psychiatric psychological testimony at Sir Han's trial was full of numerous factual errors and misleading to the jury. Quote, most of the doctors testifying, Simpson said, saw their role as proving why Sirhan killed Kennedy, which required a focus on pathology, mental illness, that I found does not exist. They failed to consider the real facts in a more objective light and failed to consider the possibility clearly suggested by the ballistic testimony and Sirhan's own testimony under close scrutiny that perhaps Sirhan did not kill Robert F. Kennedy. Sirhan's trial, Dr. Simpson wrote, was not handled properly by the mental health professionals. In retrospect, a close study of the trial testimony and my own extensive study of Saran leads to one irrevocable 
an obvious conclusion. Sirhan's trial was and will be remembered as the psychiatric blunder of the century. Dr. Simpson knew whereof he spoke. For six years he had worked at San Quentin Prison and had made a study of men on death row. For two years he'd been in charge of the prison psychological testing program. In 1969 he interviewed and tested Sirhan extensively during 20 weekly visits. After these visits were terminated, Sirhan requested that his family contact Simpson for the purpose of reviewing the psychiatric testimony that had been given at his trial. After examining Sirhan and reviewing the, quote, expert psychiatric testimony, Dr. Simpson discussed his findings with the prison's chief psychiatrist, Dr. David G. Schmidt. Together, they concluded that their findings did not confirm, quote, but in fact were strictly in conflict with the findings reported at Sirhan's trial. Quote, nowhere in Sirhan's test response, Dr. Simpson said in the affidavit, was I able to find evidence that he is a, quote, paranoid schizophrenic or, quote, psychotic, as testified by the doctors at the trial. The fact is, paranoid schizophrenics are almost impossible to hypnotize. They are too suspicious and do not trust anybody, including friends and relatives. Not to speak, um, excuse me, I just lost that there. Um, they do not trust anybody, including friends and relatives, not to speak of a hypnotist from for him, the most hated race. Psychotics in general are among the poorest subjects for hypnosis. They cannot concentrate, they do not follow instructions, and basically do not trust. Sirhan, however, was an unusually good hypnotic subject. Sirhan asked me to hypnotize him, which I did not do, in order not to contaminate my test findings with fantasies. He himself had manufactured a hypno-disc and was practicing self-hypnosis in his cell, an activity requiring considerable self-control which no psychotic has. The fact that Sirhan was easy to hypnotize, as testified by Dr. Diamond, proves he was not a paranoid schizophrenic. Quote, Dr. Diamond, Simpson continued, used hypnosis in six sessions out of eight with Sirhan. What was the purpose of it? To plant ideas in Sirhan's mind, ideas that were not there before? To make him accept the idea that he killed Robert F. Kennedy? When Dr. Diamond was unable to get Sirhan to admit that he wrote the net notebooks, he testified... Quote, so I undertook, this is, by the way, is Simpson talking about Dr. Diamond. He testified, quote, so I undertook some experiments on possible hypnotic suggestion, unquote. This admission, writes Simpson, strongly suggests the possibility of hypnosis being used for implanting hypothetical ideas in Sir Han's mind rather than uncovering facts. A lie detector, not hypnosis, should have been used in finding out whether Sir Han killed Robert Kennedy. Now, uh, before we continue on, let me just point out one, one factor here besides the obvious things being stated here, and that is Sir Han's own increasing interest in hypnotism, as we're going to see later in the broadcast when we get to talking about uh, James Earl Ray and some other people. Um, it's possible that this interest in hypnotism could be in and of itself uh, evidence perhaps of uh, a lingering feeling, uh, an, an undefinable feeling on the part of a hypnoprogram subject that something is wrong, and that uh, some kind of hypnosis is necessary to figure out what has been done. So again, this is just a possibility, but it does seem to crop up in other uh, similar cases. Going back to Operation Mind Control by Walter Bowart. Saron, Dr. Diamond concluded, had obviously had experience with hypnosis before. He found that Saron was reluctant to speak under hypnosis, but that he could easily write without being post-hypnotically blocked. Writing under hypnosis is called automatic writing, Diamond said, and the term aptly describes the way Saran would write like a robot and keep on repeating a word or phrase until I stopped him, unquote. Taking a sheet off a legal pad lying nearby, Diamond asked Saran to write his answers to the questions put to him in the hypnotic trance. He showed Saran a sample of his diary page. Is this crazy writing, Diamond asked. Yes, 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 Saran wrote. Are you crazy, Diamond asked. No, no, Saran wrote. Well, why are you writing crazy, Diamond asked. Practice, 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 Saran responded. Practice for what, Diamond asked. Mind control, mind control, mind control, is what Saran wrote. Now remember, Diamond hypnotizes Saran, testifies that he's a paranoid schizophrenic, and yet provides te uh, contradictory testimony that he was easy to hypnotize. Paranoid schizophrenics are, for all intents and purposes, as in Dr. Simpson's uh, testimony read earlier, impossible to hypnotize. So... It appears that uh, Dr. Diamond's uh, analysis of Saran's situation is not only contradictory, but strongly suggests that, uh, as indicated in uh, Bowart's text, that Dr. Diamond was actually planting the idea in Saran's head that uh, he had killed Robert Kennedy. It's worth noting that uh, 
a lie detector is considered much, much more reliable than hypnosis, which frequently pollutes the results uh, in a criminal investigation. And yet uh, Diamond said he had no faith in a lie detector, but had a lot of faith in hypnosis. And while lie detectors are fallible, they're considered much, much more reliable than hypnosis. But again, remember that Diamond actually contradicted himself. Not only is there no evidence that Saran was a paranoid schizophrenic, but that Diamond's testimony that he was easy to uh, hypnotize basically confirms that. Okay, now, uh, before Dave reads the next segment, I want to mention to you that this is out of a book that, if you are interested in the Robert F. Kennedy assassination, and obviously we don't have much time to talk about it tonight, although we are touching on it quite a bit because of the aspect of mind control. This is quite a good book, and as far as I know, it's available in a lot of libraries. You might want to go out and check out a copy if you'd like to. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a very affecting and moving book, and, uh, and very interesting because it's written from, by people who are actually involved in trying to track this stuff down, as opposed to somebody sitting back as a spectator. The book is The Assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, and it's by John Christian, J-O-N-N, -N, Christian, and William G. Turner. And it's, uh, Bill Turner, by the way, is a former FBI agent, and it's published in hardcover by Random House, copyrighted 1978. Now, uh, the... One of the interesting things that Christian and Turner present here is the fact that Saran Saran, that he, as indicated in Bowart's text, was very, very easy to hypnotize and had probably been hypnotized before. Now, one of the things that came out in the course of the investigation, although it did not receive a great deal of emphasis by a special unit senator for reasons you may be able to divine at this point, was the fact that Saran Saran had been associated with a fellow by the name of Manley Palmer Hall. Now, Manley Palmer Hall was a master hypnotist, Interestingly enough, Manley Palmer Hall also served as uh, not only a hypnotist, but a sort of a guru to Los Angeles Mayor Sam Yorty. Yorty was mayor of Los Angeles when uh, Senator Kennedy was killed there in 1968. And uh, it's worth noting, too, that Sam Yorty was one of the people who emerged the morning after the assassination, tossing red herrings all about him by suggesting that Saran was a communist and had many uh, communist leanings, and then uh, Yorty made a, a, a flaming rectum out of himself by referring to the Rosicrucians as a communist organization. But it's interesting that the same, or one of the same hypnotists that Saran was associated with, was also uh, very, very close to Sam Yorty, a reactionary, a man tied to Patrick Frawley, a right-wing uh, luminary, very close to Ronald Reagan, among others. And uh, interesting that Saran and Yorty, who uh, was so instrumental in presenting the in, in pointing the finger at Saran as a communist early on in the investigation, much as Lee Harvey Oswald, the alleged leftist, uh, was bruited about as an agent of Marxism. Again, both of them, both Saran and Yorty, connected to Manley Palmer Hall, reading from the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. Conveniently omitted was the fact that a police search of Saran's car yielded a volume entitled Healing the Divine Art by Manley Palmer Hall, founder of the Philosophical Research Society. The book mysteriously disappeared from the grand jury exhibits. Hall, a man with penetrating eyes, chiseled features, and a Buddha-like figure, was a master hypnotist with a practice in hypnotherapy. Some time ago, he had gained considerable publicity from hypnotic antics, on one occasion putting under, unquote, a movie actor and convincing him he was suffocating, with the result that the actor tore apart a movie set in his frantic search for air. We queried Saran in San Quentin about Hall and his society. He wrote back that he remembered paying several visits to the headquarters, an alabaster temple near Griffith Park. The secretary there had a distinct foreign accent, unquote, he said. Hall's wife is German-born. And I had to ask her to unlock the bookcases for me to get the books I wanted to read in the library. I remember seeing Manley Hall himself there. Saran's dabbling with the occult society is, by itself, innocuous, but there is a certain irony in the fact that he was drinking from the same mystical fountain as Sam Yorty. For some two decades, the mayor had been a student of Hall, whom he regarded as his guru. Now, in the next section of Robert F. Kennedy, the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy by Turner and Christian, there is some discussion here of a, of a fellow named William Joseph Bryan, Jr. Now, William Joseph Bryan, Jr., uh, according to some speculation that engaged in by Turner and Christian, may have been the person who hypnoprogrammed Saran in the first place to uh, be in the... Um, in the, the lobby, the pantry of the Ambassador Hotel. Uh, worth noting maybe in passing, too, that the Ambassador Hotel was owned by G. David Schein, who uh, was uh, one of uh, Joseph McCarthy's assistants in the anti-communist witch hunt of the uh, early 1950s. But uh, this William Joseph Bryan, Jr. is a subject of some uh, lengthy discussion in the assassination of Robert Kennedy. All right, continuing on with the text. Our quest for Sir Hans Programmer had been no more successful than the search for Amelia Earhart until Dr. Herbert Spiegel gave us a lead. 
Anything mentioned in the presence of a subject under hypnosis is automatically etched into his mind, especially if it comes from the hypnotist, and it might flow out at any time. This brought us back to the notebooks containing Sir Han's, quote, automatic writing. Could he have scrawled something during a trance regression that the hypnotist had mentioned while programming him? There was a passage that stood out because it was, unlike the others, having nothing to do with horses, politics, money, or past acquaintances. It read, quote, God help me, please help me, salvo D, spelled D-I-D, -D, salvo, die, S, salvo. The reference apparently was to Albert de Salvo, the notorious Boston Strangler. That case had been cracked by the use of hypnotism, and the hypnotist was Dr. William Joseph Bryan, Jr. of Los Angeles. Bryan billed himself as, quote, probably the leading expert in the world on the use of hypnosis in criminal law, and often boasted about being called into baffling cases by law enforcement agencies, including the LAPD. The Boston Strangler case was his tour de force, and he was incessantly mentioning it. An imposing man with a wrestler's girth, Brian claimed he was once drummer with a Tommy Dorsey band and a commercial air airline pilot, airplane pilot. During the Korean War, he had put his hypnotic skills to use as, in his words, quote, chief of all medical survival training for the United States Air Force, which meant the brainwashing section, unquote. After the war, he reportedly became a CIA consultant in the agency's experimentation with mind control and behavior modification. Refused membership in all traditional medical societies, Brian set up a medical and hypnotherapy practice on the Sunset Strip in Hollywood, which he named the American Institute of Hypnosis. He used it as an aegis for wide-ranging symposiums on such topics as, quote, successful treatments of sexual disorders. Quote, I enjoy variety and I like to get to know people on a deep emotional level, he once told a magazine interviewer. One way of getting to know people is through intercourse. In 1969, the California Board of Medical Examiners found him guilty of unprofessional conduct for sexually molesting four women patients who submitted under hypnosis. Despite his advocacy of sexual freedom, Brian was a Bible-quoting fundamentalist who belonged to a fire and brimstone sect called the Old Roman Catholic Church, which broke away from the Vatican over a century ago. Skipping down to the footnote, is curiously David W. Ferry, a prime suspect in New Orleans D.A. Jim Garrison's 1967 probe into the John Kennedy assassination also belonged to this small sect. Ferry was found dead on February 22, 1967, shortly after being interrogated. should mention that Ferry himself was also a pilot, um, as, as was apparently Brian, or at least as Brian claimed to be. Anyway, so Brian was a member of the old Roman Catholic Church. Brian claimed to be a descendant of the fiery orator William Jennings Bryan, who opposed the teaching of evolution and celebrated Scopes monkey trial, and he frequently was a guest preacher at fundamentalist churches in Southern California. Only hours after the Robert F. Kennedy shooting, and before Sir Han had been identified, Brian appeared on the Los Angeles radio program of Ray Bream on KABC, and offhandedly commented that the suspect probably acted under post-hypnotic suggestion. Two years later, when Brian appeared on another local radio program, Christian, that's John Christian, the author, one of the authors, Christian called in and asked him about his prescient analysis on the Bream show. At first, Brian hedged, then declared that he had no professional opinion because he had not personally examined Sir Han. He quickly switched the subject to the Hollywood Strangler case in which a Henry Bush was executed for murder. Quote, he utilized self-hypnosis, Brian asserted, noting that Bush once tried to burn off his own arm with cigarettes under self-hypnosis. Quote, to get rid of the offending part. Just like the old thing in the Bible, you know, if the left hand of Fendi cut it off. When we, meaning the authors again, asked Sir Han about the DeSalvo entry in his notebook, he replied that the name was entirely foreign to him. Was it possible that Brian had placed Sir Han in a trance state and, given his propensity to boast constantly about the Boston Strangler case, repeated DeSalvo's name over and over, thus etching it into Sir Han's subconscious? In any case, Sir Han would not remember either the circumstances of his exposure to the name or who mentioned it. Since Brian's ego seemed boundless, it was possible that an interview with him would produce the unexpected. It did. On June 18, 1974, Betsy Langman, a disarmingly attractive New York writer with whom we had been comparing notes, talked to Brian in his Sunset Strip office suite on the pretext of doing a general article on hypnosis. The doctor went on at length about his standing in the field of hypnosis, 
quote, I am probably the leading expert in the world, and abilities, quote, I can hypnotize everybody in his office in less than five minutes, detailed his successes with Henry Bush and Albert DeSalvo, and ventured opinions on various aspects of hypnosis. But when Langman, who had been researching the possibility of assassination through mind control, asked, quote, do you feel that Sirhan could have been self-hypnotized? His expansiveness vanished. I'm not going to comment on that case, Ryan said curtly, because I didn't hypnotize him. When Langman explained that she simply wanted his opinion, Ryan exploded, You are going around trying to find some more ammunition to put out that same old crap, he said, that people can be hypnotized into doing all these weird things. He charged out of his office, snapping, This interview is over. Another interesting thing is presented in the next section of the... Uh... Turner and Christian discussion of Brian, and we'll sum up some of the key points of this afterward. Shaken by the angry outburst, Langman went across the street for coffee, accompanied by a sympathetic secretary. Langman was... The assailant was Arthur Bremer. In the spring of 1977, Brian was found dead in a Las Vegas motel room from natural causes, unquote, the coroner said. Curiously, the word was issued before the official autopsy. Shortly thereafter, we were put in contact with two Beverly Hills call girls who claimed to have known Brian intimately. They had been servicing him on an average of twice a week for four years, they said, and usually were present at the same time. During the last year of his life, he was deeply depressed because his paramour had run off with another man. He became strung out on drugs, and his groin and thighs were pocked with bruises from hypodermic needles. No mention of these marks appeared on the coroner's report. The girl said that to relieve Brian's depression, they repeatedly titillated his enormous ego by getting him to, quote, talk about all the famous people you've hypnotized, unquote. As if by rote, Brian would begin, his, begin with his role of deprogramming Albert DeSalvo in the Boston Strangler case for F. Lee Bailey, then boast that he had hypnotized Saran Saran. The girls didn't sense anything unusual in the Saran angle, for Brian had told them many times that he, quote, worked with the LAPD on murder cases, and they didn't know that he had absolutely no contact with Saran following the assassination. One of the girls thought that Brian had mentioned James Earl Ray once, but wasn't sure. Remember James Earl Ray? We'll come back to that in a second. But both girls were certain of the name Saran Saran. The call girls also linked Brian to the CIA. At the outset of their relationship with him, he instructed them to call an unlisted phone number at his office. If someone else answered, they were to say they were with the company, unquote, an insider's term for the CIA, and they would be put through to him. According to the girls, Brian repeatedly confided that he was not only a CIA agent, but involved in, quote, top-secret projects, unquote. However, when he began bragging about such escapades as crawling over rooftops at night in Europe, they were a bit skeptical. We couldn't see Doc doing that kind of thing. Not all 300 pounds of him we couldn't, one of the girls said laughing. Upon Brian's death, his offices were sealed off to newsmen by his estate's probate lawyer, John Minor, who had also helped prosecute Saran as a deputy DA. There remains the question of Brian's claimed hypnotist-subject relationship with Saran and what role his connection with the CIA might have played in it. But there are a lot of things to, to pause and uh, ruminate over in this, this whole passage about William Joseph Bryan. Uh, first of all, note all the different uh, people connected with this country's assassinations or attempted assassinations who uh, he basically crosses paths with. We see that he, uh, according to his secretary, received a call from Laurel, Maryland, in connection with the Wallace shooting. Interesting in light of the fact that a person we talked about in the Guns of November, a guy named the Reverend Jerry Owen, who appears to have been involved with some kind of escape plan with Saran. Certainly he was an associate of Saran's and appears to have been in a position to drive a pickup truck and take someone, whether it's Saran or a double or somebody, away from the uh, Ambassador Hotel on the evening of the shooting. Now, his uh, one of his top religious fo followers, now recall, he also was a Bible-thumping fundamentalist, just like William Joseph Bryan. Uh, basically, his uh, one of his top, one of Jerry Owen's top religious followers was Arthur Bremer's sister. Now, recall also that William Joseph Bryan is also... A, uh, a member of the same old Roman Catholic Church as David Ferry from the Kennedy assassination. Also very, very interesting. Worth noting, too, that uh, John Minor, who sealed off uh, William Joseph Bryan's estate, turns out to be a deputy DA who prosecutes Saran. And keep in mind that the, the instructions given the call girls, that the fact that they were to uh, basically uh, call an unlisted number and uh, say they were with the company if they wanted to get through to... Uh, William Joseph Bryan, Jr., and there's an awful lot to uh, 
keep in mind here and uh, remember that uh, Brian himself said that he uh, apparently worked with the national security establishment. He talked about the fact that uh, during the uh, the Korean War, he supposedly helped uh, combat brainwashing. And it's also interesting that the DDD DeSalvo uh, automatic writing by uh, William Joseph Bryan uh, may may refer to Albert DeSalvo, the uh, Boston Strangler, who was, uh, to a certain extent, found out as a result of Bryan's work with hypnosis. All right, and you are listening to Radio Free America. This is the June 5th, 1985 Radio Free America. You were listening to a taped segment of the uh, November 29th, 1984 Radio Free America. And if you think you're confused, just imagine how we feel sitting around listening to ourselves when we're not actually talking. It gets pretty weird after a while. Anyway, but what you did hear was an extended segment from uh, one of our mind control broadcasts on Radio Free America. It was a three-part series. And, of course, specifically the information uh, about the possibility of Sirhan Sirhan being uh, in some way mind-controlled, which, of course, is a bit of a boggling term since it calls up connotations of uh, lost in space and Star Trek and things like this. But as Dave Emery mentioned before we went into that tape segment, uh, capacity for this kind of work has been in the U.S. government for quite some time. We, uh, in these, the three parts Radio Free America special, we concentrated on uh, uh, all the various programs that were instituted at the behest of the CIA and the Defense Department were paid for with government money in which people were brainwashed in a variety of ways, and we talked about evidence that people actually had been brainwashed into becoming uh, couriers and assassins and things like that. So, as mentioned, the possibility of Sirhan Sirhan being himself some kind of a hypno-programmed patsy um, is perhaps not quite so strange as it might seem to the uninitiated or the uninformed. All right, and remember, too, uh, all of the interesting connecting links that uh, William Joseph Bryan had his uh, work for the CIA on uh, the mind control programs, according to his own uh, test, his own statements, his uh, instructions to his call girls to uh, ask, say they were with the company when they contacted him. Also, uh, interesting the fact that uh, the lawyer who sealed his estate had helped prosecute Saran as an assistant district attorney. Worth noting also that uh, the uh, William Joseph Bryan Jr. received an emergency call from Laurel, Maryland, right after George Wallace was shot, and apparently it was in connection with the shooting of George Wallace. We're going to talk about another uh, possible link between, well, a definite link between the Robert Kennedy assassination and the shooting of George Wallace later in the program. But uh, remember William Joseph Bryant, also a fan named, a fellow named Manley Palmer Hall, a hypnotist who had contact with Saran and also Sam Yorty, who we're going to talk about. Anyway, the uh, indications that Saran was a mind-controlled patsy are there, and uh, that's the information available. Now, one of the reasons why the... Uh, the massive discrepancies in the official version of uh, the assassination of Robert Kennedy uh, have never received the distribution that uh, they should have, and in fact, why they were never really entered into the, the official version of the assassination concerns primarily the people who were in charge with investigating Robert Kennedy's assassination. Now, the investigative jurisdiction in this case belonged to the Los Angeles Police Department. What they did was to set up a special unit, which they called Special Unit Senator, or SUS, now, this organization was, as I said, the LAPD body in charge with investigating the assassination of Robert Kennedy. Now, the two guys who headed this up were a fellow named Lieutenant Manuel Pena, last name P-E-N-A, and Sergeant Enrique Hernandez, H-E-R-N-A-N-D-E-Z. Both of these men are worth noting here because they both had contacts with the CIA. Returning again to the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy by Christian and Turner. Okay, one last thing to mention about uh, about the Peña and the Hernandez thing in general is that uh, we're going to hear a little bit more about some of their connections in a moment, but mentioned here is going to be a name uh, that I believe is the first time that you're hearing this name tonight, and that is Jerry Owen. He might have been mentioned once earlier in the broadcast. We will be um, illuminating the subject of Jerry Owen further on the broadcast because he's a key player, and he is, in many ways, was the... Uh, the, the the prime factor that uh, got Christian and Turner onto the onto the trail of of this evidence in the first place um, because of a story that he told it to the police. So we will be talking more about Jerry Owen later. All you really need to know about him at this point is that he is a a key player apparently in the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. Okay, reading again from the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, uh, 1978 Random House hardcover by William Turner and John Christian. The choice of Lieutenant Manuel Pena or Manuel Peña, for the key slot in SUS, Special Unit Senator, was a curious one. Among members of the force and the Mexican-American community, Peña was a living legend. 
Reputedly, he had killed 11 suspects, quote, in the line of duty more than any other officer in the history of the department. In Special Unit Senator, Houghton described him as a, quote, stocky, intense, proud man of Mexican-American descent, unquote, with 22 years of experience under his belt at the time. Houghton boasted that Pena had commanded detective divisions, supervised a bank robbery squad, and, quote, spoke French and Spanish and had, had connections with various intelligence agencies in several countries, unquote. What we did not know at the time, the authors write, uh, was that what we did not know at the time that Pena and Hernandez in, interrogated Jerry Owen was that both had long-standing connections with the CIA. Our first clue about Pena came months later when a faded newspaper article came to our attention. On November 13, 1967, more than six months before the Robert F. Kennedy slaying, the San Fernando Valley Times had reported Pena's formal retirement from the LAPD. A surprise testimonial dinner was held in his honor at the Sportsman's Lodge, with LAPD Chief Thomas Redden prominent among the law enforcement fraternity in attendance. It was a, quote, rousing and emotion-packed affair, the article said, and then quoted Redden, I have known Manny for many years. I would not have missed being here for anything. The article revealed, quote, Pena retired from the police force to advance his career. He has accepted a position with the Agency for International Development Office of the State Department. As a public safety advisor, he will train and advise foreign police forces in investigative and administrative matters. After nine weeks of training and orientation, he will be assigned to his post, possibly a Latin American country, judging by the fact that he speaks Spanish fluently. It is an open secret the authors write, that the Office of Public Safety of the Agency for International Development, AID, has long served as a cover for the CIA's clandestine program of supplying advisors and instructors for national police and intelligence services in Southeast Asia and Latin America engaged in anti-communist operations. In 1968, California Chief Deputy Attorney General Charles A. O'Brien informed us that this ultra-secret CIA unit was known to insiders as, quote, the Department of Dirty Tricks and that one of its specialties was teaching foreign, quote, intelligence apparatus the techniques of assassination. FBI agent Roger Lajeunesse, whom Turner had known for years before, who Tur Turner, the author, had known years before in the Bureau. Uh, Turner, by the way, William Turner, the author, he was a former FBI agent himself, um, whom Turner had known years before in the Bureau, confided that Pena had left the LAPD. Now, this is six months before the Kennedy assassination, the Robert F. Kennedy assassination, had left the LAPD um, for a, quote, special training unit at a CIA base in Virginia. In fact, said Lajeunesse, Pena's departure in November 1967 had not been a one-shot deal. The detective had done CIA special assignments for a decade, mostly under AID cover. On some of these assignments in Central and South America, he worked with CIA operative Dan A. Mitrione, M-I-T-R-I-O-N-E, a former Indiana chief of police. Further confirmation of Pena's CIA role came from his brother, a high school teacher, who casually mentioned to television newsman Stan Borman how proud Manny was of his services for the CIA over the years. And before Dave continues, I'm just going to mention real quickly a little bit about uh, uh, good old Dan Mitrione. Now, I don't know how many of you out there have seen um, a movie called State of Siege by uh, Costa Gavras. Um, this, uh, in fact, the same fellow who just did uh, Missing, which was a big hit a couple of years ago. Right, about uh, Chile, although they never named Chile. Similar kind of movie, too. Right. State of Siege, of course, was about uh, the events that took place in Uruguay, and um, specifically Dan Mitrione. Um, Dan Mitrione, as you will find, if you would like to find a good book, there's a book by the name of Hidden Terrors by former New York Times writer A.J. Langeth, L-A-N-G-G-U-T-H, that details the entire Mitrione case. But uh, Dan Mitrione was a former Indiana chief of police who went to work for the CIA, um, was involved in several foreign countries, including Brazil and Uruguay, where he eventually died, um, with, uh, as they mentioned, with this, uh, quote, Department of Dirty Tricks, teaching uh, local police forces, uh, governments friendly to the United States, how to, quote, fight terrorism, in, in most cases, how to torture and assassinate, in fact. And among other things that happened, they were bringing in torture equipment in the diplomatic pouch to Dan Mitrione through the, uh, through the embassies. They were bringing in huge needles and uh, equipment for uh, electroshock torture and things like that. 
So uh, Mitrione himself was eventually kidnapped and apparently killed by Tupamaros guerrillas in Uruguay. But before uh, that happened, he had a reputation all over South America for uh, for brutality and for being one of the United States uh, uh, chief torture masters in South America. So that's the Dan Mitrione that Manuel Manuel Pena uh, went down to South America and worked with at one time before his eventual uh, return to the L.A. Police Department. And uh, remember now, too, that Dan Mitrioni was a boyhood friend of uh, Jim Jones, as we looked at in our program about the assassination of Martin Luther King, in which we talked about the connections between the Martin Luther King assassination and Jonestown. Also worth noting that Jim Jones was in Belo Horizonte, Brazil, at the same time when Dan Mitrioni was down there teaching torture and uh, some of his other niceties. And uh, the, there is a question, recall, in the talk, the, the interview that uh, I had with John Judge, John, who's an expert on Jonestown, uh, stated that uh, Dan Mitrioni was chief of police in the area where Jim Jones sort of got his little uh, uh, revival show going, and that the kind of uh, fraud that Jim Jones used usually requires the uh, uh, active collaboration of the chief of police because people catch on and complain, and usually it's a, the chief of police has to be in league with someone like this if they're going to pull it off successfully. So uh, many questions and important questions about uh, the full extent of the relationship between Jim Jones and Dan Mitrioni. Recall that uh, Jim Jones's father was a Klan leader in uh, Indiana. Returning again to the accounts here, oh, we'll also remember now that uh, Manny Pena, in November of 67, leaves for a special training assignment. This was uh, eight months before the assassination of Robert Kennedy. Continuing now with Christian and Turner's narrative. Reporter Fernando Fora, F-A-U-R-A, whose byline appeared in the newspaper story of the farewell banquet, recounted that in April of 1968, only five months after Pena's departure, he was sauntering along a corridor in Parker Center when he spotted a vaguely familiar figure. The square face and fireplug frame seemed to belong to Manny Pena, but now he sported an expensive dark blue suit, a black handlebar mustache, and heavy horn-rimmed glasses. Manny, for a probe? The figure stopped and looked sheepish as the reporter approached with hand extended. Hey, Manny, I damn near didn't recognize you with that disguise. The detective was not amused. Fora asked what he was doing back in Los Angeles. Pena explained that the AID job wasn't quite what he had expected, so he quit and resumed his duties with the LAPD. And I'll tell you, listen to KFJC Los Santos Hills. Pena's stints with the CIA were hardly unique. For example, Hugh C. McDonald, who was chief of detectives for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department before retiring in 1967, recently revealed in a book that for many years he had gone on detached duty with the CIA as a contract agent, primarily in operations in conjunction with white Russian emigre elements in Europe. Pausing here, by the way. A contract agent simply means that uh, this is an agent who has been hired to do a particular job as opposed to a career employee of the CIA. It does not refer to a uh, contract as in putting out a contract on somebody mob parlance for an execution, okay? It's a uh, point that often gets confused in people's minds. Also note that uh, Hugh C. McDonald wrote a book about uh, the JFK assassination called Appointment in Dallas, which is essentially fertilizer. You know, it's it's more lone nut stuff with the uh, leftist uh, intimations. Worth noting that he worked not only for CIA, but with white Russian emigre elements in Europe, and the white Russian element in the Galen Nazi intelligence apparatus in this country, as well as their, the role of both the white Russians and the Galen group in the John Kennedy assassination we've talked about in the past. Continuing here with uh, Turner and Christian's account. And according to Morton Kondracki of the Chicago Sun-Times, quote, a high-ranking former official of the spy agency said in an interview that he remembered some Chicago policemen attending training sessions at the CIA's super-secret facility at Camp Perry near Williamsburg, Virginia, either in late 1967 or early 1968. Recall that in the summer of 1968, interrupting here, uh, Chicago police were very much involved in uh, a, a series of so-called police riots at the Democratic Convention in 1968. Uh, Again, food for thought and, uh, quote, grounds for further research were any of those policemen instigating that riot, which essentially trashed what little chance the Democrats had of winning the election. Were there any connections between that group and some of these CIA-trained Chicago cops? Again, food for thought, ground for further research. Continuing, the agency itself conceded that briefings, unquote, were given to less than 50 policemen from about a dozen departments, unquote, unquote. And we learn much later that Pena's SUS sidekick, Sergeant Hank Hernandez, who was promoted to lieutenant in recognition of his status in the special unit, also had CIA connections. Now retired from the force, he boasts in a resume offering his services as a private investigator that in 1963, he played a key role in unified police command training for the CIA in Latin America. 
He functioned under the usual cover of AID's Office of Public Safety and even received a medal from the Venezuelan government then concerned with Fidel Castro's exportation of the Cuban Revolution. In retrospect, it seems odd that two policemen who doubled as CIA agents occupied key positions in SUS where they were able to seal off avenues that led in the direction of conspiracy and uh, adding to this by in, in considering the CIA's role in the assassination of Robert Kennedy, remember uh, that in considering not only Pena and Hernandez here, recall the CIA connections to William Joseph Bryan, his possible role as Saran's programmer. Recall also that Thane Eugene Caesar, according to an engineer who worked with him, uh, worked in a, an area of, of the Lockheed Burbank plant associated with the CIA's U-2 program. So CIA connections cropping up in a number of different contexts here. Okay, the, the aforementioned Jerry Owen we're now going to get into a little bit and uh, begin to look at the interesting role that he plays in the Robert F. Kennedy assassination. Um, what we're going to skip over here is a long segment of the book uh, that discusses Owen's background, but basically uh, Owen was, among other things, sort of an itinerant evangelist preacher who had been... Uh, Oh, involved with all kinds of strange things. He had been, uh, a warrant had been issued for his arrest, and he had been actually convicted of arson conspiracy and the burning down of a church for insurance purposes. Um, he had been involved in uh, other kinds of strange things like that. He had had uh, allegations of fraud, and in many cases actually been taken to court for that and things like that. So this is a, uh, a cat with sort of a strange background. In particular, a lot of morals charges. Apparently, uh, now, Jerry Owen was a religious evangelist, billed as the walking Bible. He apparently knew the whole Bible, according to his, his billing, by memory and could recite long passages of it from memory. Uh, he was a, a Bible-thumping religious evangelist who uh, had a... a um, a penchant for morals uh, busts, I guess you could say. He was always turning up uh, in motel rooms, uh, confessing uh, underage uh, girls who uh, frequently wound up being pregnant after having been confessed. And uh, so the point is that, that Jerry Owens had a very shady uh, record, and uh, well, that shady record didn't stop him from moving in some very, very interesting circles. Okay, reading from the assassination, Robert F. Kennedy. By 1968, Owen was living in Santa Ana, 30 miles south of Los Angeles in Orange County. He styled himself, quote, the Shepherd of the Hills, and circulated around shopping centers giving free pony rides to children who promised to memorize a Bible verse and attend church on Sunday. He traded horses on the side, and he owned a piece of a club fighter named Irish Rip O'Reilly. It was the horses and the boxing game, Owen testified in the KCOP trial, which we'll be looking at in depth later, that brought about his chance association with Sir Han Sir Han. On the afternoon of June 3rd, 1968, the eve of the California primary election, he, Jerry Owen, said that he was driving his pickup truck through downtown Los Angeles on his way to purchase some boxing gear for O'Reilly. At a red light, he let two hitchhikers climb into the back of the truck. After a dozen or so blocks, they got off at another red light and appeared to converse with a man and woman standing on the corner. As Owen got ready to pull away, one of the hitchhikers got in the cab with him and struck up a conversation. Owen described him as a diminutive young man of foreign extraction who remarked that he worked as an exercise boy at a racetrack. When Owen mentioned that he traded horses as a sideline to his ministry, the young man said that he was in the market for a lead pony used to walk horses around the track before and after races. After some haggling, he agreed to buy a Palomino from Owen for $300. Mind you, this whole section here is, is Jerry Owen's account of his first meeting with Sirhan Sirhan. Um, what some other suggestions of how it all worked out, we'll, we'll find out in a little bit. Well, what Jerry Owen claims was his first meeting with Sirhan. Yeah. Very important distinction. Because exactly. Uh, according to Owen, he simply picked, picked Haran, Sirhan up hitchhiking on June 3rd, never seen the guy before. Remember that. Right. The young man asked Owen to stop for a few minutes at the rear entrance to the Ambassador Hotel so that he could run in and, quote, see a friend in the kitchen. Owen obliged. When he returned, the young man told Owen that he would meet him that night with the money for the horse. But at the appointed time and place, the young man, accompanied by the same two men and the woman he had been seen with that afternoon, said he hadn't been able to raise all of the money. He produced a single $100 bill. The upshot of this intricate story was that Owen was asked to deliver the horse to the same rear entrance of the hotel the following night at 11, at which time the full amount would be paid. But Owen couldn't make it because he was due to preach a sermon in Oxnard, 70 miles northwest of Los Angeles. When Owen returned to Los Angeles on the morning after the election, he recognized Sirhan's picture on television as the hitchhiker who was going to buy his horse. 
At the urge of some friends, he went straight to the police and told his story, quote, like a good citizen. He felt that he nearly had been duped into becoming part of a bizarre getaway scheme after Kennedy was shot at the Ambassador Hotel the previous night. Okay, so before we go on with this any further, let me just mention that so Jerry Owen is, is uh, originally, initially, was stipulating that he had never seen Sirhan Sirhan before, that he had picked him up hitchhiking, that they had gotten into a conversation about horses, and that Sirhan had asked him to come and bring the horse to the back of the Ambassador Hotel on the night that turned out to be the night of the assassination, where he would be paid $300. The idea being here on presumably that Jerry Owen is insinuating was that Sirhan Sirhan was somehow going to leap into this horse trailer and therefore being, of course, totally inconspicuous, uh, driving in a horse trailer in the parking lot of the Ambassador Hotel, thereby escape after assassinating Robert Kennedy. Anyway, this was Jerry Owen's uh, preliminary uh, a stipulation as to what, uh, what his contact with Sirhan Sirhan was. Now, we're going to uh, present some information here which is going to uh, call... Uh, Jerry Owen's account very seriously into question, and it's important to pay attention to the nature of the Owen and Saron relationship, not to sound patronizing, but Jerry Owen, perhaps more than any other single individual uh, available in the literature or accessible in the literature, uh, sort of delineates the, the political milieu behind the assassination of Robert Kennedy better than anybody, I, at least I can think of offhand from the information I've read. Jerry Owen essentially had more connections than a switchboard, and those connections are very, very important in illustrating, uh, as I say, the, the political milieu underlying Robert Kennedy's assassination. And again, Jerry Owen claims he just picked up Saran hitchhiking on June 3rd, had never seen him before. As to whether or not that uh, statement holds water, well, evaluate it in light of the following information. Returning to Christian and Turner's account, uh, the man Weatherly here is a horse trader associated with, among others, Owen and Saran, and a fellow named Bill Powers. Now, Bill Powers, again, is another horse breeder and uh, a cowboy who uh, is involved here with Owen and Saran. And according to Bill Powers now, Jerry Owen not only knew Saran before, but uh, the previously impoverished or uh, uh, penny-pinching minister who had barely been able to make ends meet showed up flashing a roll of, of uh, large bills, okay, large denomination bills. With Sirhan Sirhan in the back seat of his uh, car, as I recall. The day, th this uh, weeks before, they, or several days before the assassination. All right, now, again, uh, Owen claims he'd never met Sirhan before. That appears uh, to be a doubtful claim in light of the following information. Powers corrected Weatherly's impression that Owen and Sirhan had borrowed his late model Chevrolet truck on election day to drive into Los Angeles. When he bought this vehicle, he sold Owen his old 1951 Chevrolet pickup that Owen had previously borrowed to haul hay. So then a few weeks before the assassination, he came down and bought the truck, Powers explained. The price was either $300 or $350, and Owen made a $50 down payment. Powers, was hu Powers hung on to the pink slip, proving ownership until the balance would be paid. It never was. On or about Monday, June 3rd, now recall this is t uh, two days before Robert Kennedy dies. This is the day that uh, Owen claims he picked up Saran hitchhiking. It never was. On or about Monday, June 3rd, Powers related, Owens drove into Wild Bill Stables at the wheel of a late model Lincoln Continental four-door sedan. This is a fellow who used to have to borrow money to buy hay for his horses. Again, repeating this. On or about Monday, June 3rd, Powers related, Owen drove into Wild Bill Stables at the wheel of a late-model Lincoln Continental four-door sedan. When Powers brought, brought up the money due, the preacher nodded and said he had to go to the bank. Upon returning, he fished in his pocket and pulled out a roll of $1,000 bills. I don't know how many of them there was, the cowboy marveled, but there was a big handful of them. I'll pay you for that truck, Owen said, peeling off a $1,000 bill. Jerry, I don't have no change for that, Powers replied. Well, I'll have to go to the bank and get one cashed and bring you back the money for the truck. Again, a man with a roll of $1,000 bills previously had to borrow money to buy hay for his horses in a new late model Lincoln Continental sedan. Returning to uh, Turner and Christian's account, Owen drove off in his luxury car but didn't return. The assassination was the next day, I guess, Powers said. I never did figure him, he continued. He often had to borrow a bundle of hay. I don't know where he got his money, but it sure wasn't in the horse business. Could Owen have flashed a Montana bankroll, Christian asked, referring to a roll of $100 bills covered with a $1,000 note that con men used to impress their victims? No, 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 Powers insisted. He knew a Montana bankroll when he saw one. Oh, no, I'd say there was probably 25, maybe 30 of them at least. They filled one pocket, and there were money orders, traveler's checks, something like that in the other pocket. He showed me that roll of bills a couple of times. He showed them to all of us there. The sight of Owen in his flashy new car had attracted several of the stable hands. 
Johnny Beckley was one of them. If Powers was correct, the walking Bible was walking around with a cool twenty-five to $30,000 in cash. But if he had any fear of being mugged, he wasn't relying on the Lord for his only protection. With him that afternoon were two other men, one a bulky and powerful-looking black man, and the other young, small, and, quote, Mexican-looking, unquote. How did Owen introduce him? Christian asked. Can't remember what his name was, Powers, Powers replied. He had a friend or a partner or an associate. I shook hands with uh, him and the nigger both. Was Saron with him when he had the roll of $1,000 bills? Ah, uh, yeah, Powers was slightly hesitant, perhaps feeling himself slipping into deep waters. He backed off a bit by saying there was two guys with him. Did the kid get out of the pickup and walk around? It was a rigged question, but the cowboy wasn't trapped. No, he was in the car, he corrected. He just raised forward there, and I shook hands with him. Continuing, shortly after the assassination, Bill Powers told Christian, again, that's John Christian, the, one of the authors, he returned from a brief trip trying to round up wild Mustangs to be broken and trained when his stable hands told him, the FBI's been looking for you. Two men identifying themselves as bureau agents had come by in an unmarked beige Chevrolet. Concerned, Powers dialed the FBI resident agency in Riverside, but was informed that there was no record there or in Los Angeles that he was being sought. A day or so later, two plain clothesmen showed up, but they said they were from the LAPD. It was a routine interview, apparently prompted by the fact that Powers was still listed as the legal owner of the pickup truck Owen had driven. The policeman mentioned that the truck had been dusted for fingerprints and that Sir Hans had in fact been found on the glove compartment and rear window. Then, about a week later, the first pair of detectives reappeared, driving the same Chevrolet. They announced themselves as FBI and flashed credentials. They told Powers that the old pickup truck had been recovered in Barstow, had been recovered abandoned in Barstow, some 130 miles northeast of Los Angeles on the route to Las Vegas and had been brought back to the FBI crime lab in Los Angeles for fingerprint testing. In a menacing manner, they demanded to know what Powers knew about Owen and Sirhan and the RFK case. Quote, They tried to scare me, Powers recounted. They tried to give me a bunch of bullshit at first. They wanted to make sure I knew who they were and that they weren't fooling around. All I told them is what they asked me. I didn't make no statements, no nothing. Powers said that the putative FBI man handed him a card, quote, and told me that if anybody tried to arrest me or pick me up to phone, to phone them. Okay, let me read that sentence again. Uh, Powers said that the putative FBI man handed him a card, quote, and told me that if anybody tried to arrest me or pick me up, to phone them before I went with them. But I wasn't to get in no cars or anything like that. They told me it was for my own protection. They might bump me off. The cowboy was specifically instructed not even to speak to other law enforcement officers. Turning nastier, the pair intimated that they had been watching Powers, knew of his dalliance with a girl of, quote, jailbait age, and might have to bust him if he didn't cooperate. The, quote, FBI agents, unquote, returned three times in the next few months. They asked me something, and I'd tell him if I wanted to. And if I didn't, I didn't say nothing. I figured it was none of their business if that was Sir Han with Owen in the car, Powers declared. I mean, I don't care who it was, you know. There's no use getting involved. Why should I care who it was, you know? Um, the only thing, why should I get involved? The only thing it might do is get me killed or something. I'll tell you the truth. I'm kind of scared. Basically, so uh, according to Bill Powers, not only did Sir Han and Owen know each other before, but that uh, two days before the assassination, the previously... Uh, impoverished or practically impoverished Owen showed up with a roll of thousand dollar bills a brand new Lincoln Continental and a lot of other money and uh, Saron was in the car with him which uh, certainly puts gives the lie to uh, Jerry Owens uh, accounting of having just picked Saron up hitchhiking and uh, we're going to look at uh, how Powers testimony was handled in the KCOP versus Jerry Owen case here in a little while now uh, Another very important uh, accounting of the event, uh, a different accounting of Jerry Owen's contact with Saran, comes from a fellow named the Reverend Jonathan Perkins, who's a again an, an ultra right wing evangelist from uh, Southern California, who's part of a uh, paramilitary evangelical milieu down there. Which again, we're going to go back to in our broadcast next month about the Aryan Nations neo Nazi group. Again, about Reverend Jonathan Perkins, Marshall uh, Turner, and Christian Wright as follows. 
The Reverend Jonathan Perkins, the elderly minister who Owen said accompanied him for the interview at SUS headquarters, did not appear at first glance to be a promising witness. He was a longtime friend of Owen and for over 20 years had been personal secretary to the late Gerald L. K. Smith, the virulent anti-Semite who founded the Christian Nationalist Crusade. Perkins conducted his own ministry at the Embassy Auditorium in downtown Los Angeles, a favorite meeting place for right-wing fundamentalists. The Christian Nationalist Crusade held meetings there, as did the racist Church, as did the racist Church of Jesus Christ Christian, and occasionally Jerry Owens staged revival meetings there. In, a, in a, uh, an asterisk to the Church of Jesus Christ Christian, we have the following uh, note: The Church of Jesus Christ Christian figured prominently in the previously mentioned in previously mentioned investigation by the California Attorney General's Office into right-wing paramilitary groups. It was led by the Reverend Wesley A. Swift of Lancaster on the fringe of the Mojave Desert. According to the Attorney General's 1965 report, Swift was, quote, a former Ku Klux Klan rifle team instructor and legal representative of Gerald L. K. Smith. It said that he, quote, has purchased over a hundred concealable firearms in the past few years. Moreover, he maintains a firing range on his Kern County ranch as well as a reported secret arsenal, unquote. The church had a paramilitary arm called the Christian Defense League. In 1976, after Swift's death, a huge buried arsenal including ground-to-air missiles was discovered on lands that had belonged to Swift, touching off an an investigation leading to the arrest and conviction of an East Los Angeles man linked to extremist causes. Again, remember the Christian Defense League and the Church of Jesus Christ Christian, Gerald L. K. Smith, and uh, and Wesley Swift, because we're coming back to those in our discussion of uh, the Aryan Nations again next week. Now, as far as uh, Jonathan Perkins' accounting of uh, Owen's meeting with Saran, it's as follows. As it turned out, however, the white-maned Perkins was a gold mine of information. He related that on the morning of June 5th, Owen telephoned him and asked if he could come right over to his apartment in the hotel adjacent to the embassy auditorium. When he arrived a few minutes later, Owen was visibly shaken. I'm about to get mixed up in that thing, Owen said in reference to the RFK shooting, and I don't want to get mixed up in in another scandal like that, unquote. It was the second visit from Owen in two days. Perkins revealed that on election day, June 4th, Owen had dropped by and mentioned that a former exercise boy at a racetrack was going to buy one of his horses. Owen said that he met the young man hitchhiking the day before, and he thought that a price of $400 had been reached. The only reason that Owen was hanging around Los Angeles was to complete the sale. He had the horse trailer with him and was to meet the young man and some friends of his that that same night. You mean he was supposed to meet Saran... At the ambassador the night of the election, Christian asked. Oh, yes, the night Kennedy was shot, Perkins confirmed. He was out there with his horse and trailer? Well, he was here in town. He came up here. I knew about that. I wasn't with him. I talked with him the next day or so. Christian reiterated his question about whether Owen was actually at the ambassador hotel on election night. As Perkins recalled it, Owen said that on election night he, quote, went down there to meet him and to pick up this other $300. That was the night of the assassination. He waited around there, and when Saran didn't show up, he went to a hotel here. Thought he'd stay all night, and Saran would very likely show up in the morning because he was very much interested in the horse. If I remember correctly, he went to some little motel in Hollywood so he wouldn't have to drive back and haul his horse trailer to Santa Ana. Continuing... Perkins said that when Owen came by about 10 in the morning on June 5th, he seemed genuinely frightened at the asserted chance encounter with Sir Han. Quote, listen, he told Perkins, that's the fellow that was going to buy my horse. I brought the horse in here to deliver it. The other man didn't show up and so forth. I waited for him. Man alive, they was just going to use me as a getaway, as a scapegoat. They could have gone four or five miles and shot me in a vacant lot. What Perkins had to say seemed enormously important, for here for the first time was a witness to whom Owen had related the hitchhiker story before the shooting. It was a significantly different diversion from what he had told Turner about going to Oxnard on Election Day. Owen gave Perkins the impression that he was in Los Angeles with a horse and trailer from at least late Monday through Tuesday, and that he had been waiting outside the Ambassador Hotel for Sirhan when the shooting happened. All right, so apparently... Uh, according, again, to this Reverend Jonathan Perkins, and remember that he uh, moves in a right-wing evangelical paramilitary milieu, which we're going to touch on next week, and which includes Jerry Owen. Remember about the Christian Defense League? It's head to a fellow named Gail we're going to talk about in our next Radio Free America broadcast. Now, one of the fellows that, uh, again, moves in this Southern California paramilitary milieu 
One of the fellows who moved was a guy named Edgar Eugene Bradley. Now, he was also associated with Gale, the Christian Defense League, and so forth, as we'll talk about in our next program. But Edgar Eugene Bradley is a name which crops up in connection with the assassination of John Kennedy. Recall now from our Guns of November broadcast, or uh, perhaps your own knowledge, that uh, New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison attempted to have, unsuccessfully, to have three people extradited to testify in his investigation of the assassination of Kennedy. One of those was Edgar Eugene Bradley, who uh, was identified by Dallas policeman Roger Craig as having basically flashed phony Secret Service credentials to have an Oswald or Oswald double released from police custody shortly after the assassination of JFK. Now, Edgar Eugene Bradley was a member of a right-wing church called the American Council of Christian Churches, headed up by Reverend Carl McIntyre, an ultra-right-wing group, and... Uh, then Governor of California, Ronald Reagan, turned down the extradition request without comment, waiting till after Richard Nixon was elected president. Uh, now Attorney General, then legal counselor to then Governor Reagan, Ed Meese, handled the cover-up, or handled the uh, uh, day-to-day... Hey, basically, he, he was in charge of the handling of the Edgar Eugene Bradley case. Now, uh, the Deputy State Attorney General, Charles O'Brien, who reviewed this case uh, we've heard references to before, and we're going to come back to him later in the broadcast. Edgar Eugene Bradley also was an associate of Jerry Owens. Returning to Turner and Christian's account, after Davis, uh, George T. Davis, by the way, a Northern California investigator, after Davis left the room to make some phone calls, Owen raised the question of John Kennedy's assassination. Obviously, Davis had briefed him on Turner's participation in the Jim Garrison investigation. As Turner spread a number of photographs from his attache case on the table, Owen looked them over. His finger came to rest on one of Edgar Eugene Bradley of North Hollywood, who six months before had been indicted by a New Orleans grand jury for conspiracy in the JFK assassination. The charges were later dismissed. Bradley was the West Coast representative of Dr. Carl McIntyre, the fundamentalist minister who founded the American Council of Christian Churches in opposition to the modernist, unquote, National Council of Churches. Do you know Bradley? Turner asked. Yes, said Owen. He explained that he had casually met him a couple of times in Los Angeles, the last in 1964. I was affiliated with McIntyre's church in the late 50s, Owen said, but got out because those people were too radical for me. That, uh, essentially, Jerry Owen hooks up with Edgar Eugene Bradley, again, one of the key figures in Garrison's investigation, and whose extradition was blocked by then-governor of California, Ronald Reagan. Okay. Uh, Turner and Christian go on to detail um, the the story, uh, Jerry Owen's version of his story, most of which we've related to you earlier, uh, just explaining how he left uh, Santa Ana in his old Chevy pickup, supposedly stopped at this red light, uh, was convinced to give a ride to uh, Sirhan Sirhan and another young man, um, and that various things of this sort that were going on and things like that. Anyway... Um, so at this point uh, in the in what's going on, Christian and Turner, our authors, are not necessarily c- convinced that Jerry Owen himself is uh, telling a lie, but they basically are beginning to wonder about some of the inconsistencies in Jerry Owen's story that had developed um, and why Jerry Owen came forward with this story in the first place, why he, that uh, people involved with Jerry Owen were getting this strange treatment from Special Unit Senator and possibly the FBI. Okay. On a hunch, Christian called Owen's younger brother, Richard Owen, an instructor at Los Angeles Trade Tech College. Uh, he didn't know Gray, but he was familiar. Gray is uh, uh, Johnny Gray, I believe his name is, right? Who was uh... Johnny Gray? That, uh, as mentioned, uh, Jerry Owen was involved with, among other things, prize fighting. Johnny Gray was one of the fellows associated both with his horse trading and, to a certain extent, uh, with uh, training some of Owen's fighters. Owen himself, a former prize fighter. Uh, the key name here now in, 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 in uh, Owen's fight game is a guy named Irish Rip O'Reilly, who Owen owned part of and who uh, apparently he co-managed with a guy named Edward Glenn, and uh, that's the key name here. So Irish Rip O'Reilly is a fighter owned in part by Owen, co-managed with a guy named Edward Glenn by oh. Owen. And Johnny Gray was the black man mentioned earlier by the, by Bill Powers, the cowboy, as having been in the car with Sir Han when Owen came and flashed the roll of money. Okay. Uh, he, Jerry Owen's younger brother, didn't know Gray, but he was familiar with a man named Edward E. Glenn, who had claimed he was O'Reilly's co-manager with his brother, Jerry Owen, and footed the bills for the fighters' stay at the Coliseum Hotel. Perhaps Glenn would know where Gray was. Glenn was president of the Midland Oil Company of Wyoming, which purportedly was exploring for oil in that state. Glenn had sold stock in the company to Richard Owen and several other instructors. 
When he became uneasy about his investment, Owen said, Glenn assigned him, quote, stock in O'Reilly as a good faith gesture. Glenn left Los Angeles immediately after the assassination, and Richard Owen had not heard from him since. A check was done in Bradstreet, disclosed that Midland Oil had been headquartered in Littleton, Colorado in 1968, but had disappeared, abandoning a single wildcat well in Lusk, Wyoming. The dry hole venture was under investigation by the Attorney General of Wyoming for possible violation of state securities laws regarding the sale of unregistered stock and fraud. Since Glenn appeared to have been a fast buck operator in several states, we threw his name at FBI agent Roger Lajeunesse. Quote, how did you get on to him? Lajeunesse asked with an astonished look on his face. Yes, he said, the mysterious Mr. Glenn had come to the attention of the Bureau. Glenn moved in circles known to have right-wing views and underworld ties. His headquarters had been in Littleton, all right, but he frequently ranged to Los Angeles, San Diego, Phoenix, Albuquerque, Dallas, Miami, New Orleans, and Chicago, as well as Central and South America. His line, quote, oil equipment salesman. You guys know Jim Braden, Lajuness asked, knowing the answer full well. He and Glenn pal around together on occasion, from Miami to San Diego, with stops in between like Dallas and New Orleans. Jim Braden had been detained by Dallas Sheriff's deputies minutes after the assassination of John Kennedy after being found on the third floor of the Daltex building on Dealey Plaza, across the street from the building from which Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly fired at the president. Braden told the deputies that he was, quote, an independent oil dealer from Los Angeles and that he had walked in off the street to try to find a telephone. He was released. However, Turner had suspected that there was more to Jim Braden than met the eye, so in 1967, while visiting Los Angeles, he tried in vain to find him at the two addresses given on the Dallas Sheriff's Report. However, the report had Braden's California driver's license number scrawled on it, which led Turner to a posh Beverly Hills office building whose directory listed Braden under the Empire Oil Company. But the receptionist said that Braden traveled most of the time and only stopped by to pick up his mail. Turner handed over his findings to Peter Noyes, N-O-Y-E-S, the CBS producer who had excellent sources in the Los Angeles area. Noyes obtained a three-page rap sheet under FBI number 799431, showing that Jim Braden was one of several aliases for Eugene Hale Braden, B-R-A-D-I-N-G. LAPD intelligence files revealed that Braden had hung around with mafia heavies, among them Jimmy the Weasel Fratiano, described as the executioner for the mafia on the West Coast, and the Smaldoni brothers of Denver. In 1956, the LAPD tied Braiding in with two California syndicate men operating the Sunbeam Oil Company in Miami, characterizing Sunbeam as, quote, a pure front for con man schemes. Noyes also found out that Braiding's Empire Oil Company also had an office in New, or- also had an office in New Orleans and that Braiding was in Dallas on the day of the JFK shooting with the permission of his parole officer, who reported that Braiding, quote, Plan to see Lamar Hunt and other speculators while there, unquote. On the day before the assassination, Braiding did see Lamar Hunt and his brother Nelson Bunker Hunt, executives of the Hunt Oil Company. The patriarch of the family, H.L. Hunt, was noted for his ultra-right-wing activism. I would uh, add that so were Lamar and Nelson Bunker Hunt. The patriarch of the family, H.L. Hunt, was noted for his ultra-right-wing activism, and Nelson Bunker Hunt helped pay for the full-page ad in the Dallas Morning News of November 22, 1963, that showed a picture of John Kennedy with the legend, Wanted for Treason. From what Noyes was able to learn from his law enforcement sources, Braiding was a syndicate courier transporting large amounts of cash around the United States and to Europe. His home base was the the luxurious La Costa Country Club north of San Diego, built with Teamsters loans and run by the Las Vegas syndicate of Moe Dallas. Following the Robert Kennedy assassination, Noyes tipped off Robert Houghton about Braiding's, Braiding's curious background, and Houghton dispatched Chick Gutierrez to La Costa to question him. Braiding admitted that he had been in Los Angeles the night RFK was shot, but claimed he was at the Century Plaza Hotel a half-hour drive from the ambassador. Special Unit Senator was apparently satisfied with the alibi, for Houghton chalked up the matter to historical coincidence, unquote. In Special Unit Senator, his book, the chief alluded to Braiding by saying, quote, in addition to his mafia and oil contacts, he was friendly with far-right industrialists and political leaders of that area meaning the Texas area. Well, the number of interesting things about Eugene Hale Braiding, not only the fact that he was very close to this fellow Edward Glenn. Now, recall that Edward Glenn co-manages this fighter O'Reilly with Jerry Owen. 
Glenn, in turn, pals around with Braiding, alias Braden. Okay? Now, Braden is stopped in Dealey Plaza on the day of the John Kennedy assassination, admits that he's also in L.A. Uh, when, during the uh, Robert Kennedy assassination, and uh, his contacts include not only numerous organized crime figures, but also the Hunt brothers, ultra-right wingers who uh, figured in the assassination of John Kennedy. Yeah, there are numerous connections between the Hunts and Jack Ruby, among others, and uh, the... Uh, we really haven't got the space here to go into the Hunt's role in the JFK assassination, but it was prominent and it's well documented. We'll uh, in our in our next couple of Radio Free America broadcasts go into the Hunt's in connection with the John Birch Society. With a couple of other interesting details here now, uh, this fellow Braden is uh, well. Ed, recall now Edgar Eugene Bradley, the fellow who Garrison tried to have extradited, who knew uh, Jerry Owen, and who was not extradited by Ronald Reagan. Uh, Roger Craig, the Dallas policeman who identified Edgar Eugene Bradley in another uh, sort of photo identification session, uh, was shown a picture of Braden, who was a very has a very close resemblance to Edgar Eugene Bradley, and he the second time identified the person who had uh, stopped this person coming out of the uh, Texas School Book Depository and with phony uh, Secret Service credentials as Braden. Now the two of them are not only Bradley and Braden, that is, or Brading are not only virtual doubles, but lived in uh, almost the same section of Los Angeles. So uh, there's an interesting set of coincidences here that uh, both men apparently were uh, in Dallas, Texas. Both men were very, very similar in appearance and lived very close to each other in Los Angeles. And uh, again, both move in the same circles as the Reverend Jerry Owen. And have very similar names, Edgar Eugene Bradley, Eugene Hall Brading. Um, okay, going on, now we're going to talk about another character, a, a much more well-known character to the average uh, Californian, especially if you're above a certain age. Oh, yes. Just one, one detail. People would like to check out uh, the, the Braden-Bradley uh, connection. Uh, check out the book by Robert Noyes, uh, Legacy of Doubt, uh, by the fellow uh, mentioned here. Okay. Um, again, a, a character well-known to Californians of a certain age, a man by the name of Sam Yorty, who used to be the mayor of Los Angeles. Um, and uh, for quite some time, and as was mentioned earlier in the book, he uh, uh, earlier in the broadcast, he does crop up in this assassination investigation a number of times. And as we're going to talk about later, he was prominent uh, in the movement to to uh, paint uh, Sirhan Sirhan as a communist, and then later as some kind of an occult, uh, you know, black magic uh, lunatic type. And we'll talk about that a little later. But one of the interesting things is that uh, at the time that the Jerry Owen bit of the story, that all of a sudden somebody had who even um, although the, the truth behind Owen's actions had not come out yet, but even when Owen was the was at least important because he was the only uh, person who uh, admitted to having seen Sirhan Sirhan, you know, uh, before and talking about the assassination site and the whole thing. Anyway, Sam Yorty basically sort of glossed over the whole thing. Special Unit Senator, uh, the, we, their reaction we talked about. Anyway, but it turns out that uh, Sam Yorty happened to be friends with Jerry Owen, as we're going to find out here in a moment. Um, Anyway, John Christian, one of the authors of the book, was sitting around several months after their uh, assassination investigation had begun, uh, just watching television. Suddenly, on Channel 13, the authors write, a station break faded, and Mayor Yorty came on. Quote, how do you do, ladies and gentlemen, he began. It's a great privilege to present to you my friend, evangelist Jerry Owen, the walking Bible. Glad to see you, Jerry. Christian watched stupefied as Owen strode into camera range and slipped a thick arm around Yorty's shoulder. Thank you, Mayor Yorty, and I'm glad to have you here, Owen beamed. Mayor, I know of several thousands of God-fearing people that prayed you would be elected, and I believe God answers prayer, don't you, Mayor? Yorty grinned sheepishly. He had just won re-election against Black City Councilman Thomas Bradley after mounting a campaign that appealed to white prejudices. Quote, well, I certainly do, Yorty finally agreed. Of course, I was doing a little of that praying myself, you know, along with thousands. He emitted a strained chuckle. A grinning Owen kept up the patter. Quote, and I'd like to ask you another question, Mayor. Don't you believe that America, the world, needs to put their faith and trust in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob like never before? Yorty, not used to the role of straight man, hemmed and hawed. Uh, well, Jerry, he said, I, I think that this is one of the er, missing links that's causing so much disturbance and turmoil today, especially of young people. I think they sort of lost their moorings, and uh, too many have gotten away from belief, a real belief in a supreme being and a, a direction to all the affairs of human beings. Christian, the author, was bewildered. 
What was the one-time congressman, three-time mayor of Los Angeles, twice a candidate for governor of California, doing fumbling around with Owen? The question answered itself. Eight months before, Yorty had not even acknowledged Jack Brown's memorandum concerning Owen. Four days previously, Brown had been ousted when he again recommended that the Owen angle be looked into. Yorty hadn't just walked in on the television debut of The Walking Bible. Somehow, he and Owen were old friends. Now, the significance of the owen Saron friendship for the assassination of Robert Kennedy will become very clear here in just a minute. And again, the, the, the significance of Owen being connected with all of these different people and in turn all of the connections that we're delineating here, supposedly Saron Saron was a disenchanted Palestinian who killed Robert Kennedy because of his, uh, poli- his, his friendly policy towards Israel. No connections whatsoever, supposedly, to Saron Saron, as with all of our other faceless lone nuts. Well, again... This web of uh, connections that we're uh, delineating here uh, is, is significant. Uh, well, I, I think its significance is quite obvious, but uh, it, it totally destroys the uh, the thesis uh, presented, which is that this was a, a, an apolitical killing. Again, recall the Owen and uh, Sam Yorty relationship. Now, Yorty was one of a number of different people and uh, organizations were involved in painting Saran as a communist and also as an occultist and uh, sort of as a communist hyphen occultist, okay, as, as silly as that might sound, the fact of the matter is that uh, this PR campaign uh, went a long way towards fixing the notion in the public's mind that Saron was some sort of leftist or fellow traveler, and this, of course, is very similar to the way in which Lee Harvey Oswald was treated, too, following the assassination of John Kennedy, although eventually he turned out to be a, quote, lone nut, unquote, according to the official version. Initially, uh, all sorts of leftist ties were brooded about or alleged leftist ties, and this is very similar to the way Saron was handled. Sam Yorty, one of those who painted Saran red. Turner and Christian write, Within hours of the shooting, a campaign was underway to paint Saran a deep red. The chief brush wielder was Sam Yorty, the cocky bantam rooster mayor of Los Angeles. Yorty had a reputation for sounding off on practically every issue. During the height of the Vietnam War, he made two inspection trips to Saigon and returned with hawkish pronouncements on the necessity to increase the American military commitment. Wags dubbed Los Angeles the only city with its own foreign policy. The Kennedy brothers had long been near the top of Yorty's enemies list. <clears throat> in 1960, despite his nominal Democratic affiliation, Yorty had endorsed Richard Nixon over JFK, and in 1965, he had clashed with RFK during a Senate hearing. In 1968, he was again in Nixon's corner. Ironically, Christian had been a kind of unofficial campaign advisor to Yorty in 1966, called in by a former colleague of friend Paul Smith. Christian didn't know that Yorty was such a hard-line right-winger when he agreed to advise him. However, he soon found out how deep ran the waters of political intrigue when he learned that the so-called maverick mayor had a double strategy. Yorty intended to win, if he could, in the Democratic primary against the incumbent Edmund G. Pat Brown, father of Jerry Brown. But in case he didn't win, he was mounting a mudslinging and red-baiting campaign that he hoped would alienate conservative Democrats from Brown during the November election. In fact... Yorty held five secret strategy meetings with the Republican standard bearer, Ronald Reagan, to divide the Democrats from within. The plan worked. After Brown barely disposed of Yorty in the primary, he was battered by a vicious assault from the right in the general election and was handily beaten by Reagan. During the mid-morning of June 5, 1968, as Robert Kennedy lay comatose in the hospital, Yorty appeared before network television cameras with Chief of Police Thomas Redden, resplendent in his gold-braided uniform, sitting solemnly by his side and nodding in approbation. He revealed that according to a reliable police informant, unquote, a car traceable to suspect Saran had been seen several times parked in front of the W.E.B. Du Bois Club's, a leftist young people's group. The implication was that the man responsible for Kennedy's shooting was a left-wing radical. What Yorty neglected to point out was that the Du Bois Clubs were moribund and had vacated that address over a year before. One of Saran's brothers owned the car and played in the band at an, at an Arabian nightclub a couple of doors away. Saran used the car frequently because, of his, because his beat-up DeSoto was forever breaking down and visited his brother at the Hollywood Boulevard location on many, other, on many occasions. Following the television appearance, Yorty showed up at the field command post set up in the LAPD's Rampart Division, not far from the Ambassador Hotel. The mayor began sorting through material the police had just brought in from a warrantless search of Sir Han's room in the family residence in Pasadena. His attention centered on some Rosicrucian literature. Sir Han had recently applied for membership in that mystical society, and a pair of spiral notebooks 
filled with repetitive and often disjointed handwriting that indicated strong occult affinities. As Yorty left the police station, he was cornered by several members of the press. Quote, what can you tell us about Sirhan Sirhan, one asked. Well, the mayor replied, he was a member of numerous communist organizations, including the Rosicrucians. The Rosicrucians aren't a communist organization, a newsman corrected. In fact, it would turn out that Sirhan had never been affiliated with any communist group, communist-oriented group. Quote, It appears, Yorty amended, that Sirhan was a sort of loner who harbored communist inclinations, favored communists of all types. He said the U.S. must fall. Indicated, indica uh, said the U.S. must fall. Indicated that RFK must be assassinated before June 5, 1968. Yorty had excerpted passages from the spiral notebooks, but at this point no one had verified that they were actually written by the man in custody. Uh, in parentheses, there would remain a question of their authorship even after Sirhan was tried and convicted in 1969. Evidential niceties didn't phase the lawyer mayor. Returning before the television cameras, Yorty brandished the notebooks and flipped through pages, reading off entries that he saw, thought sounded communistic. Quote, He does a lot of writing, pro-communist and anti-capitalist anti-United States, he commented. No one in the vast television audience could fail to get the message that Sirhan had been inspired to his deed by his communist sympathies and occult dabblings. State Attorney General Thomas C. Lynch phoned Yorty to register concern that his tele televised statements, quote, referred to evidence that would have to be ruled upon by the court. And prominent local lawyers upbraided him for, as one put it, quote, your lack of understanding of the fundamentals of American justice but the irrepressible Yori would not be muzzled. He held another press conference at which he dwelt at length on the notebooks and their, quote, timetable to kill Kennedy. Sir Han, he said, was, quote, inflamed by contacts with the Communist Party and contacts with communist-dominated or infiltrated organizations. Both Yori and Redden went to great pains to convey that RFK's assassination had virtually been his own fault. Why? Because, they insisted, the pre presidential aspirant had allegedly told the LAPD that he wanted no police protection during his visits to Los Angeles. Thus, they said, no members of the LAPD had been present at the Ambassador Hotel at the time of the shooting. Apparently, none of the newsmen present gave any thought to the laws pertaining to the LAPD's responsibility for, quote, public safety and, quote, crowd control that should have applied to the gathering that night. The hotel housed no fewer than three major political candidates. Robert Kennedy, Senator Alan Cranston, and Max Rafferty. Their supporters covered the spectrum from extreme left to far right, the makings of potential spontaneous turmoil and violence. It was also strange that no one in the RFK campaign entourage could recall anyone, Robert Kennedy included, having called off LAPD protection. But no one stepped forth to challenge the contentions of the Yorty Redden press conference. The impression that prevailed was that RFK had somehow managed to orally sign his own death warrant. So uh, look at Yorty's behavior here, and again, recall his connection to Jerry Owen. He goes in there in, in total contravention of uh, legal procedure. He walks in, begins uh, handling evidence and interpreting evidence in front of movie cameras before a suspect has come to trial. Uh, as the text here indicates, that is a total departure from uh, legal procedure. It's, it's grossly illegal. Uh, it's worth noting, too, that the place where this evidence was being stored was the Ramparts Division uh, headquarters, uh, the Ramparts Division branch of the uh, LAPD. Now, we're, that, that significance is going to crop up again later in the broadcast because the f fellow in command of uh, this, uh, the Ramparts Station was Ed Davis, okay? And Ed Davis went on to become chief of police of Los Angeles and is now a state senator with higher aspirations and is also affiliated with uh, General Daniel Graham and Fritz Kramer in the Star Wars program. So, uh, a very significant fellow, Ed Davis, and again, he crops up in connection with the assassination. We'll talk about that later in the broadcast. Now, uh, another interesting connection uh, of uh, Sam Yorty's is the fact that uh, Sam Yorty was also affiliated with a, uh, an occult sort of guru type and a, and a hypnotist, and most significantly a master hypnotist, named Manley Palmer Hall. I'm going to reread a section that you heard on the tape segment from our previous Radio, uh, Radio Free America show about mind control. This in the, the tape segment about Saran's mind control. Again, about the association between Saran, Manley Palmer Hall, and Yorty. Conveniently omitted was the fact that a police search of Saran's car yielded a volume entitled Healing the Divine Art by Manley Palmer Hall, founder of the Philosophical Research Society. The book mysteriously disappeared from the grand jury, <coughs> grand jury exhibits. 
Hall, a man with penetrating eyes, chiseled features, and a Buddha-like figure, was a master hypnotist with a practice in hypnotherapy. Some time ago, he gained considerable publicity from hyp hypnotic antics, on one occasion putting under a movie actor and convincing him he was suffocating, with the result that the actor tore apart a movie set in his frantic search for air. We queried Saran in San Quentin about Hall and his society. He wrote back that he remembered paying several visits to the, to the headquarters in Alabaster Temple near Griffith Park. The secretary there had a distinct foreign accent, he said. Hall's wife is German-born, and I had to ask her to unlock the bookcases for me to get the books. For me to get, excuse me, and I had to ask her to unlock the bookcases for me to get the books I wanted to read in the library. I remember seeing Manley Hall himself there. Saran's dabbling with the occult society is by itself innocuous, but there is a certain irony in the fact that he was drinking from the same mystical fountain as Sam Yorty. For some two decades, the mayor had been a student of Hall whom he regarded as his guru. So again, supposedly Saran has no connections to anybody, and yet look at the connecting links between Saran, Yorty, Jerry Owen, and of course Jerry Owen's links to Bradley, to Braden, and other figures from the John Kennedy assassination, and these connecting links not only between supposedly unrelated key participants in the Robert Kennedy assassination, but or key figures, I should say, in the Robert Kennedy assassination, but also between key figures in that assassination and other assassinations as well. It's a pattern we've seen before, and we're going to see more of it. Okay. Um, now we're going to look at, uh, again, as Dave said, some more of these patterns cropping up again. Um, again, we're continuing with the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, skipping down a little bit. Uh, while Yorty was holding forth downtown on the morning of June 5th, a group calling itself American United called a press conference in Westwood near the UCLA campus. American United was the two-man show of John Steinbacher, a John Burt Society propagandist and part-time reporter for the Anaheim Bulletin in Orange County, and Anthony J. Hilder, a firebrand activist. Both were protégés of the well-known anti-Semite Myron J. Fagan, a leader of the Hollywood blacklisting clique during the McCarthy era. In fact, Hilder and a gaggle of followers had been at the Ambassador Hotel the previous night trying to race bait RFK by handing out buttons and pamphlets depicting him and black congressman Adam Clayton Powell Jr. of New York on the same ticket. After the shooting, the Hilder group created considerable confusion by alleging that the assailant was a Eugene McCarthy supporter. Okay, now, uh, skipping back here uh, to the, the uh, section that... Uh, back here, oh, do we go ahead there? Uh, no, just, uh, just go ahead and okay. read that footnote okay, there. Okay, we're just going to go to a footnote then. Um, this is uh, uh, from a letter signed by Anthony J. Hilder, April 7, 1968, mailed from 1141 North Highland Avenue, Hollywood, California, 9038. Uh, Foundation researcher Walter Carruthers informed us in 1971 that American United once used the address P.O. Box 285, Woodland Hills, California, on some of its Illuminati record albums. This is the same address on the letterhead of Eugene Bradley Defense Fund an ad hoc group of right-wing preachers raising money to defend him against the charges levied by D.A. Jim Garrison in the JFK assassination case. One of the signatories of a fundraising letter sent out in July 1968 was Orange County evangelist Dr. Bob Wells. In his 1968 interview with Jerry Owen, Turner asked if the preacher knew Wells. Quote, very well. He don't live far from me. Know him well. Did Owen know of the Bradley-Wells tie-in? I think Bradley was to speak for him once. So, again, it's just uh, it's virtually impossible to to escape the the uh, sort of the right wing milieu that keeps cropping up in this in the Kennedy the Robert F Kennedy assassination. Again, one one has to of course still question because the information is not complete what exactly the connections are, what exactly the involvement of these various people are. But uh, the 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 ripple effect that uh, goes out from what was supposedly a lone assassin at the at the center, namely uh, Sirhan Sirhan. Uh, back out to some of these people like Steinbacher and Hilders, we're going to hear about in a little bit of a moment, uh, more and more has to lead one to at least question uh, exactly what kind of a lone net was Sir Han. Well, and uh, take a look, too, at the, the interesting ways in all these people uh, connect up. Now, Hilder and Steinbacher are outside the Ambassador Hotel when Robert Kennedy gets killed, create confusion by maintaining that the uh, assassin was, uh, assailant was a Eugene McCarthy backer. Worth noting also that these guys held a press conference albeit unattended, in which they were portraying uh, Saran killing Robert Kennedy as an illuminist hyphen communist killing. I'm not even going to bother to try and explain the philosophy, but again, it equates communism as a sort of uh, an occult 
uh, origin, or originated philosophy and uh, sort of spins the occult and communism and socialism up into a, uh, a milieu, which uh, I'm not even going to bother to try and relate it, but they, they regard them as all being related and in turn uh, most... Uh, most progressive uh, forces as being, you know, somehow dupes or uh, tools of this communist Illuminist conspiracy. Now, note, not only are they outside the Ambassador Hotel when Robert Kennedy gets it and then holding a press conference to try and paint Saran red, but uh, that their address used on some of their record albums that they sent to senators was none other than the very same address used for the Edgar Eugene Bradley Fund. And uh, it's worth noting, too, that, uh, of course, Jerry Owen connects back up with the, with the, the Edgar Eugene Bradley situation. So, again... All of these groups fitting into uh, a pattern which uh, we've looked at before and we're going to continue to look at right now. One of the, uh, one of the uh, most uh, significant people in terms of painting Lee Harvey Oswald red was a guy named Ed Butler. Okay, And uh, Ed Butler was basically um, a, uh, well, a, a, an Army intelligence agent who had... Um, well, before uh, before we get on to Ed Butler, actually, I think uh, one, one more piece of information here as we go through the reams here. Uh, staying with Hilder and Steinbacher for just a couple of minutes before we move on to Ed Butler. Uh, not only did uh, Hilder and Steinbacher, uh, were they outside of the Ambassador Hotel and uh, then painting Saran red, but interestingly enough, they also, uh, Hilder, that is, was involved with hypnosis. Recall Manley Palmer Hall, connected to Sam Yorty, also connects to Saran question and possibility of uh, Manly Palmer Hall being with Saran's hypno-programming. Hilder also was uh, a very active uh, student of hypnosis, returning to the assassination of Robert Kennedy. We had no direct information that Owen knew Steinbacher and Hilder, or for that matter, that Steinbacher and Hilder had ever laid eyes on Saran. But we did learn that Hilder, who had been at the Ambassador Hotel on election night passing out anti-Kennedy handbills, had acquired more than a passing interest in hypnosis. In discussing the possibility that his programmer might have discovered Saran at a hypnosis school or demonstration, Hollywood hypnotist Gil Boyne mentioned to Christian that he himself held a self-help institute using hypnosis in the fall of 1967 that attracted several political extremists who might have seen some potential in Saran. One that Boyne named was Anthony Hilder. Hilder signed up for instructions for himself and a girlfriend, explaining that, explaining that he wanted to find out the nature and effect of hypnosis on the individual. After attending several classes, they dropped out. Then in December of 1967, he came to see, B he came to see Boyne. Um, I seem to have lost some uh, material here. Anyway, um, that, uh, we got, uh, oh, wait a minute, here we go. Okay, it's got it misplaced. Excuse me. Let me read that one again. Again, we have a, a ton of material here, and uh, we've got, got a couple of our uh, cards shuffled in the deck here, so just bear with uh, the bumpiness here. We just uh, got a little bit confused in our uh, pecking order here and our order of battle, and uh, let, me, let me read the last uh, few sentences again. again. Again, talking about the association between Anthony Hilder and Hollywood hypnotist Gil Boyne. Hilder signed up for instructions for himself and a girlfriend, explaining that he wanted to find out the nature and effect of hypnosis on the individual. After attending several classes, they dropped out. Then, in December of 1967... He came to see Boyne, and I think I'm still lost here. Um, no, I got it. Okay, one, one more. Sorry about this. He came to see Boyne wild-eyed and agitated, muttering about something political. He whipped out, this is Hilder, he whipped out a 38 police special and two boxes of shells and offered them to the frightened Boyne as payment for arrears tuition. Hilder confided that Boyne would soon have great need for the weapons because an event would occur that would touch off race riots around the country but Hilder had been quite insistent that he not be placed under hypnosis himself. He knew big things, he said, and he didn't want them to come out. Interesting behavior before the, the assassination of Martin Luther King, which, of course, did touch off race riots. And, uh, again, the question of a possible connection between Hilder and Steinbacher and the conspirators in that assassination has to be asked here. And, once again, another link with the other assassinations, possibly. And, certainly, uh, another ultra-right winger uh, moving in... in uh, Hollywood hypnosis circles, and uh, that along with Manley Palmer Hall adds yet another possibility towards uh, Saran's hypno-programming. Uh, and now we move on to the aforementioned Mr. Butler um, and some of his interesting contacts and the fact that, of course, well, we'll get to Butler. I'll explain in a moment. Let me just read here for a bit. At 7.15 on the evening after the RFK shooting, a compact man with goggle eyeglasses marched into LAPD headquarters with four companions. He gave his name as Major Jose Antonio Duarte and said he and his men were, quote, freedom fighters against Fidel Castro. 
A Cuban exile, Duarte reported that on May 21st he had attended a leftist meeting because he knew that support for Castro was on the agenda. When he rose to speak out, he said, a small olive-skinned young man angrily accused him of being a CIA agent, and they got into a shoving match. The young man was Sirhan Sirhan. Duarte tried to unload his story on the media, but it was ignored. Then on June 11th, the Anaheim Bulletin headlined, Pro-Castro Link to RFK Slaying. The article, written by Duarte's political associate John Steinbacher, and of course Anthony Hilder's political associate John Steinbacher, recounted the Cubans' putative encounter with Sirhan. Steinbacher arranged radio appearances for Duarte, and in an instant paperback book, Senator Robert Francis Kennedy, The Man, The Mysticism, The Murder, summed up, quote, Mayor Sam Yorty of Los Angeles has already, bought, um, has already brought out the pro-communist inclinations of Sirhan, but it was left to Major Jose Duarte, the Cuban anti-communist, to link Sirhan with the riots and unrest in our nation today, unquote. In time, the LAPD discredited Duarte's identification of Sirhan by producing a look-alike Iranian student who had been at the leftist meeting and recalled being, in, being involved in the altercation. However, the entire scenario struck us as all too familiar. In August 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald was accosted by an anti-Castro exile while handing out pro-Castro literature on the streets of New Orleans. Shortly after the scuffle, Oswald was invited to participate in a radio debate on the subject. In the, e in the evening of the day John Kennedy was shot, taped excerpts were broadcast nationally and Oswald was heard by millions proclaiming, I am a Marxist. Both the day debate and the assassination evening airing of the excerpts were arranged by Edward S. Butler, who headed a right-wing propaganda outfit in New Orleans called the Information Council of the Americas. And before I go on, I should just mention that those of you who listen to Guns of November... Uh, when we did that special in November of 1983, which uh, we can get you copies of, as we mentioned earlier, uh, actually heard that broadcast, which we had a tape of, and we played it. You hear Richard Butler, Lee Harvey Oswald, and uh, Carlos Bringier, and the, the whole shot. Anyway, by 1968, Butler, the man who arranged this whole thing and put it on the air, by 1968, Butler had moved to Los Angeles, where he carried on with financial aid from Patrick J. Frawley, Jr., Chief Executive Officer of the Schick Safety Razor Company. For years, Frawley generously supported hardline conservatives such as Ronald Reagan, Barry Goldwater, and Sam Yorty. Frawley and Yorty belonged to the American Security Council, an embodiment of the military-industrial complex that lobbied for a bigger military establishment and ran a political blacklist service for its large corporation clients. Anthony Hilder also claimed to have the backing of Frawley and Butler was present when Steinbacher and Hilder held their unattended press conference. Thus, a right-wing clique colored the facts and conjured up visions of a sinister occult cabal to depict Sir Han as the pawn of an international plot. As the Anaheim Bulletin rhetorically asked in an editorial, quote, Are foreign influences at work to conquer this country? Is a hidden plot progressing to eliminate the liberal leadership of the country and throw the movement completely into control of communist agents? Um, anyway, just uh, again some evidence again of the same thing, what we've been talking about, and uh, the, the presence of Butler very interesting because of, uh, of his earlier affiliation with uh, the rather spurious branding, uh, self-branding by Lee Harvey Oswald as him, of himself as a pro-Marxist again, uh, handing out uh, pro-Castro leaflets for a pro-Castro group of which he was the president and only member uh, in, in New Orleans and uh, then it got getting into a fight with an anti-Castro Cuban and uh, resolving it by going onto the air to proclaim his Marxism and then that tape managed to get back onto the air on the night of the John F. Kennedy assassination so the entire country could hear Lee Harvey Oswald proclaiming his Marxist sympathies. Okay, by the way, you are listening to KFJC 89.7 in Los Altos Hills. Again, take a look at the milieu that we're looking at here. Hilder and Steinbach are outside the Ambassador Hotel when Bobby Kennedy gets shot, holding a press conference painting Saran Red. Ed Butler, who functions in the same capacity with Lee Harvey Oswald, shows up at this very same press conference. Ed Butler, who transfers to the West Coast under the uh, stewardship of Frawley, William Frawley, who uh, is uh, a sponsor of, among others, Sam Yorty and Ronald Reagan, the Ronald Reagan who does not extradite Edgar Eugene Bradley. Note that uh, Hilder also boasts of the backing of Henry Salvatore, a key backer of Ronald Reagan's as well. And uh, 
Again, recall that uh, Hilder, or uh, yeah, that Hilder basically was uh, studying hypnosis and uh, may have had connections to the assassination of Martin Luther King. Again, a, a, an interesting tangle of personalities and organizations. And I just wanted to mention, in case you've just tuned this in recently, you've been hearing a lot of talking here, and I just gave the uh, the station identification at the top of the hour. But you may not know what you're listening to. This is Radio Free America. I'm Nip Tuck. And uh, with Dave Emery here in the studios at KFJC, and what we're doing tonight is the 17th anniversary of the uh, assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, and we're conducting a bit of an investigation into the facts surrounding his assassination and some of the untold story, I suppose. So anyway, so if you're wondering what you've tuned in into, that's what it is, and Radio Free America is a monthly feature on KFJC, and of course Dave's in my program One Step Beyond, uh, is a weekly fe- feature on Sunday evenings. Right, and again, uh, this is an awful lot to try and assimilate at one sitting. Uh, these programs are put together this way so you can tape them and study them at your uh, leisure. Hopefully, uh, some or all of you are doing that because it's a very important thing to do. And again, this is a, sort of an innovative form of broadcasting that we're doing here at KFJC. And uh, uh, we don't expect people to be able to recall this off the top of their heads. Uh, if you can, more power to you. I can't do it. So please, if you haven't begun already, do tape the program. And if for those of you who uh, haven't heeded our warnings or uh, encouragements or whatever, we do have all of these shows on file, and we'll have this one too, so that uh, you can uh, order it. And uh, check. By the way, we don't make any money out of this. This is simply as a service to the listeners. But uh, again, it's an awful lot of information to try and just sit down and listen to and assimilate. So uh, taping is the order of the day here. Now, it's worth noting also that the, the anti-Castro Cuban milieu, which figured so prominently in the John Kennedy assassination, and uh, again, we talked about that in our Guns of November broadcast about the JFK assassination, uh, also crops up in connection with Saran Saran. Now, the uh, Major Duarte, who uh, again was associated with Hilder and Steinbacher and talked uh, about Saran being a communist and so forth, uh, touches on this very same uh, anti-Castro milieu, and uh, that also figures perhaps in the background of Saran Saran. One of the places where Turner and Christian speculate that Saran may have hooked up with the right-wingers who obviously were manipulating him was at the, at the Corona Breeding Farm. Now, that was a horse breeding farm owned in part by Desi Arnaz. Desi, Desi Arnaz, uh, the television star, who, uh, of course, was with uh, Lucille Ball for many years on a, on a syndicated sitcom, um, basically was in a wealth, came from a wealthy Cuban family, as will be indicated here, and was very, very violently opposed to Fidel Castro and was very, very conservative politically. And uh, Saran worked at a ranch owned in part by Desi Arnaz. This basically, the Corona breeding ranch farm may have been where Saran uh, hooked up with uh, the ultra-right wingers who appear to have manipulated him. Turner and Christian write, In the spring of 1966, Saran quit his job at the racetracks because he felt he wasn't getting anywhere. Shortly thereafter, he scribbled in his notebook, I have secured a position as assistant to the manager of Corona breeding farm. Desi Arnaz's res- resident Saran, $600 per month. The farm was actually the Granja Vista, Nil- Del- Granja Vista del Rio Ranch near Corona, owned by a group that included Desi Arnaz, the former husband of Lucille Ball. The ranch bred and trained racing horses. Saran purportedly secured the job through a Frank Donnerumas, D-O-N-E-R-O-U-M-M-A-S, whom he had known at the Santa Anita track and who reputedly was a relative of the ranch manager, Bert C. Altfilish. Donna Rumis' true name was Henry R. Ramastella, R-A-M-I-S-T-E-L-L-A, but he had employed the alias to hide a long rap sheet acquired in New York and Miami. Donna Rumis was Saran's boss at the ranch, and according to co-workers, the two became quite friendly. In one of Saran's notebooks was the passage, Happiness, happiness, Donna, Donna Ruma, Donna Ruma, Frank Donna Ruma, pl- please, please, please pay to five, please pay to the order of Saran, Saran, the amount of five, after the assassination, the FBI interviewed one of Saran's co-workers, Terry Welch, who listed Desi Arnaz, Buddy Ebsen, and Dale Robertson, prominent television personalities, as horse owners who were well acquainted with Saran. All three actors were prominent in Hollywood's more conservative political circles. Desi Arnaz came from a wealthy Cuban family and was a fervent opponent of Fidel Castro. Welch pegged Saran as a staunch anti-communist. In conversations with fellow employees who were refugees from communist countries such as Cuba and Hungary, Saran always gave Welch the impression that he was very much opposed to communism, the FBI report stated. He indicated a strong liking for the United States and never exhibited any particular loyalty or feeling toward the country of his birth. Welch said that the Reverend Leo Hill, Circle City, Baptist Church, 9th and Sheridan, Corona, would possibly know Saran inasmuch as Saran gave Welch a card for this church and suggested that he see Reverend Hill when he was having personal problems. 
Hill's church subsequently merged with the large Riverside Baptist Church, a pillar of the fundamentalist right, and we located him there. Saran attended services a couple of times, the Reverend recalled, but as far as coming to me personally, he never did that. It is not difficult to envision how Corona, with its mix of its horse crowd, Hollywood actors, fundamentalist religion, religionists, and political conservatives, might have been the locus where Owens and Saran's path first crossed. And in a footnote to that sentence, Turner and Christian add, a possible linkage might have been Owens close ties to Jerome Weber, the lawyer for Desi Arnaz, and Saran's claim to having been employed at the actor's thoroughbred horse ranch. And uh, Jerome Weber, his ties to Saran, and or ties to Jerry Owen, and in turn to Evel Younger, the DA who prosecuted Saran. There's something Nip's about to tell you about. Okay, now, the uh, the man, the deputy uh, attorney general at the time, is a man by the name of uh, Charles O'Brien, and uh, the attorney general, attorney general Lynch, was leaving office. O'Brien was his hand-picked successor. And uh, one of the last things that uh, anybody wanted to happen was to have this Kennedy case blow up. But O'Brien himself was interested in the case and had been keeping, uh, been kept abreast by some of the people who had found some of the new evidence in the case. In addition, I recall that Charlie O'Brien, Charles O'Brien, was the deputy D, uh, deputy attorney general who reviewed the Garrison extradition request for Edgar Eugene Bradley and recommended that it be granted. He also, interestingly enough, was very high on Robert Kennedy's list for a possible attorney general after Robert Kennedy got elected president. Indeed. Now, O'Brien was, uh, as the Christian and Turner write, was pitted against Evel Younger. And although it was not a motivating factor in his desire to reopen the case, he realized that it could tip the scales. If a grand jury was merely convened, it would be politically embarrassing to Younger because of his role in prosecuting Sir Han and shutting down the conspiracy angle. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if a grand jury returned indictments, Younger's whole political future, he intended to run for governor eventually, could go up in smoke. But to simply make a campaign issue out of the assassination was a different matter, and O'Brien's brain trust counseled against it. What baffled us, however was O'Brien's reticence to exploit another whiff of scandal that had been hanging over Younger's head for some time. The central figure was a high-powered Beverly Hills attorney named Jerome Weber, whose clientele numbered celebrities such as Desi Arnaz and crime syndicate kingpins such as Frank M. Big Fat Frank Matranga of, of San Diego. In interestingly, Weber was a past president of the Saints and Sinners Club, whose meeting Jerry Owen purportedly attended as he waited to sell Sir Han the horse. In other words, that's the two different stories that Owen was, was telling. Um, the one that he went to a Saints and Sinners Club dinner, of which uh, Desi Arnaz's attorney, Jerome Weber, was, the, uh, was a past president of. And his other, Owen's other story was that uh, he told the Reverend Jonathan Perkins that he was actually waiting in the Ambassador Hotel parking lot. And Jerome Weber <clears throat> was Owen's first attorney in the suit against KCOP television. And we'll talk about that a little later on. The potential scandal revolved around Thomas E. Devins, a former parking lot attendant who had talked a wealthy widow out of a large chunk of money and then taken her to Europe, where she disappeared. Her remains were later found in the Swiss Alps. An indictment for murder was pending against Devins. Weber told him that he could quash the case through his, quote, influence <clears throat> inside the DA's office. According to grand jury testimony, Weber's asking price was $35,000, of which $25,000 would go to two top DA investigators. To demonstrate his, quote, control of the situation, the attorney said he would have a pesky DA investigator transferred so that his, quote, two top investigators, unquote, could take charge. The transfer went through. Then Weber told Devins that he had arranged for senior investigator George Murphy to accompany the investigator to control an out-of-town interview. We consider this of more than passing interest, since Murphy and Chief Investigator George Stoner had been Younger's two top men on the RFK case and had put down Owen as nothing more than an unfunny clown. Devins paid part of the money, but then, perhaps sensing a double cross, went to the Attorney General's office and complained of being blackmailed. O'Brien's agents hit a transmitter in his clothing and sent him in to bargain further with Weber. The attorney produced a confidential report from the DA's office to prove his connections. Devins expressed skepticism. Quote, have they ever failed to come through? That is, have they ever taken any bread and then that's it? No, 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 Weber replied. Never in a million years. Weber was convicted of bribery and eventually disbarred. When he appealed the conviction, none other than Jerry Owen supplied an affidavit on his behalf. Owen claimed that he was introduced to Devins by Weber, who said, quote, Curly, which was Jerry Owen's nickname, this is Mr. Devins. Mr. Devins, this is Curly Owen. He is a minister. 
Several months later, Owen and Devins met on the Sunset Strip, and Devins tried to get Owen to say he overheard Weber solicit the bribe, quote, to give to somebody downtown to take care of the thing, unquote. Owen said he answered, no, I didn't hear that. So in other words... Owens is going. Go, Owens is going into court. Uh, Owen is going into court um, on the attorney Weber's behalf, claiming that Devins tried to bribe him to say that Weber was soliciting bribes. Okay. Owen said he answered, "No, I didn't hear that." The California Supreme Court, in denying Weber's appeal, opined that quote Owens' testimony was incredible and quote full of discrepancies and suspicious statements unquote. Owen said he answered. No, I didn't hear that. So, in other words, Owens is going. Go, Owens is going into court. Uh, Owen is going into court um, on the attorney Weber's behalf, claiming that Devins tried to bribe him to say that Weber was soliciting bribes. Okay, Owen said he answered, "No, I didn't hear that." The California Supreme Court, in denying Weber's appeal, opined that quote Owens' testimony was incredible and quote full of discrepancies and suspicious statements unquote. The Weber case was potential dynamite since Younger had made no move to clean house by singling out the corrupt investigators and prosecuting them. But O'Brien never detonated it, electing instead to try to outgun Younger on his strong point of law and order. A major general in the Air Force Reserve, Younger was firmly identified with the Nixon administration's hard line that was in vogue before Watergate. O'Brien lost in a photo finish by less than one-third of one percent of the total votes. So basically, look at who we've got here. This Weber is not only Desi Arnaz's attorney and affiliated with a number of other organized crime figures, but is a fixer inside the Los Angeles District Attorney's office. The two guys who he recruited for this uh, uh, machination on behalf of Mr. Devins, an accused murderer, were two of the key investigators for Special Unit Senator who had poo-pooed the notion that Jerry Owen might have been in any way involved in the assassination of Robert Kennedy. They dismissed him as a publicity seeker. Now, Jerry Owen is very close to Weber. Weber is a fixer inside of the, the uh, L.A. DA's office, that DA being Evel Younger, the man who ignored all of the evidence we've been presenting this evening of a conspiracy, a politically motivated conspiracy, and ruled Saran, or basically successfully prosecuted Saran as the lone assassin. Evel Younger, in, in this election, beat out Charles O'Brien to become Attorney General for the state of California, later was defeated in a uh, gubernatorial bid by Jerry Brown, the uh, son, of course, of Pat Brown, done in by Sam Yorty. But uh, this is an interesting uh, interesting connection here, and uh, uh, again, evaluate uh, what uh, what effect you think that would have on the uh, integrity of the investigation. As far as Evel Younger and the way he did handle the Saran case, an example of that indicated here by Turner and Christian. On May 28th, District Attorney Evel Younger handed out a 13-page press release reviewing the Saran case. He disclosed that Captain Hugh Brown, of Special Unit Senator, and his 47 investigators had interviewed, quote, well in excess of 4,000 possible witnesses and others pretending to some knowledge of events. In this mass of material, the DA went on, are the assertions of a number of individuals who have, who have attracted the attention of the news media with respect to the possibility of a conspiracy to affect the death of Senator Kennedy. Assuring that the allegations had been investigated in depth and discredited, unquote, Younger briefly mentioned several of the more prominent ones. And again, recall Jerry Owen, his association with Saran, connected to a lawyer who was a fixer inside the DA's office, and two of the people employed by that fixer were two of the key investigators in Special Unit Senator. And the usage of the word investigated and discredited perhaps takes on a slightly different meaning than was originally intended. Or disproved. Yeah. A better, perhaps a better... Uh, they chose not to use disproved and chose to use discredited, which apparently is what they were trying to do as best they could. Anyway, going along to another very interesting interesting connection um, in this case and again uh, it, it do go round as I always find myself saying it do go round um, continuing with the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy quote do you know Arthur Bremer's sister Bugliosi asked Owen Arthur Bremer was the young man who had gunned down Alabama Governor George C. Wallace in Maryland on May 15, 1972 thus effectively removing him from the presidential race in fact, Bremer's elder sister had been standing by to testify for Owen until Mike Whalen told the court that he intended to ask questions about this relationship. She was flown out of town. This is the trial they're talking about is the KCOP versus Jerry Owen trial, which we'll explain in a minute. She was flown out of town that same night. Her name was Gail Aiken, and she had previously furnished a signed statement saying that she happened to be shopping in Orbox department store when the shoplifting incident occurred. Quote, there was a small colored lady standing near me, Aiken said, 
And she stated, quote, I know that man. He's the walking Bible, and he is on TV every Sunday, Channel 13 at 1230. I was curious and watched the program. It astounded me how this man could quote the Bible, and it was a very good program. I sent in a donation for one of the records of the Gospel Lads. When the program was canceled, Aiken received one of Owen's SOS letters asking viewers to protest to KCOP. When she called the station, she reputedly was told, quote, that Jerry Owen was a thief, an arsonist, and involved in the Sirhan Sirhan matter, unquote. Actually, we discovered that Gail Aiken had known Owen for some time and undoubtedly accompanied him to the store. She had been a secretary to his college instructor brother since 1966 and was one of his most devoted religious followers. Immediately following the Wallace shooting, Owen somehow felt compelled to report his association with Aiken in an innocent context, just as he had with Sirhan, and again, he didn't go to the news media. However, instead of going to the police this time, he phoned newsman Baxter Ward's campaign headquarters. Ward was then running for his supervisor, supervisorial post, which he eventually won, and excitedly insisted upon meeting with the candidate. An appointment was set for the next day, but Owen failed to show up. Now, recall uh, some of the connections that we've talked about in the past. We'll call it uh, Saran's hypno-programmer, or possible hypno-programmer, William Joseph Bryan, received a call from Laurel, Maryland, right after the shooting of Wallace. Let's keep that in mind as you listen to the rest of the account here of Turner and Christian. After first insisting to Ward that he hadn't called right after the Wallace shooting, he leaned forward, uh, Owen, that is, he leaned forward sheepishly and in a low voice confided, Do you realize that the girl who worked for my brother at Trade Tech College was the sister of the fellow who shot Wallace? No, Ward gasped. And she just came to me and I helped her to get an airplane ticket to go to Florida. They've been driving her crazy, poor little thing. She was my brother's secretary at Trade Tech for eight years. The police and FBI had hounded her, Owen said, and she came to him as a minister, unquote, for help. But he quickly revealed that there was more to it when he mentioned her promise. He mentioned her promised return from her home in Miami to testify at his trial against KCOP and Orbox. Unbelievable, Ward had commented when he when informed when he informed Christian about Owen's disclosure. Owen showing up in the background of the Wallace shooting is just too much to ask of coincidence. And I would add, interject here, think of all the other coincidences and ask yourself whether that also would be way too much to ask of coincidence. Now, with Bugliosi asking him if he knew Arthur Bremer's sister, Owen suddenly tried to disown Aiken as thoroughly, as thoroughly as he dared. I know a Gail Aiken. This, by the way, is in the course of the KCOP versus Jerry Owen trial. We're going to relate that in uh, greater length here in just a minute. I know a Gail Aiken, he conceded. I was told that was his sister, but I don't know Arthur Bremer, and I didn't know a sister by the name of Bremer, but I know Gail Aiken, who I was informed when this trial started that she had a brother that was three years old when she left him and hadn't seen him since, unquote. Owen's sworn testimony clashed with what he had told Ward on tape. Owen had presumably brought Aiken from Miami in the expectation that no one would identify her as Bremer's sister. But why was that connection now an embarrassment when he had volunteered it to Ward the year before? All we know was that coincidence was being stretched to the breaking point, and something which might stretch that uh, coincidence uh, even further would be the following footnote. On August 25th, 1973, William Bremer Jr., that's uh, Arthur Bremer's brother, William Bremer Jr. was sentenced to 18 months in jail and ordered to make restitution in a weight-reducing swindle in which he took $30,000, $36,000 in advance fees. Bremer was represented by attorney Ellis Rubin, who had long represented CIA-sponsored anti-Castro activists and was, at, was attorney for the Miami Four, Frank Sturgis, Bernard Barker, Eugenio Martinez, and Vigilio Gonzalez, in the Watergate break-in, which is uh, intriguing. A word here about uh, the George Wallace shooting. George Wallace was running uh, as a uh, very co or, or conservative Democrat. He had already announced that uh, if he did not get the Democratic nomination, as, as, as it appeared he wouldn't, he would run as an independent candidate. Now, Richard, Le Richard Nixon was basing his 1972 re-election strategy on sweeping the South, uh, there and uh, getting the conservative vote in the North, thereby... Uh, counterbalancing the traditional democratic strongholds in the industrial Midwest and uh, Northeast and uh, urban centers. Okay, so Nixon's southern strategy, a complete sweep in the south, was essential to his reelection plans. 
Uh, obviously, if George Wallace ran as an independent, that threatened those plans. Wallace is crippling, in, uh, allegedly by Arthur Bremer, and there are many discrepancies with the physical evidence there, too, eliminated the one major threat to Richard Nixon's 1972 re-election bid, just as the assassination of Robert Kennedy eliminated the most significant obstacle to his election in 1968, as the assassination of John Kennedy in 1963 removed the man who had defeated him in 1960. Recall that Nixon was in Dallas, Texas, on November 22, 1963. When interviewed by the FBI three months later, his memory was off by a full 48 hours. He claimed that he had left two days before, and of course, as many people have said, everyone who was alive and of the age of consciousness at the time remembers just where they were and what they were doing when the uh, when John Kennedy was killed. That apparently excludes Richard Nixon and Dan Rather, as we looked at him in the past. <laughs> These two individuals have grossly faulty memories about the uh, the JFK assassination, but just a sort of place Richard Nixon in the context of recent American history and gunplay. Right. Now, just in case, at this point, um, you might think, well, boy, they've really come up with all the weird connections they could possibly come up with. Um, coincidence has been stretched until it squeaks. You might think that there's no more that can be piled onto the top of this. We're going to add one last little note here. Sirhan Sirhan had spent his early childhood in a Palestine torn by the, Israeli, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict of 1948. His family belonged to a Lutheran congregation but in 1956 switched to the Greek Orthodox Church and soon thereafter was able to migrate to America. Their immigration sponsors were a socially prominent Pasadena couple active in the Republican Party and, in time, the Nixon campaigns. The couple had known Richard Nixon at Whittier College. So on top of everything else we've talked about tonight, Sirhan Sirhan's family was sponsored in by a couple who knew Richard Nixon at Whittier College and eventually wound up working in the Richard Nixon campaigns. Um, what can I tell you? Unbelievable. Unbelievable stuff. Now, a quick word about uh, KCOP here, because we're the time, uh, the clock is moving right along, and it's no more awaiting us than it has uh, awaited any other men uh, before. So, uh, getting right into the uh, KCOP versus Jerry Owen trial. By the way, before getting into that, I would just... Uh, Note that, obviously, this is a very, not only lengthy, but complex tangle of associations. Hopefully, you're taping this off the air. What I would recommend, by way of coming to terms with this, would be to sit down with your tapes and diagram some of this stuff out. Maybe take an hour's worth of the broadcast each week and uh, sort of diagram out, make some notes, and uh, sort of chart some of this stuff out. I think it'll help you to have a visual representation of these connections and uh, probably look something like an orb web uh, of a garden spider or something because it's almost circular the way these things all hook up. But uh, you may want to uh, graph some of these things out or chart them out uh, after you sit down with your tapes after the broadcast uh, or, you know, in, in weeks to come. Uh, KCOP was a television station in Los Angeles. Jerry Owen had a TV program, as indicated in the passage about uh, Arthur Bremer's sister there. Um, basically, uh, as a result of not only his uh, criminal record, but also his possible involvement in the assassination of Robert Kennedy, he was dismissed. He then filed a civil suit against uh, KCOP and its license holder, Orbox, a department store in Los Angeles, charging basically that they had libeled him. And uh, the uh, KCOP enlisted a number of people for their defense, the first uh, part of the, uh, we're basically we're going to play a couple of hard range shows here, and uh, the uh, defense undertaken by KCOP was essentially what is known as an affirmative defense. If somebody has uh, charged you with libel saying you said that they did something they didn't do, you can prove that isn't libel by proving they did the thing that you said they did, okay? This was the defense used by KCOP. They undertook to demonstrate that Jerry Owen was, in fact, involved in the assassination of Robert Kennedy, as uh, certainly appears probable from the massive uh, set of uh, coincidences and information we've presented. And that basically was how the KCOP versus Jerry Owen civil trial was heard. Now, we're going to play you now a couple of uh, excerpts from some Hard Rain broadcasts. Uh, Hard Rain is a show which for many years was featured here on uh, KFJC as well as some other stations that uh, sort of, I guess you could say, matured into uh, Radio Free America here. Hard Rain is sort of a baby archive series that used to exist here before uh, the whole thing sort of matured to its present level. Anyway, you're going to hear two Hard Rain shows, one from October 24th of 1980 and the other of uh, November 7th of 1980. And... Uh, the, these basically are going to be two portions of a hard, two hard range shows dealing with the KCOP versus Jerry Owen case. I should also just mention to you that uh, before uh, we do anything else that you might want to know, 
um, that you are, in fact, listening to Radio Free America. We've had a lot of broadcasting time tonight taken up with uh, the, the radio equivalent of talking heads, I realize. And uh, we probably are not going to get to the phone calls. But uh, that is what's going on. Generally, these kinds of shows, we do have phone calls. And, of course, with uh, One Step Beyond on Sunday nights from 9 to 11, we always have phone calls. So you can get a chance to get a, get in touch with us then. But so once again, um, that is what is going on. You are listening to Radio Free America. As Dave mentioned, we're about to play a hard rain tape from 1980, and it will be Dave Emery's voice you'll be hearing, but uh, it's not live June 5th, 1985, just so you don't get too confused. So once again, going to that hard rain broadcast from August, October 24th, 1980, on Jerry Owen and the KCOP trial. Bear in mind that, according to Jerry Owen, he had never known Saran Saran prior to June 3rd, and that he didn't, he had never heard Saran's name prior to all the publicity which followed the assassination. Now, in point of fact, Jerry Owen had been associated with Saran Saran for quite some time, and there is a considerable amount of evidence that's brought to light in the book that I just mentioned, The Assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, which indicates that, in point of fact, Jerry Owen was involved in the assassination. Now, during the Jerry Owen versus KCOP case, Owen's prior relationship to Saran emerged during KCOP attorney Michael Whalen's cross-examination of a man named Johnny Gray. Now, Johnny Gray was originally called to the witness stand as an objective character witness by Owen's attorneys. During the course of Whalen's cross-examination of the witness, it emerged not only that Johnny Gray was far from, a, from an objective witness, he had previously worked for Owen both as a bodyguard and as a trainer for one of Owen's fighters. Owen mentioned Owen managed some fighters. But more importantly, it emerged that <clears throat> Jerry Owen had in point of fact known Saran Saran's name before June 5th, the night he claimed to the Los Angeles Police Department that he first recognized Saran Saran, who he claimed to have picked up as a hitchhiker on the 3rd. In the assassination of Robert Kennedy, Bill Turner and John Christian present an account of the Jerry Owen versus KCOP trial and of KCOP attorney Michael Whalen's cross-examination of Owen character witness Johnny Gray. Turner and Christian relate. Mr. Gray, what was your profession during the time Mr. Owen came in contact with Saran? Whalen asked. Gray's mouth went sand dry. You wish a drink of water, sir? The attorney inquired politely, noting that his witness seemed hypersensitive about the RFK case. He then established that Gray was living not far from the Coliseum Hotel at that time. Wayland, did you ever see Mr. Owen with Saran? Gray, no, not to my recollection. Wayland, did Mr. Owen tell you what transpired on the Monday and Tuesday before Kennedy was shot? Gray, something, he told me something pertaining to that deal. He, he had a big, the words hung in the air. Wayland, you had contact with him that Monday and Tuesday, is that correct? Gray, possibly. Wayland, it would be very probable you did, inasmuch as you were training his fighter and living up the street from him. Gray, right, that's exactly what I say. It is a possibility we were conferring together at that time. I can't recall explicitly. Wayland, tell me what you recall that Mr. Owen told you regarding those two days. Owen waved his arm, but Judge Crickard ignored this attempt to coach the witness. Whalen, er, Gray, I recall that he had a fighter by the name of Rip Riley living at the big hotel, and he was going there and coming there or something, and he met a hitchhiker, and he gave the hitchhiker a ride. Whalen, did Mr. Owen ever identify this hitchhiker to you as Saran Saran? Gray, no, he said it might have been. That's all the information I can have of that. Gray obviously wanted to get away from this unexpected line of questioning. Wayland. Is that what he told you that Monday or Tuesday before the assassination? Is that right? Gray, yes, that's right. Whalen, is that right? The attorney wanted to make sure Gray knew what he was saying. Gray, yes, that is correct. Now, before I proceed here, focus in particular on Judge Crickard's strange behavior, because as the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy situation begins to emerge during the course of Mr. Gray's testimony, and as it becomes clear that in point of fact, Gray is impugning Jerry Owen's integrity here, indicating that his story to the LAPD was not truthful. Judge Crickard is obviously displeased that the assassination of Robert Kennedy is coming to light here, and in the end, he winds up sustaining objections which Owen's counsel hasn't even made yet, which, to say the least, is highly unusual legal procedure. Proceeding with Turner and Christian's account of Gray's testimony, 
So the thrust of Gray's testimony was that Owen had related the hitchhiker story, including mentioning Saran's name, before the assassination. This squared with what the Reverend Perkins had told Christian, and buttressed what Phil Powers and the Cowboys had reported about, namely, a prior relationship between Owen and Saran. Although it was evident that Gray had been very much a part of the events of the days immediately preceding the assassination, Owen had avoided mentioning him in the versions of his story given to Turner and the LAPD. This could have been because Gray had accompanied Owen and Saran to Wild Bill's stables. The LAPD had learned about Gray and his close relationship with Owen, and in fact detectives had driven Gray to the Apple Valley area on the fringe of the Mojave Desert shortly after the assassination in a fruitless attempt to find a ranch where the preacher was said to keep horses. Gray had mentioned this to Christian in 1969, and Christian had told Wayland. Now Wayland made a tactical error. Without laying a testimonial foundation, he braced Gray with the Apple Valley trip. Owen attorney Arthur Every, E-V-R-Y, objected, and Crickard made Wayland explain what he was driving at. Wayland said that he was engaged in a defense that Owen was somehow involved, unquote, with the assassination, and while, that while he didn't want to, quote, lay out all my cards at this point, it could be that Gray had, quote, told something to the police which directly implicates Mr. Owen, unquote. Crickard was seething. Sustain the objection, he cried. It is not relevant. But Wayland forged on, asking Gray, quote, Have you ever been advised or admonished by any law enforcement agency not to talk about Owen's involvement in the RFK incident? Crickard was beside himself. That's not relevant either, he injected. Sustain the objection. There hadn't been an objection, which gave Wayland the impression the judge was beginning to take sides. Gray was allowed to step down. But if he thought his testimonial ordeal was over, it was just beginning. Well, Judge, Crickard's strange behavior in the case of Jerry Owen versus KCOP continued. It was one of the strangest things that Judge Crickard did was to admit a a obviously forged letter, or memorandum, I should say, into evidence. The bogus memo was introduced by Owen's attorneys as part of an attempt to show that John Christian, who was working behind the scenes with the KCOP defense, had in fact conspired with KCOP to defame Christian. And of Judge Cricker's admission into evidence of a, an obviously spurious document, Turner and Christian write, Wayland's planned strategy was to demonstrate that the KCOP management, once they verified Owen's arrest record, had acted responsibly and in accordance with federal guidelines by terminating the walking Bible program. But that strategy was becoming more and more snagged on the RFK assassination issue. Owen brought a parade of witnesses into court to testify that when they called the station to find out why the program had been canceled, they were told, among other things, that Owen was, quote, involved, unquote, in the assassination. As it turned out, Owen had solicited most, if not all, of these viewers to phone the station. But he hadn't stopped there, as became evident when an aging lady evangelist calling herself the Reverend Olga Graves took the stand. She produced a poor Xerox copy of a KCOP internal memorandum from Counsel Yakulo to President Hopkins that summarized Christian's allegations about Owen's criminal record and connection with the assassination. Crudely grafted to the bottom of the memo was Christian's signature over our typewritten names, obviously reproduced from correspondence previously introduced. Graves testified that she had received the document in the mail approximately two weeks before, and that John Christian's name and address were typed on the envelope. But when asked by Wayland if she had mentioned receiving it to Owen, she said, I did not. He asked me, unquote. Judge Crickard allowed the hybrid document to be entered as a legitimate exhibit, even though the defense protested vigorously. Eventually, after using this bogus document to help buttress his case, Jerry Owen's attorneys, much was their case, I should say, Jerry Owen's attorneys were able to prevail on Judge Cricker to issue a warrant for the arrest of John Christian to be brought in as a witness in the case. And of the further use of this bogus document and Judge Cricker's highly unusual behavior in issuing a warrant for Christian's arrest, authors Turner and Christian write, on the eighth day of the trial, Owen took the stand to testify. One of his attorneys, Walter Faber of Salt Lake City, held up, held up Plaintiff's Exhibit 36B, the hybrid KCOP Christian document, and asked, Where did you first see that document? Owen answered that he had first seen it in a church in Modesto, California, 
and subsequently in churches in a host of towns around the state. Yes, he had been cut off from further preaching at the churches that received the document. Faber asked how long this harassment, unquote, by John Christian had been going on. From July 1969 to the present, the preacher replied. This confirmed Owen's awareness of the RFK aspects prior to the original filing of his lawsuit in July of 1970. I'd like to interject at this point that in the original lawsuit, no mention whatever was made of the Robert Kennedy assassination. It had caused him great mental anguish and loss of income, Owen complained. Practically sobbing, he said, I have been shamed. I have walked in to visit a church and sat down and people turned around and looked at me. I have been to the doctor. I can bring the doctor in here. Excuse me, could I have a couple of aspirin, Your Honor? No sooner had Owen finished this theatrical testimony than his attorneys approached the bench and demanded that Christian be brought into court by force if necessary to answer their questions. The matter was put off until the following morning so that college student Barbara Jean Grimes, whom Rusty Rhodes had co-opted to serve Christian with the subpoena, could appear to testify. On cross-examination, Wayland got her to admit that Christian had neither acknowledged his identity nor even touched the subpoena. I think it hit his feet, she said, raising a distinct question of whether the service was legal and proper. But Crickard ordered that a, quote, body attachment, unquote, be issued for Christian with bail fixed at $500. Issue that as promptly as possible, he instructed his bailiff, and see if we can get Mr. Christian in here forthwith. I'd like to point out that not only was the procedure that Judge Crickard followed here highly unusual, but there was considerable question, as Turner and Christian related here, that the service of a subpoena which had been given to Christian was proper in the first place. Well, the many unusual aspects of the case, Judge Crickard's unusual behavior, the fact that potentially explosive information pointing to a conspiracy in the assassination of Robert Kennedy was beginning to surface, and in particular... Crickard's strange behavior in issuing a warrant for the arrest of John Christian. Eventually, this led the two authors of this book, Bill Turner and John Christian, who, as I said, were working with the KCOP defense, to approach noted attorney Vincent Pugliosi, who agreed at the very last minute to enter into the defense of KCOP. Now, Vincent Pugliosi's affirmative defense of KCOP, we're going to be talking about next week on this broadcast. Suffice it to say that uh, when... Turner and Christian met with Vincent Pugliosi and mentioned Judd Crickard's highly unusual actions, in particular his issuing of a warrant for Christian's arrest. Pugliosi's reaction was significant. Pugliosi said, according to Turner and Christian, something's very wrong here, Pugliosi said. I never heard of a mere witness being pursued in a civil case like this. You are not a defendant, and that's the only justification for any court to turn on this kind of heat. The lawyer had heard enough of the strange events in and out of the courtroom to be intrigued with the prospect of entering the case. And eventually he did, and as I said, next week we will be dealing with Bugliosi's handling of KCOP's defense. Uh, Basically, we are listening to Hard Rain Show. That was the first of a two-part series about the Jerry Owen versus KCOP case. And uh, one of the interesting things about this case is that uh, the case was heard by Judge Jack Crickard, or John Crickard, who was an appointee by then-Governor Ronald Reagan. Okay, so Reagan appoints the judge who's uh, handling all of these strange uh, legal machinations. So we're going to play a short uh, bit of music here while I cue the other side of this tape, and then we're going to hear the second part of the KCOP versus Jerry Owen case. Pugliosi had gained nationwide prominence for his prosecution of the Manson family in the Sharon Tate LaBianca killings. Of course, it was, published, it was widely publicized as a book by Pugliosi called Helter Skelter. Well, in defending KCOP, Vincent Pugliosi undertook what is known as an affirmative defense. And that is, he sought to defend KCOP against the libel charge by proving that Owen was involved in the assassination and that KCOP was not defaming him by so stating because it was true. Well, once again, Judge Crickard was instrumental in frustrating the efforts of Bugliosi and the rest of the KCOP team. Today, we're going to be take a look at, taking a look at how Crickard frustrated Bugliosi's efforts to obtain the LAPD file on Jerry Owen. They claimed they couldn't find the file, and Crickard allowed that somewhat incredible excuse to stand. Crickard also prevented Bugliosi from bringing forth some very damaging testimony from an Owen acquaintance named Bill Powers, P-O-W-E-R-S. And the last thing we're going to examine in this broadcast is Judge Crickard's refusal to permit Bugliosi to present information concerning the CIA background of Manuel Pena, the LAPD official who was overseeing the day-to-day progress of the investigation in his role as, well, 
He wasn't actually in charge of Special Unit Center, the LAPD unit that was formed in order to investigate the Kennedy killing, but he was the individual most in charge of, as I said, overseeing the daily progress of the investigation. Incidentally, one of his, <clears throat> excuse me, one of his top assistants on the, uh, on SUS was a fellow by the name of Sergeant Hank Hernandez, who had also worked for the CIA. And interestingly enough, Thane Eugene Caesar, prior to working for the 8th Security Guard Service, had been a security guard with Lockheed at its Burbank facility, which had served as a base for the CIA's U-2 activities. Well, the last we're going to be taking a look at all of these things, and we're going to begin by taking a look at Bugliosi's attempt to obtain the LAPD file on Jerry Owen. Voice my voice here a little bit, and then we'll proceed. Well, basically, when the Jerry Owen versus KCOP case resumed. Vincent Bugliosi requested the LAPD file on Owen, as I just mentioned, and Officer Ronald Schaefer, S-C-H-A-F-F-E-R, of the Records Identification Division of the LAPD, showed up, and after being sworn in, Schaefer denied to produce the LAPD file, and uh, Turner and Christian relate his reason for doing so. They say, His superior had instructed him to invoke Section 1040 of the California Evidence Code that declares certain police records to be considered confidential information unless ordered released by to the parties by a magistrate of this state, unquote. Well, in arguing that it was in the public's interest to have the, the LAPD produce the Jerry Owen file for the case, Bugliosi argued as follows. Turner and Christian write, Bugliosi observed that the LAPD claim of privilege should not be allowed unless, in the language of the code, quote, it would be against the public interest because there is, is a necessity for preserving the confidentiality of the information that outweighs the necessity for disclosure in the interest of justice, unquote. Bugliosi argued that the public interest far outweighed any need for secrecy. I think the court can take judicial notice, he said, that the whole tone, the whole tenor in this country at this particular moment is that there is a tremendous distrust, there is a tremendous suspicion, there is a tremendous skepticism about whether or not people like Oswald and Surratt acted alone, and many, many people, many substantial people, I'm not talking about conspiracy buffs who see a conspiracy behind every tree. Many, many substantial people feel that Saran did not act alone, that he did act in concert. Crickard remained impassive. Bugliosi pressed on, saying that the defense was in a position to offer circumstantial evidence, quote, which would be extremely incriminating to Mr. Owen. No one is going to say that they saw Mr. Owen pull the trigger and shoot Senator Kennedy. We intend to offer evidence from which a very strong inference could be drawn that possibly Mr. Owen was a co-conspirator in this case. Bugliosi pointed out that Owen had voluntarily injected himself into the investigation by reporting the hitchhiker's story to the police. Now, all we want to do is to take a look at these LAPD reports. Just because the LAPD concluded that Mr. Owen was not involved in the Kennedy assassination doesn't mean anything to me personally, and it shouldn't mean anything to the court. The LAPD is not the trier of fact. Why were the police so determined to keep secret records they had deemed to be meaningless? I have to say, Bugliosi commented, as a prosecutor for eight years, I find it extremely strange that the LAPD would not want this information at this point to be public. I find it very strange indeed. If Owen was not involved, as LAPD, I assume, has concluded, there is no conceivable reason under the moon why they shouldn't permit us to look at those records. Officer Schaefer was ordered by Cricker to fetch them immediately. However, when... Officer Schaefer returned with the LAPD file. It turned out that they had brought some material which stated that it was a file on Jerry Owen, but in fact, it had nothing to do whatsoever with the case. Turner and Christian described this, saying, When Officer Schaefer returned with an LAPD file marked Owen, comma, Jerry, Judge Cricker decided that he himself would examine the investigative report to determine whether it was relevant. After a recess for this purpose, he ruled that, quote, there would be no relevant information disclosed by making the record public, unquote. Bugliosi said he was, quote, shocked by the court's ruling on this. I'm almost at a loss for words, which doesn't happen too often to me. To say that the public interest is against disclosure, the judge interrupted to repeat his opinion that the report was irrelevant. After further verbal sparring, the attorney began to suspect that what Crickard had read was not what the subpoena had called for. Bugliosi asked to look at the index, which revealed that the report was not about Owen and the RFK case after all. Reading from the subpoena served on the department, Bugliosi stressed that Schaefer was supposed to have brought, quote, the entire file on plaintiff, that is, Mr. Owen, 
including the original tape recording and transcript of Owen's June 5, 1968 story of the Los Angeles Police Department University Station officers, and including the tapes and transcripts of all other interviews made with Owen up to and including the July 3, 1968 one in San Francisco at the George T. Davis office, together with polygraph tests, unquote. That was certainly specific, but Shaver's excuse was that he never had the birth date of Mr. Owen, unquote. It was as if the FBI couldn't find its Lindbergh kidnap file because it didn't have the baby's birth date. Crickard instructed Schaefer to return to headquarters with Owen's vital statistics and search for the specified material. When it was located, he was to bring it to court at once. Well, Officer Schaefer went back, and when the trial resumed, he was put on the stand. He did not bring the LAPD file on Jerry Owen, and Judge Crickard let him get away with it at this point. Turner and Christian Wright, putting him on the stand... Bugliosi half-smiled and inquired, You were successful? No, sir, I wasn't, the policeman answered. We looked through all the records we could possibly go through all afternoon, and we were unable to locate any such records, documents, or tapes, unquote. It is your testimony that you could find no records at the LAPD pertaining to one Jerry Owen? No, sir, unless I had a DR number or something. More information, possibly, like I say, a DR number, an arrest booking number, or something to go on. Bugliosi frowned in disgust. Crickard said nothing. The witness was excused. Well, next, uh, Bugliosi attempted to bring to the stand a man named Bill Powers, who had known Owen for some time. And Bill Powers had some very, very, very damaging testimony to present. First of all, he had previously deposed that he had seen Owen and Saran in connection, in, in company with each other for quite some time. He also revealed that a few days before the assassination, Owen drove up in a brand-new Lincoln Continental, flashed a thick roll of $1,000 bills, which he claimed he'd received at the, during the when the collection plate was passed at his church. As I say, he showed up in a brand-new Lincoln Continental with a thick roll of $1,000 bills and a man who looked curiously like Saran in the back seat. And this sudden financial largesse was very unusual for Owen because previously he had been so short of funds that he had had to borrow money from Bill Powers in order to buy hay for his horses. In addition... It was revealed that the LAPD had come to Bill Powers any number of times and revealed that the pickup truck Owen had been driving when he reported to the LAPD had in fact belonged to Bill Powers, that they had fingerprinted, that had taken fingerprints from the truck, and that Saran's fingerprints were found on the pickup truck. This, of course, dramatically contradicts Owen's version of the events, the hitchhiker story. And eventually, the, this information came to the awareness of the K came into the awareness of the KCLP defense team, and Vincent Piosi attempted to bring this out in court. However, Judge Crickard once again prevented the information from coming to light. Turner and Christian described this. They write, Now Bill Powers was called to the stand. Bugliosi led him through the scenes at Wild Bill's stables, how in early 1968 Owen boarded two of his horses there, how Owen objected to Johnny Beckley's handling of his horses and threatened to bring in someone from a racetrack named Saran to handle them properly, how Owen, hitherto short of funds, drove up in a Lincoln Continental a day or so before the RFK shooting and flashed a thick roll of $1,000 bills, and how Powers was introduced to a young man in the back seat who bore a likely resemblance, unquote, to Saran. This was Powers' skeletal story, and Bugliosi now began to expand on it to the court. Bugliosi. This gentleman, this young gentleman who was in the back seat of Mr. Owen's Lincoln shortly before the assassination, who you testified resembled Saran, did you ever see that man prior to that time in Mr. Owen's home? Powers. There is a possibility that I've seen him there once before, or maybe twice before when I was there, yes. Bugliosi. When was that? Powers. It was approximately, I would guess, 90 days before the assassination. Mr. Owen had his home for sale or wanted to sell it. Some people had a Western store there and was interested in it, and I was going to show them the home, and that's when I seen this man at Mr. Owen's house. Bugliosi. Well, where was he in the house? Powers. He was in the backyard. Bugliosi. And he looked like the same individual whom you saw in the backseat of Mr. Owen's car during the $1,000 bills incident? Powers. That's correct. Powers' testimony appeared to heighten Cricker's displeasure that the assassination issue had been dragged into his court, and he began to bridle at Bugliosi with increasing frequency. When the attorney asked Powers if he had ever seen the preacher with a $1,000 bill before, the answer was no. The judge interposed, Mr. Bugliosi, we have to get to something here that bears on this case. I am going to exclude this line of questioning under evidence code 352, undue consumption of time, unquote. The attorney could hardly believe his ears. Bugliosi, may I be heard on that? The court, let's go on to the next point. Bugliosi, 
Well, we are talking about some things that are pretty important, Your Honor, not just to this lawsuit, but to, but to Senator Kennedy's assassination, the court. They have to be relevant to this lawsuit, or this isn't the place to take them up. Bugliosi. May I be heard on this, Your Honor? I have to state why I think it is very relevant, the court. Let's go on to the next point. With questions about Owen's sudden prosperity cut off, Pugliosi asked Powers about the law enforcement officers who visited him following the assassination. Owen attorney Arthur Evry, E-V-R-Y, objected on grounds of relevancy, and Pugliosi asked to make an offer of proof, unquote. Quaker hesitated, then assented, sending the witnesses from the courtroom. There is some evidence in this case, Bugliosi began, and we will put the evidence on which smacks of a possible cover-up. And I am not using the word cover-up because it's a word that's fashionable right now, but there are some strange things that happened in this case, and I will mention just a few of them to you. The most obvious thing is something that happened in this very courtroom about 30 minutes ago. An officer from the LAPD took a witness stand and testified that he could find no records on Jerry Owen over at the Los Angeles Police Department in response to a... that he was investigated by the LAPD. A book was written by the chief detective in this case, I think the name of the book was Special Unit Senator, in which pages upon pages are devoted to Jerry Owen. And yet we have an officer from the LAPD taking the witness stand and searching for the records for an entire day and coming up with nothing on Jerry Owen. That's the first point. The second point was the visit paid to Powers a day or two after the assassination by officers quizzing him about the truck he sold the preacher. It would be the first of a half dozen interviews the police had with Powers. They told him that it was his truck Owen was driving when he allegedly picked up Saran, and that Saran's fingerprints were found on the glove compartment and the rear window of his truck, unquote. Also already in the trial record, Bugliosi pointed out, was Owen's testimony that when he reported his story to the university station, the police fingerprinted the truck and thanked me for cooperating with them, unquote. But the LAPD had never let on that fingerprints had been lifted from Owen's truck at all, and let alone that they were Saran's. In fact, it publicly took the contradictory position that Saran had never been in the truck and Owen was nothing more than a publicity seeker, unquote. Concerning Powers, Bugliosi continued, Now this gentleman lives in Murrieta, California, close to 100 miles from L.A., and he is a fringe witness. He did not testify before the grand jury. He did not testify at the trial. And yet law enforcement was so concerned about this man that they interrogated him six times. And the first officers that came out to see him, the ones that told him about the fingerprints, he never saw those officers again. As for the officers who came later, Bugliosi said they told Powers they, quote, did not want him to talk to anyone else about this case, no matter who it was, and to call them if anyone else came out to see him, unquote. Bugliosi was making the point that this conduct was highly suspicious, that from his own experience, he knew that law enforcement agencies ordinarily didn't pay that much attention even to the star witness, much less a fringe witness. And yet here were officers going back time after time to warn Powers to keep his mouth shut. If there was a cover-up, it's implicit, it's implicit in the cover-up that somebody else was involved, the, the attorney concluded. And if somebody else was involved, we are trying to show that maybe, Bugliosi turned to face Owen, maybe the gentleman seated at the council table now with a smile on his face, maybe it was Jerry Owen, unquote. Bugliosi laid out the legal points, establishing why Power's testimony about the police was relevant, but Cricket would not go along with cover-up allegations. If law enforcement people had thought that Mr. Owen was involved in any criminal activity in this connection, he admonished, there certainly would have been some kind of prosecution within the seven years that have elapsed since that time. So, Bugliosi, looking incredulously at Cricket, cut in. He noted that FBI statistics showed that a substantial percentage of crimes never result in a prosecution. The court is saying the LAPD was above board in this case, and if Owen was involved, he would have been prosecuted, the attorney remonstrated. Although Bugliosi had often said publicly that the LAPD was one of the least corrupt police departments in the country, he told Judge Cricker he still didn't see, quote, how the court, sitting on the bench without the taking of any evidence, can categorically say that the LAPD was 100% above board in this case, unquote. I have no problem about that, Mr. Bugliosi, because that is not my job, Cricker retorted. All I am concerned with is the civil suit of Mr. Owen versus KCOP. The evidence has shown, which already has been introduced, that Mr. Compton, C-O-M-P-T-O-N, who was the district attorney in charge of the Saran investigation, knew of Mr. Owen, had checked out the story, and so far as your offer of proof in having this Mr. Powers testify to the things which you have just outlined, the objections to those things are sustained, unquote. KFJC Los Altos Hills, we have about another 20 minutes or so. For those of you who are taping, uh, we're running a little over. It won't happen again, sorry, but uh, another 20 minutes or so for the tapers in the audience. Back to the KCOP versus Jerry Owen case.
Crickard was referring to former Chief Deputy D.A. Lynn Compton, who led the prosecution of Saran. But Compton had not personally investigated the Owen angle. He had relied on the LAPD reports, which, as we have seen, were doctored. It was a catch-22 dilemma for Bugliosi, but Crickard's mind was made up. The question of police malfeasance was out. Bill Powers was brought back into the courtroom. Quote, how many times did you speak to law enforcement in this case? Bugliosi asked him in defiance of the court's ruling. Crickard broke in. Mr. Bugliosi, that is exactly what we have talked about. We are not going to get into this area. With his major avenues of inquiry blocked by the judge, Bugliosi was forced to end his examination of Powers. Well, the last point we're going to take up on this broadcast concerns Judge Crickard's refusal to allow into evidence the CIA background of former SUS, well, he wasn't the head of SUS, but former SUS member, Lieutenant Manuel Pena. Pena, as I mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, was in charge of overseeing the day-to-day investigation of the killing of Senator Kennedy. And both Lieutenant Manuel Pena and Sergeant Hank Hernandez had previously worked for the CIA under contract, and they had, uh, they had apparently functioned under the AID cover, and Pena had actually worked, the AID being the... Oh, God, my mind has just gone blank. The Association for International Development. Here we go. Forgive me there, people. Well, as I say, both Pena and Hernandez had worked for the CIA under AID cover, and they had actually worked with Dan Mitrioni down in Latin America on assignment. The authors of the case, uh, authors of the book, I should say, Turner and Christian describe Lieutenant Manuel Pena and Hank Hernandez's CIA background, saying, The choice of Lieutenant Manuel Pena for the key slot in SUS was a curious one. Among members of the force and the Mexican-American community, Pena was a living legend. Reputedly, he had killed 11 suspects in the line of duty, more than any other officer in the history of the department. In Special Unit Senator, Robert Houghton described him as a stocky, intense, proud man of, a Mex- of Mexican-American descent with 22 years of experience under his belt at the time. Houghton boasted that Pena had commanded detective divisions, supervised a bank robbery squad, and spoke French and Spanish and had connections with various intelligence agencies in various countries. What we did not know at the time, what we did not know at the time that Pena and Hernandez interrogated Jerry Owen was that both had long-standing connections with the CIA. Our first clue about Pena came months later when a faded newspaper article came to our attention. On November 13th, 1967, more than six months before the RFK slaying, the San Fernando Valley Times had reported Pena's formal retirement from the LAPD. A surprise testimonial dinner was held in his honor at the Sportsman's Lodge, with LAPD Chief Thomas Redden, R-E-D-D-I-N, prominent among the law enforcement fraternity in attendance. It was a rousing and emotion-packed affair, unquote, the article said, and then quoted Redden. I have known Manny for many years. I would not have missed being here for anything, unquote. The article revealed, Pena Pena retired from the police force to advance his career. He has accepted a position with the Agency for International Development Office of the State Department. As a public safety advisor, he will train and advise foreign police forces in investigative and administrative matters. After nine weeks of training and orientation, he will be assigned to his post, possibly a Latin American country, judging by the fact that he speaks Spanish fluently. It is an open secret that the Office of Public Safety, this is Turner and Christian writing here, that uh, this is not the San Fernando, San Fernando Valley Times article. It is an open secret that the Office of Public Safety of the Agency for International Development, AID, has long served as a cover for the CIA's clandestine program of supplying advisors and instructors for, uh, instructors for national police and intelligence services in Southeast Asia and Latin America engaged in anti-communist operations. In 1968, California Chief Deputy Attorney General Charles A. O'Brien informed us that this ultra-secret CIA unit was known to insiders as the Department of Dirty Tricks, unquote, and that one of its specialties was teaching foreign intelligence apparatus the techniques of assassination. FBI FBI agent Roger Lajeunesse, L-A-J-E-U-N-E-S-S-E, whom Turner had known years before in the Bureau, confided that Pena had left the LAPD for a special training unit at a CIA base in Virginia. In fact, said La Jeunesse, Pena's departure in November 1967 had not been a one-shot deal. The detective had done CIA special assignments for a decade, mostly under AID cover. On some of these assignments in Central and South America, he worked with CIA operative Dan A. Mitrioni, M-I-T-R-I-O-N-E, a former Indiana chief of police. Further confirmation of Pena's CIA role came from his brother, a high school teacher, 
who casually mentioned to television newsman Stan Borman how proud Manny was of his services for the CIA over the years. Reporter Fernando Fora, F-A-U-R-A, whose byline appeared on the newspaper story of the farewell banquet, recounted that in April 1968, only five months after Pena's departure, he was suffering along a corridor in Parker Center when he spotted a vaguely familiar figure. The square face and fire plug frame seemed to belong to Manny Pena, but now he sported an expensive dark blue suit, a black handlebar mustache, and heavy horn-rimmed glasses. Manny, for a probe. The figure stopped and looked sheepish as the reporter approached with hand extended. Hey, Manny, I damn near didn't recognize you with that disguise. The detective was not amused. Fora asked what he was doing back in Los Angeles. Pena explained that the AIG, AID job wasn't quite what he expected, so he quit and resumed his duties with the LAPD. And we learned much later that Pena's SUS sidekick, Sergeant Hank Hernandez, who was promoted to lieutenant in recognition of his status in the special unit, also had CIA connections. Now retired from the force, he boasts in a resume offering his services as a, as a private investigator that in 1963 he played a key role in Unified Police Command, unquote, training for the CIA in Latin America. He functioned under the usual cover of AID's Office of Public Safety and even received a medal from the Venezuelan government then concerned with Fidel Castro's exportation of the Cuban Revolution. In retrospect, it seems odd that two policemen who doubled as CIA agents occupied key positions in SUS where they were able to seal off avenues that led in the direction of a conspiracy. Well, when the KCOP versus Jerry Owen case came to trial, Vincent Bugliosi attempted to bring out the CIA background of Manny Pena, and once again, Judge Cricker was instrumental in blocking his actions. Bear in mind as you listen to this that, as I mentioned at the top of the broadcast, Payne Eugene Caesar, the man who it appears did actually kill Robert Kennedy, had previously worked at Lockheed's Burbank facility, which was closely affiliated with the CIA's U-2 project. Well, of Puliosi's efforts to bring out Manny Pena's CIA background in court, Turner and Christian Wright, former special unit senator leader Manny Pena arrived at the courthouse after being subpoenaed by Bugliosi. We had briefed Bugliosi on his clandestine connection with the CIA, and the attorney agreed that the question of why this detective, of all the detectives on the LAPD, was picked for the key SUS position demanded an answer. Was he selected because of his CIA affiliation? What control might the CIA have exerted through him? What did SUS know about Bill Powers and the Cowboys? Was it SUS that had intimidated Powers into silence? Was there a cover-up? Pena was a vital witness if he could be opened up. Bugliosi approached Pena in the corridor and got an idea of what to expect. I'll be asking you on the witness stand if you've ever been associated in any fashion with the CIA, he said. No, I've never been associated with them, Pena asserted. Where'd you get the idea that I was? Your brother told Stan Borman that you were proud of what you did for the CIA over the years. Did my brother say that? Pena said, frowning. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Bugliosi decided that in view of this bit of plausible deniability, to borrow the CIA's parlance, a little strategy was in order. Unless the judge allowed him to bear down on Pena, he would not get the answers he was seeking. Owen's lawyers had echoed their client's belief that there had been a conspiracy in the RFK case, although not one criminally involving Owen. Bugliosi called their hand. If that's what you believe, I don't want you to object to the CIA question being posed to Pena, he told the Owen lawyers before court resumed. So let's go back in chambers and talk to the judge. In fact, they trooped, informing Cricket of their agreement. Well, I have an objection, he grumbled. It's not relevant. It's extremely relevant, Bugliosi argued. They're obviously not covering up Saran's involvement, so what are they covering up? Cricket was adamant, falling back on his undue consumption of time, plaint. Bugliosi flared. Well, we're spending all this time in your chambers arguing about it when we could when we could settle it in court. But Cricket had the last word. It's not relevant, and I'm not going to let you do it. Court resumed with Manuel S. Pena raising his right hand to be sworn in. Lulling the judge, Bugliosi began with routine questions about his police career. Then he got to the, quote, retirement, unquote, banquet in 1967, which Pena confirmed. Bugliosi, but you continued to work at LAPD? Pena, no, I went with the U.S. State Department. I went to Washington, D.C. Bugliosi, is that the first time you had ever been associated with the State Department? Pena, correct. Bugliosi, were you trained back there at the State Department at all? Pena, I attended the Foreign Service Institute while I was back there. Bugliosi, did you ever go on assignment for the State Department? Pena, not at this time. Bugliosi, at a later time? Pena, I believe in the latter part of 69 and first part of 70, I took a trip to South America. 
Crick had finally caught on to Bugliosi's ploy and instructed him to move on to a relevant, unquote, area. This is his background, the attorney insisted. I want to know about his training and education. Bugliosi, why did you go to South America? Crickard, that is not relevant. Bugliosi, well, were you on assignment by the State Department in South America? Crickard, that is not relevant either. Let's get to this case. Bugliosi, I want to know whether it was a vacation or anything to do. He never got out the word CIA. Crickard cut in, directing Bugliosi to the Jerry Owen inquiry, inquiry that the witness had supervised. Question. Was the truck ever checked for fingerprints to ascertain whether Saran's prints were inside? Pena. I couldn't say that without going back to the files. I can't at this moment. Bugliosi. That would have been the normal thing to do, right? Pena. Normal. Routine. But I can't tell you that it was without going back to the files. According to Pena's testimony, Special Unit Senator concluded that Owen was neither with Saran in the truck nor implicated in the assassination. But details eluded him due, he said, to the passage of time. Bugliosi took one more stab at pinning down his covert CIA activities, asking, Mr. Pena, throughout your law enforcement career, have you ever worked directly or indirectly for the CIA? Pena sat in stony silence. Crickard, so angered that his gavel hand trembled, loudly interjected, that you don't have to answer that. That's not relevant in this case. The court discussed that with you in chambers, Mr. Bugliosi, and told you not to inquire into that area, unquote. After a brief exchange with the judge, Bugliosi tried another tack. You indicated earlier that you worked for the State Department, he addressed Pena. Was this on a paid basis, or was it Crickard burst in again? That's not relevant either. You don't have to answer that question. The door was closed. Insofar as the court was concerned, Manny Pena wore striped pants and a Homburg instead of a cloak and dagger. But Pugliosi had already gotten in the back door a good portion of what Crickard had forbidden him to elicit directly. Why was an LAPD officer attending the Foreign Service Institute, a CIA cover front outfit, and on assignment to South America for the State Department, unquote. Okay, and that was a couple of segments from Hard Rain and uh, going over the KCOP versus Jerry Owen trial. And I hope that uh, that illuminated some of the problems inherent. One would think, of course, one of the things people have always said about the... Uh, the John F. Kennedy assassination as well. If the case had only gotten to court, if Lee Harvey Oswald had lived, and uh, his, uh, which of course would suggest why Lee Harvey Oswald perhaps did not live, but if Lee Harvey Oswald had lived and had gotten the case into a court, well, justice would have been done, right? Well, as you can see, the case uh, with Judge Crickard and the folks that work down in Los Angeles, that uh, no matter how hard Vincent, Vincent Bugliosi tried, uh, he was prevented at virtually every turn from introducing any of this information into the into the record. Um, and, uh, of course, the Kennedy assassination, the Robert F. Kennedy assassination, goes virtually still. Um, I guess you'd have to say unsolved today, although a man is uh, in prison for the crime. Uh, the man now himself believes that he did it, and uh, most of the public seems to believe he did it, too. Again, uh, it's physically impossible for him to have done it, according to uh, the account provided by all of the eyewitnesses to the uh, situation, as well as the, the massive cover-up indicating that somebody other than Saron did it, and somebody very powerful or some very powerful people were going out of their way to try and make it look like Saron did it. Much has happened in the John F. Kennedy case, of course. One of the main reasons that uh, these kinds of courtroom shenanigans were, were uh, able to go forth and go through was the fact that, of course, the news media, once again, uh, tended to respond in a sluggish and, in many cases, plainly inaccurate or self-serving manner. We're going to read a little bit more about that in just a moment. All righty. Now, uh, again, uh, hopefully you've, you've got uh, this material on tape because there's so many connections, and I would advise sitting down and drawing lines between these to connect them. The last thing we'd like to present on this broadcast, uh, basically, uh, so many key political figures, both on uh, the national and state level, were involved in the Robert Kennedy assassination. It's perhaps the single most important uh, aspect of the case. We'd just like to wind up by uh, relating the roles uh, played by a couple of uh, rising uh, stars on the California political horizon. Uh, one of the figures involved in uh, covering up during the later stages of the investigation of the Robert Kennedy assassination, a person uh, who had a lot to do with uh, deep-sixing the uh, efforts in the mid-70s to bring the case to justice, was a fellow who at the time had succeeded Evel Younger as district attorney for the city of Los Angeles, and since then has succeeded Evel Younger with George Duke Magian in between as attorney general for the state of California, namely John Vandekamp. Uh, Christian and Turner, in the assassination of Robert Kennedy, recite Van de Kamp's role in uh, covering up the assassination of Robert Kennedy. The Kranz referred to here as uh, Special Counsel for the District Attorney Thomas Kranz, K-R-A-N-Z. Kranz had been commissioned by the Board of Supervisors to conduct an independent investigation to see if the LAPD and the DA's office were correct in their conclusions on the RFK case. 
yet Kranz actually became part of the DA's office and was on their payroll. Furthermore, he and Dinko Bozanich, another deputy district attorney assigned to assist Kranz, were taking orders from their boss, District Attorney John Vandekamp. And Vandekamp was doing what he has proven to be very adept at, talk to different audiences different ways on the same subject. To the news media, he proclaimed that he wanted, quote, to get to the bottom of the RFK case, unquote. But in the courtroom where it counted, his own deputies Kranz and Bozanich were fighting tooth and nail at Van de Kamp's insistence to discourage Judge Winky from continuing the inquiry. Judge Winky, recall, uh, presiding over the uh, L.A. County Board of Supervisors uh, forensic uh, or ballistics experts. We talked about that panel early in the broadcast. Okay, going on again to uh, the, the activities of certain people in the district attorney's office and uh, also, as mentioned earlier, the role of the news media, which we do see time and time again corrupts up in these cases. For the Los Angeles Times, whose ruling Chandler family wield enormous power in Los Angeles through their paper, the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy struck close to home. The candidate had been fatally shot in one of the city's landmark hotels. The case had been investigated by the Los Angeles Police Department, and Sirhan had been tried and convicted by Los Angeles prosecutors. As the Times saw it, the local institutions of government had performed well, unlike the shambles of Dallas. So when Vince Bugliosi declared himself a candidate for district attorney in August 1975, only weeks after the Owen versus KCOP trial, the Times raised its editorial voice in opposition to the prodigal son who wanted to reopen the RFK case. The DA vacancy was created when Joe Bush had died suddenly a month earlier, and the County Board of Supervisors was considering a list of 11 candidates for the interim appointment. In his turn before the supervisors, Bugliosi stated that if selected, he would launch a tough program against organized crime, try to get vicious criminals off the streets while preventing police harassment of those exercising First Amendment rights, and prosecute industrial polluters and corporations engaged in consumer fraud. The DA's office had always trod softly in those areas because members of the very establishment controlling Los Angeles politics were implicated. Bugliosi also promised to take steps to get at the actual facts in the RFK case, he said that he would name a blue ribbon scientific task force to re-examine the evidence from top to bottom. He would assemble a team of top investigators and prosecutors in the DA's office to, quote, examine and analyze the entire investigative files of the LAPD and issue a public invitation for all persons having information, including law enforcement officers, to come forward under a cloak of anonymity. He would ask the supervisors to help convene a special grand jury to hear the testimony of witnesses whose evidence contradicted the lone assassin conclusion. He would cooperate with congressional committees that might look into the case and open a, quote, positive line of communication with the citizenry after years of secrecy. Five years earlier, one of the Times frontline reporters, Dave Smith, had recommended that the newspaper commit limited resources and backing to help our investigation process, our meaning the authors. Contact with the Times had been made by our original benefactor, Peter Hitchcock of San Francisco, who interceded with his close friend, Otis Chandler, the publisher. Editor Bill Thomas assigned Smith to vet our files and submit a recommendation. But after Smith urged to go ahead, nothing happened. When he persisted, he was at first ignored, then belittled, and finally shunted to a minor slot. On August 20th, 1975, the Times editorialized, quote, One interpretation of all this meaning Bugliosi's pronouncements on the RFK case, is that Bugliosi believes he has an emotional issue that he can exploit next summer in the election for a full-term district attorney. Bugliosi fired back an indignant letter that read in part, quote, for you to insinuate that my personal, co personal commitment to help resolve this controversy is selfish and politically motivated is an affront to my professional integrity. It is truly unfortunate that on the Robert F. Kennedy assassination, the editors at the Times are apparently out of touch with this community's attitude about this issue and totally unaware of the concerned mood of the entire country. Continuing, it was no surprise when the supervisors passed over Bugliosi and settled on a compromise candidate, bakery heir John Vandekamp. Although he had never, he had never even prosecuted a rape or murder case, Vandekamp had more important credentials. His family were close to the Chandler family of the Times. When Bugliosi contested Van de Kamp in the 1976 election, he had a high degree of name recognition through Helter Skelter, which had eclipsed In Cold Blood as the best-selling crime book of all time. But that was about all. The establishment saw him as someone they could not control and closed ranks behind Van de Kamp, whose war chest brimmed with money. Even Attorney General Evel Younger, who as a Republican might have been expected to stay out of a fight among Democrats, was so anxious to keep the lid on the RFK case that he endorsed Van de Kamp. Recall that uh, Evel Younger was the corrupt prosecutor who had covered up 
the Saron case, uh, the assassination of Robert Kennedy. The establishment's fear of Bugliosi was so great that they even succeeded in pressuring CBS into blacking out the entire Los Angeles area for the airing of the TV movie based on Bugliosi's book, Helter Skelter. The Times naturally favored Vandekamp, but exceeded the bounds of fair play by not reporting Bugliosi's press announcements and publishing critical attacks on him instead. When actor Robert Vaughn and Jocelyn Brando, Marlon's sister, wrote a letter protesting the manner in which the Times, quote, has been using its editorial pages and reporters to attack our friend and candidate with a brand of journalism that is below the dignity of this community, unquote, the newspaper refused to publish it. So Vaughn, remembered from the man from Uncle in the recent television special Washington Behind Closed Doors, was left to make his point to a thousand people at a fundraising dinner at the Hollywood Palladium. Vince Bugliosi alone, Vaughn told his audience in an emotional speech, has committed himself to resolve the very serious and disturbing questions that have arisen about the death of my good friend Robert Kennedy, whose murder eight years ago in this very city surely changed the course of American history. Van de Kamp's public position was that he was not intractable but would have to see proof. Six weeks before the election, veteran CBS correspondent Bill Stout plunked down on his desk a set of FBI photographs with captions, the same photographs that showed extra bullet holes in the hotel pantry. The DA, this meaning Vandekamp, stared at them, unwilling or unable to answer Stout's rhetorical questions about their significance, then called FBI Director Clarence Kelly in Washington. Kelly said he didn't know anything about the photographs, but would check. He called back to say that the FBI had not conducted any ballistics investigation in the case, which was a semantic dodge. Vandekamp assured Stout that he would look into it and let him know. Stout is still waiting. So, uh... Not only the performance there of uh, John Vandekamp, but also of the basically the entire uh, establishment of the city of Los Angeles, especially the L.A. Times, in uh, blocking Vincent Bugliosi's ascendancy to the district attorney, from which Bugliosi planned to reopen the Robert Kennedy investigation. Now, uh, the last, I guess, rising star on the California political horizon that we're going to look into very briefly in connection with the Robert Kennedy assassination is former chief of police Ed Davis. Ed Davis is now a state senator. Apparently, he has gubernatorial aspirations, and uh, significantly, Ed Davis's office is being used as a base by Lieutenant uh, former General Daniel Graham for his High Frontier program, pushing the Star Wars. And uh, uh, of course, Graham's partner in that is the mysterious Fritz Kramer, the strange German who is the who was uh, Henry Kissinger's uh, mentor. Okay, so Ed Davis, a rising star on the California political horizon, and in the Robert Kennedy assassination, Ed Davis was uh, basically establishing a command post in the Rampart Station where. Sam Yorty went uh, rousting about and pulling up evidence and then held his press conference painting Saran red and, of course, violating the law in so doing. Yes, and as it mentions in the book here in a footnote, Davis was acting chief of police on the night of the RFK assassination, headquartered at Rampart Station as, quote, watch commander. He was still on duty after midnight, an unusually lengthy period for such a high-level LAPD official. So the acting chief of police was serving as watch commander and, uh, again, the station where Sam Yorty staged his red-baiting attacks and a lot of sort of became rumor central for the uh, Sirhan as a communist brigade. And, of course, Ed Davis today is still doing that kind of work and has been for many years uh, in Southern California. Okay, well, getting about 11.25 at night, a very long broadcast. We hope that we didn't catch you folks uh, as uh, unaware as we caught ourselves and that those of you who are taping had time to tape this information. Um, anyway, just want to let you know that uh, we are going out. We're going out the door right now. We appreciate you being with us. We wish we had uh, had things slightly better organized and would have had time to take some phone calls. But, of course, we do have One Step Beyond on Sunday nights from 8 until 11 o'clock when you can phone if you want to ask some questions about these things. And we'll be back next month with a Radio Free America dealing with the Aryan Nations and related topics. Right. May Russell, by the way, her tape 703 will air tomorrow at 9 p.m. And it's a custom slot. And, again, uh, sorry for the length of this. In the future of the broadcast, we're going to try and keep them uh, a little shorter. And if we get a big topic like this, we'll do two or three rather than uh, trying to cram it all into one show. But, again, these programs are made to be taped. It's sort of a way of it's sort of like oral books or, or news articles. Uh, so we have given you some of the stuff to buy on for yourself so you can really... Uh, sort of uh, get down and grapple with this material and come to terms with it. Okay, so once again, this is Nip Tuck speaking for myself and Dave Emery, thanking you for joining us on Radio Free America, and we will see you soon right here on KFJC.